You all thought that Family Guy was next, didn't you? He did The Simpsons, so Family Guy has gotta be next. I can't just do what's expected of me, I've gotta go above and beyond. Family Guy is next though, I promise. Or do I? So Disney. They sure have made a lot of movies, haven't they? Not only under the Walt Disney name, but also under the many different studios they've acquired over the years on their never-ending conquest to take over the world. One of which being Pixar, who have released many movies under Disney ever since their buyout in 2006. However, they still had been working under movies with them since 1996. So I thought it could be fun to go through Disney's near 100 year catalogue and review and then rank every single one of their movies. And I'll also do all the Pixar ones too, cause you know, why not? But this is where it gets interesting for me. Despite revolving my channel around animation on cartoons, you'd be hard pressed to find a video on my channel about a Disney or Pixar movie. And why is that? I just haven't seen many. Out of all the 76 films we're covering today, do you want to know how many of them I've actually seen before? 24. <laughs> and a majority of those were Pixar movies. I don't know why, I just never really grew up watching many movies at home. I was always more focused on TV shows and the sort. But I also think that's why this video will be fun. I'm going to be taking a look through Disney's complete history through mostly unbiased lenses. Because again, I don't really have nostalgia for any of these films. But at the same time, of course, I'm going to be willing to give leeway or understand why a movie may have certain limitations depending on when it came out. Can't expect a film from 1930 to have the same quality as one from 2020, if you get me. So without further ado, let's begin reviewing and ranking every Disney and Pixar movie. Starting with... So this is where it all began. 1937's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I've never seen this movie before. The Disney princess stuff just wasn't the sort of things to interest a younger lad like myself. Which means I went into this completely blind and I gotta say... Yeah, this sure is Disney's first feature film. Honestly, the most reaction this movie got from me was... Oh, so that's what that joke from Shrek was making fun of. Sadly, this film has mostly been ruined for me as a result of the countless parodies and retellings. Like when the guy was about to kill Snow White, all I could think of in my head was the Simpsons parody. But anyway, I guess I should talk about the film for at least a bit, not everything around it. Snow White is about the evil queen of all the land asking her magic mirror who the fairest in all the land is. And when she finds out that it isn't her and is instead Snow White, she sends her henchmen to go and murder her, leading her to run away and hide deep in the forest with a group of seven dwarfs. And at that point, the movie just kind of stops for the next half an hour. Yeah, my biggest issue with this movie is something that, while I can understand why it was done, I personally think it just ruins it and makes me never care to see it again. And it's that the movie is way more focused in showing you cool visuals and animation, rather than telling an actual story. And again, I can see why it was done. This movie was the first of its kind for Disney, so they probably weren't all that experienced in terms of writing for something feature length, but as a result it causes this movie to be so... So boring. Half the movie just feels like filler, and while yeah, it's it's good looking filler, I just find myself looking at the clock half the time waiting for it to be over. Which is too bad, because once it starts to pick up again with the queen turning herself into a haggard old woman to poison Snow White, it starts to get really interesting again. Like just conceptually, it's really cool that out of pure spite and jealousy for not being the prettiest woman in the land, she turns herself into an old ugly woman. Like that, that's really neat, the villain is the best thing about this movie. But the queen really only ever appears at like three points in the story. L like let me go through it for you real quick so you can get an idea of what I mean. So Snow White finds the dwarf's house around 15 minutes into the movie. We then have a five minute scene of her cleaning the house. Like it looks nice but after the first two minutes like I get it she's cleaning the house. Then the dwarf suspects someone is in their house around 26 minutes in. This is then followed by an almost 10 minute long scene of them trying to find out who was there. Everything just feels so dragged out, like every damn breath someone takes has to be given an extra 10 seconds of anticipation. It just gets boring, the pacing is so slow and the plot never progresses until the very end. Like after they all meet, it's just random shenanigans for the next 30 minutes. Oh boy, I really wanted a 7 minute long scene where the dwarves wash their hands. I'm not making that up, it is literally 7 minutes. I don't know, I just don't think these characters are interesting enough to fill up a movie when they do nothing the whole runtime. The Seven Dwarfs are purposefully basic. You know how they're gonna react to every situation, and that's fine. But Snow White is so bloody uninteresting as a protagonist. She cleans. That's all she ever does in this movie. Every time she has a scene to herself, they have to fill it with random comic relief animal nonsense just so you don't get bored. Even beyond that, I hate just looking at her because out of everything in the movie, she looks the absolute worst. 
The animation in this movie is super impressive for the time it came out. I I'm not even gonna try and deny that. All the backgrounds are stunning, like when Snow White enters the woods and everything morphs into this really creepy imagery. I, I love that part. But the animation really only ever shines with the characters whenever they're stylized like the dwarfs, the animals, even the queen. But Snow White is drawn so realistically, I, I think it's actually rotoscoped. But because of that, a lot of her movements look really weird and her face is just... Ugh. Yeah, they were definitely just testing the waters with realistic humans here. One thing I can definitely commend though is the soundtrack. I, I love the vibe these old Disney movies give off. The old violins, the choir, it's all great. Looking back, I can't exactly remember the songs that were in it, you know, other than the dwarf song, who doesn't know that? But I remember enjoying them as I was listening to it. Are people gonna be mad at me over this? Again, I haven't seen a lot of these movies, meaning I also don't really know what the general consensus is on them. But as for Snow White, all I can really say is, yeah, again, it's Disney's first movie. It's not bad, and for the time it came out, it's super, super impressive. But I don't know, as someone who's only watching it for the first time, I just have to assume it's aged kinda poorly. Snow White is a movie I respect a lot more than I actually like. Disney were just finding their footing, so I understand. Let's see if things get any better with their next film. Snow White's at the top of my list, obviously, but I can't imagine it staying there for much longer. Here we have 1940's Pinocchio, another one I haven't seen. I was looking forward to this one, actually. The only Pinocchio movie I can remember watching as a kid was this really creepy live-action one where he's like, entirely made out of wood, and I don't really want to revisit that childhood memory. Already I could see the immediate improvements with this film. First off, the animation in this movie is amazing, it's a real joy to look at. The movements are all super smooth, the humans are now also stylized so they don't have that uncanny rotoscope effect, well, except for the furry woman. And overall for 1940, this is impressive as fuck. I can't imagine having to animate a guy puppeteering something on this level, it's just so cool to look at. Anyways, Pinocchio is about an old man creating a puppet named Pinocchio who he wishes can become a real boy, and so in the dead of night a furry comes down from the sky and turns him into alive. And so he and his new conscience, represented by Jiminy Cricket, have to set out and prove that Pinocchio was able to tell right from wrong on other lessons like that. You know, despite most little boys not being able to, but neither way. I really enjoyed this movie. I like how there's no one set villain throughout the whole thing, it's a, it's a very loose script. Each scene is more or less set up as Pinocchio being set down the wrong path by a bad guy, and needing to learn not to be so naive to be brave, and to ultimately learn right from wrong. You know, it does a good job at representing that life doesn't just have one set bad guy. There's gonna be a lot of bad people you encounter, and you just eventually have to learn how to weed him out. I said that bad. The characters here are all really charming. Pinocchio is such a great protagonist. He was just born did like two minutes ago, so it makes his complete and utter delusion as to how the world works a lot more believable. And his design is really nice, it's it's a really appealing look and the use of the primary colours makes him stick out a lot. And I love all the one-off side characters he meets, with I think the highlight being the part where he goes to the big amusement park with the troubled kids, and they all get turned into donkeys, like this scene is really, really depressing, it just sort of comes out of nowhere. I didn't realize how many of Disney's most iconic moments came from this film, like the When You Wish Upon a Star theme, which I still think plays before most of their movies if I'm not mistaken. The whole soundtrack is amazing in general, way better than Snow White's in my opinion. That movie had like, one song I remember, but I still remember a lot of the music from this one. Like I said, there's When You Wish Upon a Star, there's I Got No Strings, Give a Little Whistle, it's, it's all super memorable. If there's one complaint I do have with the movie, it's that I feel it goes on a little too long. You know, this is only their second feature-length film, so I can understand that they're still trying to get used to writing a story that can flow well throughout the whole thing, but so much of this movie kinda just felt prolonged for the sake of the visuals. Even if said visuals don't really progress anything. Such as a five minute scene of Pinocchio and Jiminy walking underwater. Like it looks cool, but I, I get the idea. I think that whole climax was definitely the worst part. Pinocchio finally gets back home and it's like, well, Geppetto wasn't here anymore, he got eaten by a wheel. It's like, holy shit, talk about whiplash. This just felt like the sort of movie that didn't need a big ol' action climax involving a giant wheel. I suppose it sort of leans into that whole proving himself as brave thing, but this isn't how I thought they were gonna show that. It was unexpected to be sure, but I wasn't all that interested in what was going on and sort of tuned out by this point. Saying all this though, I still thoroughly enjoyed Pinocchio a lot. I think the ending kinda soured my thoughts on it, but I believe the rest of the movie more than makes up for it. If you want a charming movie with a likeable protagonist, some great music, and a lot of entertaining scenes, then definitely check out Pinocchio. I'm obviously going to be dropping this above Snow White in my list. 
I'm realizing now how cool it's going to be to see these movies progress naturally with time. And like I said, this was a massive step up from Snow White, and I look forward to seeing where it goes from here. And now with all that, I guess this wouldn't be a real LS Mark video without some of my patented unpopular opinions. And oh boy, am I ready to make some enemies with this one. <laughs> I know I said I wasn't going to include any anthologies, but like, come on, it's Fantasia, how could I not include it? I'm sure none of you care about whether or not I talk about make mine music, or maybe you do, again, I know nothing about this stuff. All I know is Fantasia is the one people remember, so I figured I'd just drop it in here. And you want to know what I think about Fantasia? You really want to know what I think about Fantasia? I think Fantasia is BORING. Just plain and simple. Not much to say, because I felt nothing but absolute boredom watching this movie. It's just like... music with somewhat related visuals. But Mark, it's supposed to be- I know that's what the movie is supposed to be. It's just cool animation. That's all. The only short I got any modicum of enjoyment from with Fantasia was of course the Sorcerer's Apprentice one. I vividly remember that I had a book as a kid that retold this story, and I had no idea there was a fully animated version of it, so finally getting the chance to see it was actually really cool. But I think what I like most about it is that the short actually tells a story. A simple story albeit, but a story nonetheless. Not to mention it's just cool to see Mickey animated like this since he's such an endearing character. There are so many of these that don't even feature a story and you're just expected to sit there and look at the pretty animation. And the animation is good, don't get me wrong, it is fucking stellar. But for me, personally, watching a bunch of strings animated through the sky for five minutes isn't really my cup of tea. And maybe if this thing were like half an hour it'd be fine, but no, this is two hours long. Two hours. But I don't know if the majority of that is even animation, because they keep halting the movie to let this fucking dork composer narrate what we're about to see. So we'll have him talk for five minutes about how we're gonna watch the Nutcracker, and this is what the Nutcracker is about, and this is what happens in the Nutcracker. Then we watch it happen, oh boy! And I know, don't worry, I know. This shouldn't really be classified as a traditional film. I know I shouldn't expect a story from it. It's more of an experience, I get that. But it just doesn't do anything for me. I don't know, call me uncultured, I guess. I suppose I won't go on much further out of fear of making myself look like a bigger idiot than I already have, but I guess this is how I'll sum it up. Much like Snow White, I think Fantige is something I can respect a lot more than I myself personally like. Because this is a huge feat, I'm not gonna pretend like it's not. I just, personally, am not entertained by it and find it boring, and will be putting it at the bottom of the list so far. Well, three movies done, and I think I've already destroyed my credibility, I think that's a new record. Well, I've still got like a minute of this segment left to fill, so, uh... Did you know that two out of three guys experience some form of meal pattern baldness by the time they're 35? I mean, just look at my editor, Simply Dad. Don't you think it'd be better to try and prevent the hair loss while you still got her left? Well, that's where today's sponsor, Keeps, comes in. Keeps is a subscription service that makes it affordable for men to treat their meal pattern baldness online, with online consultations with a real doctor, automated shipping and delivery to your home, and constant access to your doctor through online messaging. The best thing about Keeps is that it can all be done from home. Once they review your info and recommend the right hair loss treatment plan for you, it's then shipped directly to your door every three months. Keeps treatments usually take between four to six months to start seeing results, so act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you can save. If you're ready to take action to prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash lsmark or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's keeps.com slash lsmark. Thanks Keeps for sponsoring this video. Dumbo was another movie I was really curious about when getting into it. I have vague memories of watching this movie as a kid, and have random scattered images in my head, but when it comes to actually telling you what it's about, I couldn't piece together what that was, so I was practically going in blind. I was initially sort of skeptical going into this one, because I realized it was only an hour long. Jeez, Disney, were you really struggling that hard to fill this movie out that you just went, ah, fuck it, just make it an hour, that's long enough. It's a big-eared elephant, what more could you want? But after sitting through it, I can safely say that short runtime is a blessing in disguise. But I suppose I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Dumbo is about a young elephant who was born with giant ears. And because of this, he is relentlessly mocked and shunned by his peers, and the visitors of the circus he and his mom performs at. 
There's not really any sort of traditional plot to speak of, I guess, but everything flows nicely into one another. Because you're just watching how his abnormality leads him into worse and worse situations, eventually getting his mother put in solitary confinement. And with the help of his sidekick, this little mouse creature who is basically just a Jiminy Cricket to Dumbo's Pinocchio, we see that just because he's different doesn't make him weird. It just makes him special, and he learns to hone that into something only he can do. Of course, with that being represented by him being the only elephant who can use his ears to fly. The movie is quite simple and on a very small scale. You're not going to get a scene of Dumbo jumping inside a giant killer wheel to rescue his parent. But I kind of prefer that, honestly. The movie is just... It's just very tightly put together, is how I'd put it. You know, there's a lot less fluff. Well, I said less, not none. I think this movie's strongest suit is Dumbo as a character. He's just really appealing to watch, his design is very good, and his relationship with the other characters really ties everything together and keeps you invested. You know, you feel awful for him when his mother is taken away and the other elephants won't even acknowledge him. You're happy for him by the end when he finally gets her back. You can put up with a non-existent story simply because you like the main character. The animation here is also really amazing. I love the setting of a circus that allows for such great color choices. And I really enjoy how they try to make it look all dark and grimy to highlight that it's kind of a corrupt place and that the owner is an asshole. It's a great contrast between the cartoony visuals and setting. The expressions here are also getting super good. Dumbo is a silent protagonist, but like I said, he's the best part of the movie. And I think the animation greatly adds to that. The faces he makes are just so charming. Even if the movie does at times sort of have the problem where you feel like everything has to come to a halt for the sake of showing you nice animation. Yes, I'm talking about the pink elephant scene. The pink elephant scene is so creepy, I love it. I know it's just animation for animation's sake, but I can almost forgive it because of just how cool and creative it is. Plus, it does somewhat fit with what's going on considering Dumbo is drunk and pink elephants are used to represent hallucinations during that, and that's a very cool coincidence since the movie is about ele elephants and stuff, you know, it's cool. It's, it's cool. It is cool. I'm not denying that for a second, it's just... I don't know. I guess I wouldn't mind so much if this didn't happen very, very late into the movie. If I recall, there were only like 15 minutes left when this part was going on, so I just kind of wanted them to get back to the important stuff and devote some time to the ending. And that's really my only complaint with the film. The ending is very rushed. It feels like there was an entire scene cut here, just look. Dumbo is doing a circus show, overcomes his fear and starts flying. This is then followed by 20 seconds of newspapers showing us that Dumbo is not popular. Movie is over and Dumbo is on the circus train with his mother, like that's it's a bit of a leap there. It's not a huge deal, like, like it doesn't ruin the movie for me or anything. It's just I guess it's harder for me to overlook such a rushed ending when it feels like there was a scene like 10 minutes ago that just sort of wasted time. Wasted time in a cool way, but wasted time nonetheless. I guess I just wanted that scene where he gets to see his mother again for the first time. They made a big deal out of him not being able to see her, so I thought it would have been really sweet. Anyways, that ultimately doesn't hinder my enjoyment of the movie. I still had a great time with it. I honestly wouldn't mind more if these films be shorter, if it means they're as tightly written as this one. Dumbo is going at the top of the list for now, but who knows, that could change with the next movie. I was not looking forward to Bambi. I know that people really like this movie, and I was worried I was going to find it incredibly boring. So after watching it, what did I think? Yeah, it was alright. And I mean that in the most positive way possible. I definitely enjoyed myself with Bambi. It's just I feel like it falls into a lot of the stuff I was happy Dumbo avoided. Anyways, Bambi's about a newly born deer and his mother and... Yeah, I just kind of described the first 40 minutes of the movie for you. Atmospheric, I guess, is the word I would use to describe this movie. I really am not exaggerating when I say it takes 40 minutes for stuff to actually start happening. But I'm also not saying that that's a bad thing. Quite the contrary. This movie is a pretty slow burner. The first half is all about Bambi growing up and learning new things about the world and being in awe of it all. Then by the second half, we watch that all crumble to the fucking grind. And I think the long build-up of showing things all innocent and sweet really adds to the impact of things getting more serious. You know, you've gotten 40 minutes to grow attached to Bambi and his mother, and you really start to care about him since he's a really charming character. If there's one thing Disney is consistently getting right now, it's the characters. These movies live or die on whether or not you find the main character endearing. And I gotta say, I do like Bambi as a protagonist. He's very innocent and naive. This film reminds me of Dumbo in a lot of ways, actually. Speaking of the Dumbo comparison, the mother's separation trend continues here, except it's turned up to fucking 11. This is like... a spoiler, I guess? A spoiler for a movie that came out almost 100 years ago? Is that possible? I don't know. If you didn't know that Bambi's mom dies, then I don't know what to tell you. You've never seen Bambi before? It's a classic, man. Spoiler. I feel like this scene here being so iconic has almost hampered the impact. 
Like, I'm sure I would have been a lot more emotional if I didn't know what was gonna happen. But throughout the movie, I just kept waiting for the part where she dies. She's supposed to die. Even still, it was greatly done. I think the plot of this movie works really well for as simple as it is. I like the age up a lot, even if it does come out of nowhere. But it's a cool way of naturally evolving the characters. Even if the falling in love part was really obvious and predictable. I feel like this movie is very well rounded. I really love the whole circle of life thing going on here. With how Bambi is destined to be the one who takes over guard duty, it's really clever how the movie ends, but I guess I won't spoil it. I suppose if I were to have one nitpicky complaint, it would be that I didn't think the movie needed two action climaxes. There's this part where some evil deer comes out and starts attacking Bambi and they need to fight, but like, why isn't this deer anthropomorphic? Why can't he talk in junk? He's just evil because... Because conflict! The ending scene with the huntsman and his dogs was more than enough, since it actually correlates to the ongoing plot since Satsu killed his mother. But again, just a small nitpick. The animation in these movies just keeps getting better and better. You can really tell they studied a lot of deer for the movements here, it's so realistic, but not in a rotoscoped creepy way like Snow White. All the animals look really unique and detailed. The character designs are super simple, but the amount of time spent focusing on how each of them would move and interact must have been a massive challenge that definitely pulled off. The backgrounds are also amazing, it all looks so calm and relaxing, but when they want things to be intense, the backgrounds do an amazing job at portraying that by the end of the movie. I was surprised by Bambi, I really was. Bambi was everything I thought it was gonna be, but I actually kinda liked it. It's definitely not my favorite. I guess I just like a bit more story in my movies. And when your film is only an hour long, I'd say waiting 40 minutes for it to actually start going somewhere was an odd choice. Not a bad choice, again I gotta stress that, I enjoyed those first 40 minutes, but as an overall package, I don't think I ever really see myself watching this film again, but I did enjoy my time with it. I'd probably drop Bambi above Snow White, but under Pinocchio. Is that going to be controversial? I have no clue. This is going to be a fun comment section. Oh boy, another one I've never seen before. Honestly, I don't think we're going to get to one I haven't already seen until Toy Story, which is like 50 years from now. And it's weird because I actually remember being offered to watch Cinderella a bunch by my sisters. They would have been watching it and I'd get up and leave the room because I'm a cool boy and, and I can't be caught watching no lame dumb girls movie. Yuck. Women, am I right? But, uh, I uh, guess if I must. Oh, this, this movie's actually pretty good. Shocker, I know. This shouldn't be a surprise to most of you. But to me, he still has his seven-year-old boy mindset when going into this one. I was pleasantly surprised. First of all, the animation. Just look at the improvement on this directly part up with Snow White. You can see just how much they've evolved and gotten better just by comparing both princesses. Cinderella doesn't look like a corpse, thank God. I'm sure we all know the story of Cinderella. Young girl being abused by her wicked stepmother and ugly stepsisters until one fateful night where she gets to go out to the ball and falls in love with a prince. Glass slipper only fits her happily ever after. There we go. I think this movie is super solid. It's just too bad they decided to tack on another movie about some bootleg Tom and Jerry or some shit. Yeah, this movie is another example of this did not need to be as long as it is. It probably could have been a 30 minute short with how much fluff there is. I guess first I'll talk about Cinderella's stuff, because it works great. She's a really sympathetic character, mostly achieved from the amazing animation, character design, and voice acting done by the stepmother. From the moment she's introduced, she just gives off this awful energy that comes through any time she's on screen. And I really love the build up to her reveal, it was wonderfully done, it, it really makes you sympathize with Cinderella as a character. And the stepsisters work as secondary comic relief characters. They really get in your nerves, but obviously that was intentional. However, the same can't be said about the other comic relief characters. Because I assume the writer felt it would be hard to portray Cinderella's personality with no friends to really bounce off of, they instead gave her a bunch of animal buddies to pal around, like a horse, a dog, and yes, the mouse. The mice felt like the selling point of this movie. Come watch silly little mice shenanigans that isn't related into the main plot whatsoever, oh boy. There are like three to four scenes in this movie that are nothing but extended cat and mice chases and they get so, so boring. There's a reason why Tom and Jerry only works as shorts, and it's because in a movie these moments would come off as real pace breakers. And in Cinderella, why do you know they're fucking huge pace breakers? It's annoying, because I would probably say this is my favorite movie so far, if it weren't for the mice stuff. But that stuff takes up about half of what otherwise is a great movie. There's this part where the mice decide they're gonna help Cinderella by making her dress for the ball, so they sing a nice little song. 
That's then interrupted by one of them going to get a part from the kitchen or something, which then leads into like a five minute long chase scene. We then finally get back and I was like, Oh, that's right, they were making a dress. I forgot this was the same movie. This may not sound like a huge deal, but trust me, it ruins the movie for me. The rest of it is basically perfect. My friend was telling me about this film, and how some people complain that the movie is bad because Cinderella doesn't deserve her happy ending. Like the fairy godmother just comes down and gives her everything she wants and that she never really earned any of it. But one, it seems like these people missed the whole point of the movie. She's been slaving away her whole life doing stuff for other people. Of course it's a good thing that she gets a night where something is done for her. And two, it's a fucking fantasy movie, what do you expect? This movie is like every little girl's fantasy sequence. Not even I would try and nitpick to this extent. Anyway, Cinderella overall is okay. It sucks because I want to say it's good. It has a lot of aspects that kept me engaged. Again, I love the villain a lot, she might be my favorite so far. But the dumb comic relief my stuff ruined it for me, it's so fucking boring. I heard they made a sequel to this film that solely focuses on the mice pretty much. And oh boy, am I sure glad I'm not covering the direct-to-DVD sequels, or anything made by Toon Disney. I miss stuff like a Goofy movie, but as a plus I gotta skip out on like 20 fucking terrible films. I'm putting Cinderella under Pinocchio. I thought I was really gonna enjoy Alice in Wonderland. Thought. Based off the old book Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, I'd only ever seen the live action adaptation from back in 2010, but I remember nothing of that one considering I was like 8 years old then. This is the part where you leave a comment about how much older or younger you are compared to me. While you're down there, why not hit that like and subscribe button? This movie has a very, very loose plot. A young girl called Alice follows a white rabbit and winds up in Wonderland. This bizarre world with seemingly no way out, and on her way to find the rabbit encounters many weird and wacky creatures. Just why does she want to get the rabbit? Beats me. This relates back to what I was getting at when talking about Fantasia, and it's that your film can be as weird and wacky and symbolic as you want it to be, but if you don't have likable characters or an interesting story, I just kinda tune out of it. Yeah, I didn't really enjoy Alice in Wonderland sadly, which sucks because I really did want to like it and do enjoy certain aspects. Going into it, I assumed the movie would feature a set cast of characters, like I thought the main group was Alice, the Mad Hatter, and you know, all those guys. But I was surprised to see they're only really in two scenes. Every scene has Alice meeting a new face and talking with them for a bit, before wandering deeper and deeper into Wonderland. Red flags arose for me immediately when she first enters the place and is met by these two dumb guys who look fucking atrocious in the live action remake by the way. But these guys interrupt the whole movie to tell a 5 minute unrelated story about some guy luring a bunch of kids onto his ship and then murdering and eating them. Lovely. Alice is a great straight man. Well, I guess straight woman. But, um, but she's never given enough to do, she just stands around all the time gawking at the stuff around her. Shit like the flower scene is what I mean. It looks pretty and all, but all she's doing is watching a bunch of flowers dance and sing around for a while before Alice moves on. If you want to do something like this then you gotta make sure each and every encounter is memorable and creative. I watched this movie yesterday and I'm failing to remember any of the side characters other than the Mad Hatter, White Rabbit, and Cheshire Cat. These characters are cool. I especially love the Cheshire Cat, it's great how menacing and threatening he is without actually doing anything evil or bad. But other than that the rest of the film is just a blur. Well everything up until the ending that is. This movie is like the complete opposite of Pinocchio for me. In that movie I thought everything was great up until the climax, which is just eh. But here I think everything is eh, up until the great climax. I wish the Queen of Wonderland had been introduced in the film way earlier, because she's easily the best part about it. But she's not even mentioned up until Alice is about to meet her. Her voice actress went to fucking town with the delivery here. Same with the animation. She is so damn unstable, I love it, she's so intimidating. You never know how she's gonna respond to anything, or when she's gonna be set off, so you're constantly on edge when she's on screen. It's just a shame she's only at the end of the movie, so she's not on screen very much. But when she is there, she makes her fucking presence known. Cue the, it was all a dream ending, and scene. Much like Fantasia, Alice in Wonderland is more of an experience than a standard film. I understand that. It all comes down to that respect thing again. I respect this movie for embracing its weirdness, and really pushing the boundaries of its animation but it's just not the kind of thing I can personally get into. But that's another good thing about this video. It also gives you an idea of me, and what I like and want to get out of a movie. Some people think I have incredibly high standards for stuff, but I don't think that's true at all. I mean, I'm the guy who likes Fred the fucking movie here. I just know what I like, and what I like is characters I can spend some time with and get to know, you know? 
Yeah, I know. I know that you're a fucking idiot. Well, I'm sorry, my friend, but if it took you this long to realize that, then I'm afraid we'll both just have to be idiots together. Anyways, moving right along. Alice in Wonderland, right under Cinderella. Let's keep this train a moving with. Another one I'm surprised I actually hadn't seen before. I don't really know much about Peter Pan, to be frank. My only real exposure to the franchise was being forced to watch this Disney Junior show called Jake and the Neverland Pirates with my little cousin, Don. Do I even need to go into how draining of an experience that would be? Peter Pan is about three kids, Wendy, John, and Michael. While their parents are out one night, the seemingly fictional character Peter Pan arrives in the room with his sidekick Tinkerbell and takes them off to Neverland. And this movie was... okay. Honestly, the most interesting thing about Peter Pan to me was, well, Peter Pan. But the movie just left me wanting more in relation to his character. But that also might not even be the movie's fault since that really wasn't what I was trying to do. So in Neverland you never grow up. And I think- oh, it's Neverland, I just got that. And I think Peter went there because he didn't want to grow up either. And also there is a group of kids called the Lost Boys who were orphans, but, but Peter isn't an orphan, maybe? But like, if he's not an orphan then- that's fucking depressing to me. I'm aware I'm making no sense here. Okay, so so back in primary school, we'd all have to get in the group and sing songs, and I remember singing this Peter Pan one, and it was like, sung from Peter's perspective of him never wanting to grow up, and so he left his family in pursuit of Neverland. And as a kid, this song really, really upset me irrationally, because wouldn't Peter's parents be extremely devastated over their son going missing? Either the Irish education system has failed me, or this story has a very depressing undertone. I don't know, any Peter Pan connoisseurs in the comments, let me know if I'm just fucking speaking nonsense here. Point being, I guess I assumed the movie was gonna touch on Peter for a bit, and why he never wanted to grow up and leave his life behind. But at the same time, I suppose I can't really dock it for what it didn't do. It was just always at the back of my mind during the film, because once they go to Neverland, does this shit get boring? This is a very common trend where these movies start really strong, then sort of try and fill in time until we get to the end. Like, the stuff with the Native Americans felt very unneeded and, uh... Oh, you know, it probably doesn't hold up very well nowadays. The thing I like most about this movie are the characters. Peter and Wendy have this sort of relationship thing going on where Wendy likes him and Peter doesn't really want much to do with it. And I think it works really well. You know, he's a regular little boy with no interest in growing up. Of course he wouldn't be interested in this. It was really clever. And again, with Disney always getting these villains right, Captain Hook is amazing. He's super intimidating, but also comedic and funny when he needs to be. From the first scene where he's introduced, they do an excellent job at showing the multiple facets to his character. As at first he's quite threatening, but it's super smart how they show the crocodile within this part, to establish he's not just a one-note character, and that he does have weaknesses and things he's afraid of. It's just too bad I can't really say the same for any of the other characters. Smee is a good sidekick for Hook, but we don't really see enough of him, and all the boy characters definitely got the shaft. This is a movie mostly about Peter and Wendy, so her brothers don't really do much, they just sort of blend in. And all the Lost Boys just seem like blank slates, meant for kids in the audience to project themselves onto. If Cinderella was Disney's little girl fantasy, then this is definitely the little boy's fantasy. And I guess that's okay, but all it did was really disinterest me. The only other unique thing I got out of this movie was that I thought Tinkerbell was a unique character, for a Disney movie at least. Like she's a girl who isn't just, oh, a boy, say. They're all obsessed with meeting a prince or taking care of their family or being all polite and proper. She's a fucking bitch and it's really funny. I wish they used her more. It's just too bad I'm missing all of the original Tinkerbell movies with this marathon. Ah, uh, how, how will I go on? The animation is another huge plus for this film, but talking about the good animation is getting a bit redundant at this point, since we're now at the point where they all have good animation. Either way, I think the water here is great, it's a massive step up from Pinocchio, and the magic sparkles they put around the characters while flying is also a really cool effect. The ending to the film is great. I love the fight with Captain Hook and when the dad implies at the end that he also went to Netherland with Peter Pan as a kid. It's, it's a neat way of tying this all together, I like that a lot. So yeah, didn't enjoy Peter Pan as much as I was hoping I would. But again, a lot of that comes down to me wanting more from it. Has there ever been a sequel or remake of this movie that focuses more on the characters and their past lives before going to Neverland? If so, let me know in the comments, because that's what I'm mostly interested in. Still though, I wouldn't say I disliked it. There's a ton of great things here, like the characters, the main characters that is, 
the villain, and the animation. I know I'm saying this a lot, but I'm getting kind of worried right now. Am I just missing the point with these movies? I wish I was liking some of them a lot more than I do. I'm gonna be putting Peter Pan under Bambi, but above Alice in Wonderland. A romance movie between dogs. Oh gee Wilkers, does that sound boring? Is what I thought going into it. But you know what, after sitting through it, it might just be my favourite of them all so far. Lady and the Tramp is about this dog called Lady. And... I'm now realising that I can't really go over a general plot structure for this one. I don't know why I find it so hard with these early Disney movies. Even with the later ones I haven't seen in years, I can do it easy. Bolt. A dog actor must find his way home to save his owner. Chicken Little. A boy must save the town from an alien invasion while gaining the admiration of his stupid cunt father. See, it's easy. But here it's like... So, so the dog is worried about a baby coming in case it takes over the parent's attention, but it comes and everything's fine, they still care for the dog. Then the dog gets kicked out and meets this other dog guy and then they go back to save the baby from a rat. I don't, I don't fucking know, am I even making any sense anymore? This isn't me making a complaint either, this loser plot works completely for the film, it just makes talking about it hard. I just think this movie is really, really charming. This movie does a good job at subverting my expectations, I could never tell exactly where it was going. At first when the dog was new and annoying its owner, I assumed it was gonna be a story of how it gets kicked out or sent back to the pound. But no, it was just to set up a really funny joke. When the tramp dog came, I was expecting them to pull this love at first sight shit you see all the time now. But no, he just has a quick conversation and fucks off. And I was really expecting it to go in the direction of the family not caring about her anymore because of the new baby. Like, that is such a trope plot. But again, no. The reveal of the baby is super well done, I love it a lot. And it never becomes an issue until the owners leave and have a nanny come to take care of the baby, who hates the dog, kicking off the romance stuff with the tramp, which I also thought was really well done. It felt very natural. The relationship formed over just spending time together, and enjoying each other's company, it was really nice seeing it evolve. This is one of the first movies that doesn't feel like it had any filler. Each scene nicely progresses the plot and you never feel like your time is being wasted. There isn't a whole lot going on in this movie, and that really seems like it was for the best. I even really enjoyed the side characters, one of the first times I can really say that about one of these films. It's just a bit weird how there was an odd scene where the two dogs were gonna approach Lady about which of them she wants to marry, like... No. My only other real complaint with the plot is how the fallout was kinda quick. They make up again by the next scene, but at the same time I guess it wasn't really a big deal, or necessary for it to go on for a long time, so it's not like it hinders the movie in any way. The tone here is great. The music, the sound effects, the lighting, all do a great job at portraying the vibe of each scene. The part where the two are eating the spaghetti is obviously iconic, but the pine scene I also find especially miserable. In a good way, of course, that's clearly the vibe they were wanting to give off, and it's achieved greatly through the art and sound. Random note, but I also think the rain in this movie looks super fucking good, the backgrounds here are stellar. The movie ends with them chasing the guy in the carriage who- Oh my god, what the fu- he, he just hit the poor dog, why'd it do that? What the fuck is with that cut? Oh, okay, he's fine. It, it was just the most inopportune time to cut. Jesus Christ, Disney. I was very surprised here. In a good way, finally. But Lady and the Tramp was much better than I expected it to be. It tells a simple story, but you current are invested just because you like the characters and want to see their relationship evolve. It's basic, but it works well. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually putting this movie at the top of my ranking so far. It feels like the most solid one yet. I, I really, really hope they continue to build off the success of this one and get better as we go along. Because so far, the quality has been jumping up and down between each movie greatly. Well, let's just see if they improve with the next entry. Oh god, Sleep and Beauty, I forgot this one was even on the list. Does anyone else just sometimes forget this Disney princess? I don't know, I feel like I can't be the only one. There's just, there's just something about her that's so darn forgettable. Eh, maybe it's just because we already have a blonde princess. Maybe it's because that princess also had a blue dress. So much that in all the promotional art and future art, they ended up changing it to be permanently red for her. I know the joke is that it kept switching colors, but it was blue for the ending, so I'm counting it. Or maybe it's just because the princess herself is just so... Darn forgettable. I genuinely can't even remember her name, let me check. Aurora? Aurora, Aurora Borealis. Borealis! Okay, sorry, I promise this time, no more Simpsons joke, I just, I just got fucking PTSD from that last video. It's currently 6am and I'm sitting in an airport waiting on a flight to London. Can you tell I'm a bit pissy? 
I don't even know why, I fucking loved Sleeping Beauty, it was a great movie, one of my favorites, honestly. If not my favorite so far. That was so unexpected, I went into this one ready to be bored to death. But no, this movie was wonderful. During the celebration for the birth of the King and Queen's daughter, the evil witch Maleficent enters uninvited, and puts a curse on the child to be poked to death by a spinning needle thing on her 16th birthday. So she's sent off into hiding with her three fairy parental figures, until then, where the curse shall be lifted through true love's kiss. First of all, I don't usually start with this, but the animation of this movie is fucking gorgeous. This art style is like peak Disney backgrounds for me, I love it. Everything's so flat and straight, yet oozing with life through the color choices. The art style went for a more art deco look, and it was definitely the right decision because Jesus Christ, I've never wanted to own an art book for one of these movies more than I do right now. This also translated into the character designs. They're a lot less soft and rounded as they were before. Characters feature a lot more jagged edges and straight lines, which complements the backgrounds beautifully. Not to mention it makes the antagonist all the more intimidating. After watching this film, I'm not surprised for a second that Maleficent got as popular as she did, and later went on to receive her very own shitty live-action movie that tries to make you sympathize for her character. I mean, you know she's pretty darn evil when her whole reason for cursing the child is that she didn't get invited to its christening. The worst thing about this movie that I can say is that the main character, Aurora, is kind of fucking boring and doesn't do anything. She's the least interesting thing about the film, but really, I don't mind it as much as I thought I would've. And that's largely because of the great supporting cast. Like I mentioned, we have one of the best Disney villains yet. But this is also one of the first times that the prince has been developed a little bit in one of these. With him not wanting to marry who his father wants and is willing to be with a peasant. It's just a lucky coincidence that the person his father wants him to marry is Aurora. But I'll let it slide, movie. Just this once. But I also really enjoy the three fairies. I think next to Maleficent, they're the most iconic things about it. And they're just really entertaining to watch, what more is there to say? They all work off each other really well and never feel overbearing, which is what I was expecting since there's three of them. But no, they were a great addition, I loved them. This film does have one glaring oversight though that I don't think I can forgive. So like I mentioned, Aurora is cursed to being pricked by a needle on her birthday, and die. And this whole movie is about them trying to get around that. But I think we're all forgetting about the obvious solution here. Amputation. I'm just saying, would have been a much shorter movie. Obvious jokes aside, I was genuinely really surprised here. I loved Sleeping Beauty a ton. This is one of the first times I'm saying this about one of these films, but... I may watch it again at some point, and I think that's pretty high praise. Yeah, coming from you, Mark, you fucking little negative prick! Uh, uh, no, sh sh shut up. No. Excellent! Enter your name. So, we're through the first 10. Can't say I'm absolutely loving my time with these right now, but at the same time, I'm not really hating it either. It makes sense why some of these are the way they are. It's Disney's first batch of movies, so they're still finding their place and flow of things. And if we ended on a high note like that, then I'm thoroughly looking forward to what comes in the future. I thought I was gonna love 101 Dalmatians. It's like, one of Disney's most famous movies for Christ's sake. I mean, dogs are epic. I love dogs. And you know what's better than one dog? 101 dogs. But nope. Movie was very average. To be fair, I actually really loved the first... I don't know, 15 to 20 minutes. All the stuff about the dog trying to get his owner together with the lady was great, as well as the build up to them having their puppies. But once the film starts to focus on them getting kidnapped by Cruella de Vil, I just completely lost interest. I guess it's because none of the puppies ever really got that much establishment other than the one who likes to watch TV and the, the fat one who likes to eat, who would have guessed it. I know it would have been hard and probably unneeded to set up each and every character and make them unique. I guess I just wish more time was spent with them before being kidnapped, so we could actually feel more for their mum and dad when they're looking for them, because I honestly did not give a shit. To alert all the animals around of the kidnapping, there's this elongated scene of the dogs throughout the country calling each other, and at that point I kind of just dropped off and never really regained my interest throughout the rest of the film, sadly. And it's shit because there are plenty of aspects I really enjoy. The animation for one. I was really caught off guard at the more sketchy style this one had, but they blend in super well with the backgrounds, and gives the film a much rougher feel which definitely works well. Until the parts where it may look a little... too unfinished, it comes off like they just kinda colored in the roughs and it really takes me out of it when I start to see the guidelines on the characters' heads pop up every now and then. 
Also, about halfway through, the background style randomly changed to the more traditional Disney movie background, and I don't know what happened here, maybe they got someone else in later during the production? Because it looks way too different, and furthermore clashes with the animation style. But another great aspect of this movie is the villain. After watching this film, I'm not surprised for a second that Cruella de Vil got as popular as she did, and later went on to receive her very own shitty live action movie that tries to make you sympathize for her character. <laughs> She's just a massive fucking bitch. Like, her plan is to literally kidnap 101 dogs and then proceed to skin them alive. Like, what the fuck, man? That's awful. Her design is great, too. She's so skinny and lanky, but her movements and facial animations makes her so threatening. Wasn't a fan of her two bumbling comic relief henchmen, however. I think this is the first time in these movies that we've seen this trope, and it is a very, very common one. We're gonna soon see this redone time and time again. And I don't know, these two guys just never really left any kind of impression on me. Like, the question always has to be asked. If the main villain is so powerful and threatening on their own, then why do they need henchmen? And why incompetent ones at that? That's not necessarily a problem with this movie, but get ready because I'm gonna talk about it much more later on. The only other thing I really have to comment on here is that I find it amusing to look for all the cost-cutting measures they're starting to take here. Like, they keep reusing this one shot of Corella going back and forth in her car looking through the window, and their nanny is... <laughs> well, that's literally just a reworked character design from Sleeping Beauty. Come on now, Disney, you can't fool me. I'm an internet critic, and I think I know a thing or two about movies, Disney. Well, yeah, I don't know. I really can't even say I hate 101 Dalmatians. I know I'm saying this for a lot of these, but don't worry, I'm not just trying to see a face. I'm gonna be saying I hate a lot of these upcoming ones. Don't you worry your little head about it. But I don't know, I guess I just find this movie mostly boring. It started good. Like, very good. Again, I really loved the stuff at the beginning with the dog narrating his life about his owner, and then trying to get him in a relationship with a woman. Seeing that all come together was really charming, and I wish the film were more like that, because the other stuff is just... Not for me, I suppose. 101 Dalmatians for now is going under Cinderella but above Bambi. As these films evolve, my leeway towards them finding their footing is gonna fade. Bambi may have been good for one of their firsts, but for as eh as I think 101 Dalmatians is, it was able to at least tell a consistent story, which is why it goes above Bambi. Just to explain, it's a very confusing way. Sword in the Stone is so ridiculously shit, I couldn't even fathom it. I'm just jumping right into this one. Lol, I, I, I wrote lol in the script, wow. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but going into this one, I actually expected this movie to be about... Oh, I don't know, the sword in the fucking stone. But no, the sword doesn't come into it until the very last damn fucking scene. I thought this film was gonna be about a kid who pulls the sword out of the stone and is now the king and doesn't feel like he's fit for it. And I was kind of right, because by the end of the movie, he becomes the king accidentally and is all like, yeah, I, I don't really know if I can do this. And then Merlin comes in and is like, yeah, but you know, you will. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Merlin is then all like, no, they're gonna make movies about you someday. And Arthur goes, what's a movie? And Merlin goes, oh, people in the future watch him. The fucking end. You, you think I'm joking? No, look. Why, they might even make a motion picture about you. So what is the rest of the movie about, I hear you ask? Well, the movie is just one big fucking training montage. From what I can remember, because I fucking blanked out a couple times during it due to boredom. Merlin predicts Arthur is gonna be the guy to pull the sword out of the stone, and so starts to teach him different lessons about being the king. So he teaches them. Yep. This just feels like a bunch of episodes of a baby's educational TV show thrown together and called a movie. This would have worked much better as a show. Merlin teaches him by turning them both into different animals, with each of them representing a different lesson. That would be a great show, each episode they turn into a different animal and do stuff. But I don't know, maybe I just would have preferred it as a show because it means I wouldn't have had to watch it for this fucking video. And don't confuse things here. I'm not mad because this movie didn't do what I thought it was gonna do. I'm not mad that it subverted my expectations. I'm mad because it's shit. The only, and I mean only part of this movie I enjoyed was near the end, where he gets kidnapped by the witch and they have to have a wizard battle turning into different animals to fight. That shit was cool, they should have done it more. But then again, it's not even like I was all that invested because the antagonist was just introduced in the same fucking scene. Where did she come out of and why should I care? Where's this witch's solo movie where we can learn her tragic backstory and need to sympathize for her character? Come on, Disney. Oh, that's right, I forgot. She's ugly. And ugly people can't be sympathetic. Ha! Yeah, that's why we hate you, Mark.
What? How do you get in here? I sure do love how they got a little boy to voice Arthur, but he hit puberty, so they had to get another boy. But then he hit puberty, so then they had to get another boy. You think I'm joking? Nope. Listen to two different clips of them. They all sound different. I am? He was a monster. The biggest fish I ever saw. I can't even say the animation looks good here. It's got that same sketchy style as 101 Dalmatians, but it comes off way more half-assed here, and the charm of it is completely removed. And the backgrounds have this awful muddy feel to them. The colors are just washed out and gross looking. This film really has no pros to me. Do people like this movie? I have no fucking clue. But I don't know, I just did not see the appeal. It was terrible, genuinely terrible. The only movie I can even think of putting this above is Fantasia. But that's not that hard to accomplish considering they're two completely different genres of film. Sword in the Stone? More like, any more and I'll groan. As in, as in, if we get any more stupid movies like this, I'll be fucking pissed. Let's just hope for now that this is as bad as it's gonna get. Because if this is the route Disney is going down, then I'm not gonna have the nicest things to say about the rest of these. I went into Jungle Book assuming I already knew what it was going to be about. It's Jungle Book, I watched that a bunch as a kid. It's a great movie, I really love the relationship between the boy and the girl, the village they lived in, and I remember really thinking those juicy mango things looked so fucking nice. Then I proceeded to watch the film and realized I was instead thinking of the shitty sequel movie made by Toon Disney. So I guess I hadn't seen this one before. And that's too bad because I think if I were a kid I would have loved this film. But looking at it for the first time now? Yeah, it's still pretty good. Jungle Book stars a young boy named Mowgli, who was raised by wolves in the jungle. But when it's heard that a tiger is coming to where they're at, they send him off to go back and live with regular people, but gets sidetracked along the way by this bear named Blue, who shows him the ways of life on their journey home. This movie is sort of sold in the relationship between Blue and Mowgli. Just saying now, if you do not like Blue or find him annoying, you are not going to enjoy this movie at all because he eventually starts to steal the show after a while. And to me, that isn't a bad thing at all. I think he's extremely charming. He just hangs around and takes a parental role with Mowgli, simply because he likes having him around. This film has a lot of great characters, especially in terms of the antagonists. The snake guy, Ka, this fucking design is so good. I love it. When he's hypnotizing people and we see the colorful spirals start to fill their eyes, it's just, it's just it's mesmerizing. So, yeah, I guess that fits. And the tiger guy is also pretty threatening. You know, despite me not remembering his name, but I swear he made his presence known. Even when not on screen. Because to be fair, he really doesn't have a lot of screen time in this film. But I also think that's another cool aspect of it. He's always this looming threat, always getting closer, but you just don't know when he'll arrive. It adds a neat little ticking clock to their adventure. That's also added to by how big and vast the jungle feels. You never know quite where they are placed in it, so you never know where anyone is in relation to one another. Again, they're going for that very sketchy style, and I guess it works better in a movie like this than in the previous batch. You know, since it's a jungle, the backgrounds have to be very cluttered and the roughness can sort of artificially add to that. Just makes things seem busier. But for the animation, I don't know, I, I guess it's just not really my cup of tea. Again, I don't think it's that bad or that much of an issue, until I remember that Sleeping Beauty released years ago, and that's a movie that I feel had an incredibly polished and refined art style. One thing this movie does stand out with was the music. I might have forgotten about one already, but this does feel like the first Disney movie that's trying to be a musical. I don't know, maybe that's just because it's one of the first movies on the list where I can consistently remember a good handful of songs. I hadn't even seen this movie before, and I knew each and every one of them. They're just iconic. Everyone knows them. All I can really say is I... Again, I'm starting to notice a lot of the trends in these movies, with this one being the fake out death. Jesus Christ, they do it in so, so many of these. It's always, the day is saved. Aw, oh, yeah. Wait a sec. Where is this character? Then they're laying somewhere presumed to be dead and everyone huddles around like, no, it can't be true. It is Meg. Our Brian is dead. And then they start to cough and slowly open their eyes and whoop de doo they're okay. It works with proper context, but most of the time just comes off as forced emotion trying to make the audience give a shit. Anyways, I like how it ended with Mowgli actually going to live in the man village. It recognizes that he needs to be with his own kind, and I appreciate they didn't go for the cop-out ending of him staying with Blue. Honestly, I don't have a ton to say about Jungle Book. It's just a very solid film and flows well. For now, I'm going to be putting it right under Sleeping Beauty. It, it's good. Whoa boy, is this movie shit. I'm pretty sure this is the first film to come out after Walt Disney died, and this is the worst sign possible. Aristocats is about an old lady who lives in this mansion and is rich, and instead of leaving her possessions to her butler in her will, she instead is passing them down to her cats. 
I mean, fuck, if I were him, I'd be pissed too. So as a result of this, he throws the cuts far away so he can claim the fortune, meaning they need to find their way all the way home. You know, I'm realizing that this video is just like one big old version of Doug Walker's Disney Sember. Speaking of, did you know that in Nostalgia Critic's review of this movie, he just completely gets the plot wrong? And it turns out he hates cats. He's allergic to them and can't stand them. Like, what the fuck? No, when did he ever say his motivation was that he was allergic to cats? Are you dumb or did you just not watch the film? Hmm? Doug? I don't actually know Doug Walker to get in this video, but, um... But, hey, look, here's Kid Icarus. Hey, what's up, Mark? What Disney movie are we talking about today? Oh, well, I was talking about Aristocats. You were leaving. Oh, but, well, I don't know. I, I figured we were going to talk about it together. Can you tell I have nothing to say about Aristocats? It's just so fucking boring. There's so much shit here. This idea is so boring that they had to pad it out with random unrelated dog chase scenes to keep people entertained. Because unless you find these cats cute, you're getting nothing out of this one. They meet a cool and adventurous cat who they all like and he tags along. That's it. There's no conflict. Later, he says he can't go and live with them so they can't be together, but it has no effect on the rest of the film as he just is able to come back and help them anyways. And then he just, he fucking stays with them. The entire basis of this movie is all relying on one scene. And to be fair, it's a nice scene, but it does not salvage the other hour and a half at all. From the posters and shit, you'd think this film was about a ragtag group of cats who like to play jazz and are all cool and wacky, but nope. These cats appear in a grand total of two scenes near the end, and only in one of them do they do anything of substance. Like, what I appreciated about the music in The Jungle Book is that for the most part each song was able to progress the plot in some way. I think if you're going to have diegetic music in your movie, it's very necessary that the plot doesn't just come to a standstill during the song. Like in The Bear Necessities, it's showing the progression of Mowgli learning how to act carefree like a bear and gives him more of a reason to want to stay in the jungle. Or in I Wanna Be Like You, a bunch of stuff is going on during the song with Blue's infiltration. But here they just enter a building, dance along to the song for a bit, and then up and leave. It's pointless and, quite honestly, misleading advertising. The one racist Chinese cat also didn't age very well, did it? Is this anybody's favorite Disney movie? Even their favorite from this era? I want to know, if you genuinely think this film is great, then leave a comment below telling me why. I really am curious. Because I get absolutely nothing out of this one. This is this is one of the worst I've seen so far. This isn't even to mention how awful the sketchy style is getting. I'm, I'm sorry, I really don't like it. It feels like it's getting more and more rough and shitty by the movie. Like, look, you can see this lady's face structure. It's so obvious. It, it just takes me right out of the film. Aristocats is going right above Sword in the Stone. Really did not enjoy this one at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is this our first furry movie? You know, like our first furry furry movie. The exaggerated, more humanoid, anthropomorphic designs and such. Guess I can see why this movie is so popular. It stars fucking Nick Wilde from Zootopia. That is probably the most obvious joke to me, Akira. I'm so sorry. Anyways, yeah, Robin Hood was very good. I enjoyed it a lot. This is another one that I was looking forward to seeing for the first time and was surprised I hadn't, so it's good to see that it was actually pretty good. That isn't to say I have no issues with it, but I can put Robin Hood above a lot of the other films on this list because I think the filmmakers did a really, really good job at making Robin Hood a likable protagonist that you care about. I mean, it sure would have been hard not to make him likable and charming. The dude is a dashing adventurer out to steal from the rich and give money back to the poor. They really cover all fronts in making you feel like he's completely justified in the actions he takes. They establish that the town is extremely poor, that the taxman nickels and dimes them for everything they've got left, and that it all goes to a spoilt, undeserving king. Again, it's completely deserved. The film's strongest suit is the characters. There really is nothing to the plot. Robin Hood and his sidekick go about stealing money from the rich and giving it back to the townsfolk. This is until Robin is found out and the town all go to prison for being unable to provide the king's tax, and therefore Robin has to come back and save them. That's it. Super basic. But the charming characters elevate it tenfold. I really was expecting the worst from this film at certain points, but was extremely relieved it never went in those directions. Like, there was a part where a group of kids were playing outside the king's castle and lose their ball in the yard. And after being warned about it, the young boy goes in anyway. I was expecting this to be a big dramatic scene of the king or his guards coming in and yelling at the boy or throwing him in the dungeon or something. But no, he's greeted by Mead Marion, who's just nice to them and talks for a bit about Robin Hood. It was a really sweet scene, I loved it. Marry her? You don't just walk up to a girl, hand her a bouquet and say, Hey, remember me? We were kids together. Will you marry me? Well, that's how marriage has worked in all these other films. The whole bow and arrow contest stuff was also really entertaining. Robin's disguise was great, along with the snake trying to capture him. They do a lot of fun stuff with his design. 
Feels like a bunch of leftovers from Jungle Book, honestly. Speaking of, I noticed a lot of reused animation in this film from their previous stuff. And since we're still at the movies that were coming out right after his death, I feel like this is going to be becoming a more common occurrence. But it's not a huge deal. I get why it's done. I love how the villain progresses over the course of the movie. Usually, they have them start as a massive threat who slowly becomes more and more comical by the end, with the more they're degraded. But no, here the opposite happens and it's amazing. The more failures he has and the more he's humiliated, the harsher and harsher he becomes, taxing the citizens more and more and eventually just locking them up in his dungeon, nearly starving them to death. It's super threatening. Sadly though, this is probably the part I enjoyed the least. The ending. As a reason to get Robin out of the picture so the king can feasibly capture all the townsfolk, it sort of removes the most likable part of the film for a while. You know, that being Robin. He proposes to Maid Marian and then they go off and have their honeymoon or something. Goodbye to her, she barely comes back. But when Robin does come back, it's just a big long action sequence of them sneaking into the castle to rescue the townsfolk, and then stealing all the king's wealth. And I just kind of dozed off at this point, I feel like it could have been cut down quite a bit. But yeah, that's Robin Hood. Not much substance, but what is there I actually liked a lot. It's got fun animation, a realistic dilemma, and most importantly, a great cast of characters, who I enjoyed watching in the settings they were put in. Even if I do prefer the scenes of them just talking about stuff or conning the rich over the big action scenes. I'm going to be putting Robin Hood between Dumbo and Sleeping Beauty. Uh... So Winnie the Pooh. I mean, it's on the list, so I gotta talk about it. I don't know what I was really expecting here, and I guess at the end of the day, the movie did exceed my expectations. It's just that my expectations were that this was gonna be a dumb baby movie for dumb babies. So from what I could gather, this actually isn't even really a proper movie. What happened here is that Disney just took three Winnie the Pooh shorts. Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree, Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day, and Winnie the Pooh and Tigger too, chucked them all together, added a short little epilogue thing and called it a day. So it's an anthology? Sorta? I guess I refrain from calling it a direct anthology because they do try to add in connecting scenes. They do try to make it seem like a proper movie, but I don't know why they even bothered at this point. Clearly they didn't give that much of a shit like this. But even still, I can't and won't call this film bad because the shorts that they do have are mildly entertaining. As entertaining as little baby shorts can be, I guess. A big issue in adapting a book series or a TV show into a film is the feeling that what you're watching just comes off as a prolonged version of the original, and can sometimes struggle with figuring out how to put these characters in a scenario that feels like it warranted being feature length. I mean, this exact series has struggled with that issue in its later films, so why do you get around that? Just compile a bunch of shorts and call it a movie. Best of both worlds. I mean, there's a reason why most of the Winnie the Pooh movies in recent times have actually more so used the character in his books as a framing device, instead building the story around the creation of the character and the impact that had on the creator and his son, Christopher Robin. And that's because honestly, everything around Winnie the Pooh is ten times more interesting than the actual character. The whole thing around the author naming a character in the books after his son, who then grew up to years of bullying and torment for sharing a name with this little loser, and ended up resenting his father for it, is like, fuck, that shit is interesting. Winnie the Pooh likes honey. Yay. To be fair, I do like the characters. Pooh is a lot more of a straight man than I thought he'd be, and I always get a kick out of his voice. Even if it is just the exact same voice as the snake from the Jungle Book. He just lives in such a nice little world. The film has a very slow pace, but I do like it. It's a very relaxing movie. That is, until it ends on this fucking thing. An issue that arises, however, as a result of compiling different shorts, is that you get the feeling that certain characters changed a bit or got more refined as time went on. Like in the Heffalump short, Pooh is oddly snarky and more annoyable than he usually seems to be. They don't do a great job of connecting them all together. You can tell based on the animation quality when the scenes were added in post, or if they were created for the original. But I do like the whole storybook feel the film had. I think that distracts from the drawing transitions mostly. You know, shots won't just change styles over the course of a single cut, there's always a transition to it which is cool. I really love how meta the movie can get. Not in that Pooh will stop what he's doing and look at the camera like, Hey audience, got a load of this thing. No, he just talks with the narrator and it can be quite funny. What isn't funny is the added epilogue scene. Dude, this shit is fucking depressing. No, not the traced animation from Jungle Book, I get why they do that. I mean, it's just Pooh and Christopher Robin slowly walking through the Hundred Acre Woods, asking if Pooh is gonna be alright without him, and wondering if he'll always remember him, with the implication being that he's growing up and isn't gonna be able to spend a lot of time with him anymore. Which is depressing as fuck, such a mood swing. 
but I like it. It's bittersweet and adds a very realistic bond between Christopher Robin and this little made-up world he's created. The Mini Adventures of Winnie the Pooh is okay. There's a lot I enjoy about it, but at the end of the day, it's just an anthology disguised as a proper movie. I'm putting it below Alice in Wonderland, but above Snow White. <laughs> The Rescuers fucking sucks, dude. Like, seriously, I've yet to be so utterly fucking bored by one of these films. They all have at least one or two redeeming qualities, but no, The Rescuers were shit, I hated it. So, there's like this World Defense Force that's made up of mice, who all get together for these meetings and send some of their members out on missions to save those in need. And so this girl one and the janitor, I think, are sent out to rescue this little girl who was abducted from her orphanage and is being kept captive on this shitty building surrounded by crocodile-infested waters, where this lady is making her go down into this tiny hole to get a valuable gem for her. This is fucking depressing, I thought this was a silly little mouse movie. The mouse! <laughs> I don't know, just for me personally, I sort of felt like this was pushing it at points in terms of how dark it was getting. Like, I don't usually mind that stuff, but here it just felt insincere and only done so Disney can pull your heartstrings as much as possible. It's a little girl, and she's an orphan, and she gets kidnapped, and she's being tortured, and she has a little teddy bear that's being taken from her. Oh, whoa, is she? The main two characters aren't even good, they're fucking boring and have the most predictable development imaginable. Oh, so he likes the girl. I wonder if over the course of their adventure, the two of them will grow closer until she eventually likes him too. I wonder. I, I don't know, it's like I can see what they were going for, but it was done in the most basic, uninspired way possible. There's no development with them. I don't believe it when she eventually does fall for him, there's no progression, it feels so forced. And the villain is so fucking forgettable. All I could think while watching it was that they were trying to have another Cruella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians. Similar design, similar goal, similar attitude. Then I researched this shit and found out the antagonist of the film was gonna be Cruella de Vil originally. But they didn't go through with it so it didn't feel like a sequel. So now we just have this boring old bitch. Do people like this one? Genuinely, do people like this one? Because I seriously don't have a single positive thing to say about it. I could say the animation is good, but guess what? It's Disney! Good animation isn't a surprise, it's expected, it, it's, it's normality! What I can't comment on are the character designs. They're fucking shit. These mice look so generic, I hate their beady black eyes, it causes them to be so inexpressive. Seriously, all they needed was the white part, it would've looked fine. And hey, I guess they agreed with me here because what do you know, they eventually did give them that. I don't know, I don't want to spend too long on this one, because I know there are gonna be people angry at me over this. If you like it, that's fine, but sorry, this is the worst one so far for me, it was dreadfully boring. Disney, you better fucking give me something positive to say about this next one, I swear to god these Twitter users are gonna have a field day with this. The Fox and the Hound is so fucking charming, I love it. I have like a vague memory of watching the opening to this film on TV, and then turning it off when they get older because I was bored, but Jesus Christ, I really should have watched the rest of this because this movie is great. Fox and the Hound follows an extremely basic plot. Todd and Copper are neighbors, and become good friends with each other despite the warnings from their friends and family, with one being a fox and one being a dog. But when Copper is barred from seeing him again, and goes away on a hunting trip, we see Todd have to deal with the fact that not only does Copper not want to be his friend anymore, but has been trained to kill him. The characters here are so fucking likable. I love how it's a Romeo and Juliet story, but instead of being a love story, it's about friendship that's so sweet. The scenes of the two of them as kids just having fun with each other are so nice to watch. I actually wish they spent a little longer on that, to be honest. If I were to have one minor complaint with the film, it's that it needed more time spent on building up their bond before taking it away. But still, it's fucking heartbreaking. Okay, never mind, I might as well get all my complaints out of the way first. They like, randomly interject scenes of these two birds trying to eat a caterpillar and it's such a pace breaker, I really wish they weren't there. Even if the ending to it was kinda nice. I just wish the time spent on that could've been spent developing the main two characters' connection more. But I guess they figured they had to keep the kids interested somehow, so I guess he understand it. Don Bluth was an animator on this one, and it shows. The character designs for the two of them are super generic. Literally just a fox and a hound. Go figure. But they're completely sold through the expressions, they're animated so well. The environments also look great. The world is all cheery and full of wonder when it needs to be, but this movie can get really depressing, and the visuals reflect that change extremely well. Speaking of, I, I do have one more very minor nitpick with the film that I don't really think ruins it, but I think the impact the moment had would have been much greater if they pushed it further. There's this part where Todd is running away from Copper, his owner, and his other dog who took a sort of parental role with Copper. 
and after running on some train tracks, the dog eventually falls off and supposedly dies, which kicks off Copper's attitude change towards Todd with him killing his friend. With before him just wanting Todd to stay out of his way for his own good, but now he straight up wants to kill him. And this is fucking horrible, it's heartbreaking. But then we see later on they insert a random shot with the dog just fine, just just with a broken leg, that's all. What the fuck? That completely ruins the moment. The dog is supposed to die. Don't take that out of context. I don't know. Uh, apparently he wasn't actually supposed to be brought back, but that dang old Michael Eisner over at Disney made them insert the scene saying he's okay out of fear of it being too dark for kids. Oh yeah, that makes complete sense. It's not like they fucking killed Bambi's mother. But no, random asshole dog I forgot the name of was clearly the more beloved character, I understand. You're a silly, empty-headed female. I mean, it's not like the rest of the movie isn't depressing. I ought to admit, this is the first one of these that I've managed to get close to crying at. The scene of the old lady giving up Todd and abandoning him in the wilderness is just, ugh, oh, it's fucking awful, I hate it. You know, I love it, but I, I love that I hate it. This is all greatly enhanced by the score, it is amusing. The movie is quiet when it needs to be, but when the music kicks in, it's wonderful. The song that plays when she's dropping him off, Goodbye May Seem Forever, it's so fucking sad. Dude, Fox and the Hound is amazing. For every minor nitpick I could give it, I immediately forgive it just because I like the main two characters in the relationship so much. I think with me personally, it's the more simple movies that I like the most. The ones that focus on basic character dilemmas, or relatable issues our characters are going through. I'd take that over a massive action fest or magical princess fantasy any day. It's a shame I don't see this one talked about as much as the other Disney movies, but I guess that's also a good thing in some ways. It means I can say, hey, if you haven't watched Fox and the Hound, go check it out. I think it's pretty good. You could go and watch it right now, and by the time you come back, there will still be like half of the video left to watch. How weird is that? Fox and the Hound is at number one so far. Let's see if it manages to stay there. I had my expectations set super low for The Black Cauldron, and I think that may have contributed to me not hating it as much as I was expecting to. Don't get me wrong, this was a bad movie. Not good at all. But I don't know, there were a couple aspects of it I enjoyed quite a bit. From what I've heard, this was really the start of Disney's drop in popularity before the Renaissance. This movie was a huge flop, only managing to rake in $20 million. But why is that? What's so bad about it? I mean, I guess that's my job, so let's get into it. The Black Cauldron is about a young pig farmer, Taran, being called out to adventure when he finds out that a giant spooky skeleton man is after his pig, as it can tell him where to find the elusive Black Cauldron because the pig can put face into water and tell the future. And, and this is gonna allow him to unleash an army of the dead on the world. And so Taran sets out with his new friends he meets along the way to get the cauldron first to destroy it. It sucks. First of all, none of the characters managed to leave any sort of impression on the viewer. Our main kid just walks around a bunch boasting about how famous and beloved he's gonna be someday, but never actually does anything to prove himself. The only reason he's able to get anywhere is that he happens upon a magic sword that basically does the work for him. How lucky. Then the princess just does nothing but complain the whole time, the two of them have no chemistry whatsoever. Ha! Huh. What does a girl know about swords anyway? Girl? The only character in the film that manages to stick out to me was the villain. Not because he did anything impactful or was all that memorable. He just has a really fucking good design that does not deserve to be in such a generic evil for evil sake sort of character. Seriously, this is one of the coolest designs for a Disney villain, and it feels like a massive missed opportunity to go all out and make him as threatening as possible. I have to say though, the worst character is definitely the annoying little gremlin thing. His voice just fucking ruins any kind of charm he could have possibly had. Clever, sharp, I drink a sword of piggy run. All the voices suck in this movie, to be fair. The boy has this obnoxious British accent which makes his egotism pop out more. And no, that's not a good thing, it just makes him unbearable to watch. I actively don't want him to succeed. There's this brilliant part of the film where the characters are told that they need to make a sacrifice to the cauldron, and the little gremlin guy just jumps in like, Oh no, I have no friends, and shoots himself right into it. And I was laughing so hard when this happened. No emphasis is put on his sacrifice, it's hilarious. The only real pro to this film is the animation. Again, Don Bluth was involved here, which is really obvious considering it just looks like a film adaptation of Dragon's Lair. It's very obviously rotoscoped on characters such as Taran, but it is a noticeable improvement from previous attempts, and actually looks quite good. My only real issue is that it causes a lot of the movements to feel a lot less exaggerated as they should be. It's all quite slow. Super impressive though in certain places, like the her and the little gremlin thingy that I still refuse to learn the name of, 
watching it move so fluidly so fucking damn nice. The backgrounds, however, is where the movie's visuals really shine. The amount of parallaxing going on here, especially in the castle shots, is insane, and it looks like a ton of effort was put into it, and it definitely worked out in the end because some of the shots in this film look gorgeous. I don't know, the Black Cauldron is a very mixed bag for me. I know the film has recently saw a resurgence in popularity, with a lot of people coming forward about their enjoyment of the film. And the thing is, I can definitely see where they're coming from with this. I can see why people like this movie, it's definitely one of Disney's more unique films. And the dungeon crawler, more grimy feel to it is probably very appealing to a ton of people, and I get that. But for me at least, I find it really hard to think of this film as anything more than a boring mess. Where I can't find myself to care about our main character or any of his new acquaintances achieving their goals. I'm putting the Black Cauldron above Sword in the Stone but under the Aristocats. At the very least, this film felt like a movie unlike Sword in the Stone, and didn't piss me off like the Rescuers did. Boy, if I had to watch another movie about mice, I sure would be pissed. Oh perfect. Another mouse movie, really? What is it with artists and always wanting to draw mice? Oh yeah, by the way guys, I'm currently working on my own cartoon. It stars a mouse. Mouse. The Great Mice Detective is an adaptation of Sherlock Holmes, being shown from the point of view of a mice detective living inside the house of the actual Sherlock. I wasn't really digging this film at first. I felt like the characters were uninteresting and it was all moving very fast. Like the movie starts with this dad and her daughter in a toy shop and immediately he gets fucking kidnapped and taken away from her as she's left all alone like what an opening. But as the film went on I grew more and more attached to these characters and actually ended up enjoying the film quite a bit. First of all these mice designs are 10 times better than anything the rescuers had to throw at me. Wow they actually look cartoony and stylized. I can't believe making the characters more expressive would make them easier to relate to and latch on to. Who'd have thunk it? The visuals in the film are great as a whole. This is to my knowledge one of the first Disney movies to use an excessive amount of CGI, and surprisingly looks really good and blends in well for a film that came out in 1986. I think it's because they mostly delegated it for more mechanical stuff like the gears and the clock tower. It means the colors and shapes can be more simple and flat, which lends itself better for CGI of this era. I've never actually seen anything Sherlock Holmes related before. I think the series is in the public domain to my knowledge, which means that anybody can do anything they want with it, and it's created this sea of Sherlock content that I wouldn't know where to start with. Do I watch Sherlock and Gnomes? Or the hit 2018 Will Ferrell comedy Holmes and Watson? So many choices. But because of this it means I didn't really get a whole lot of the references to the source material. I, I was told there was a lot. I can imagine if you're a fan of the franchise then you get a real kick out of this movie. The main thing I got a kick out of was the villain. At first I really did not like him. I thought he was just going to be a generic capitalist who only wants and cares about money. He was intimidating for sure. Like the scene where he chucks one of his henchmen into the mouth of a cat to be eaten alive, it was super well done. But I wasn't that big a fan of his first song, or introduction in general. It was just sort of a bunch of characters telling you how evil he was and it came off like the writers were trying to convince me that he was a good villain instead of just showing me why he was a good villain. But as the film went on, I started to appreciate and actually get invested in what was happening. When I realized that this guy isn't just focused on becoming rich and powerful, his main goal here is to outsmart Sherlock. Wait, is his name even Sherlock? Wait, one sec. No, okay, his name is Basil. Perfect, I've been sitting here making an ass out of myself. L let me have it, commenters. But yeah, the relationship between the antagonist and protagonist are really what sells the movie for me. It's just a big colliding of egos, with each of them trying to prove that they're the smarter one. Like Jimmy Timmy Power Hour. There is a comparison I wasn't expecting to make today. When Basil and friends get tricked and captured by him, and he has the perfect opportunity to kill them then and there, but instead takes off and won't let them die until a song is finished playing about how he's gonna kill them, it's hilarious. I love that shit. I just love the idea that in the middle of making his plans to kill his moral rival, he decided he would write, compose, and perform a song about murdering him. <laughs> Great Mice Detective was alright. I enjoyed it a lot more than I was expecting to. I think the movie has a really strong opening and a very, very strong ending, but the middle part just felt like a standard enough detective movie. But I guess starting and ending well leaves me on a better impression of it since I've already sort of forgotten about the middle boring bits. I'd recommend checking this one out, especially for the villain. I'm going to be putting Great Mice Detective above Robin Hood but under the Jungle Book. Excellent! Enter your name. And that's the next 10 movies. Definitely more of a mixed bag here with some films I really loved, but some I really hated. Skies are looking blue, however, as we're heading into the renaissance. There's just one more hurdle to jump through before we get to that. 
I'm gonna mix the entire list together by the end of the video, so stick around to see the full completed ranking. See, that's to incentivize people to watch more. <laughs> Oliver and Company? I'd never even heard of this one before, which isn't the best sign. Oliver and Company is a very loose adaptation of Oliver Twist for some reason. It's about a young cat called... Oliver, meaning a gang of dogs who are owned by this poor guy, who's about to get his shit kicked in for not being able to pay a loan he took from an obvious evil loan shark. Then Oliver gets taken in by this little girl and he wants to stay with her, and then it becomes about the poor guy kidnapping Oliver and wanting to get a ransom for his return. My biggest issue with Oliver and company is that I do not give a shit about Oliver, nor his titular company. First of all, let's talk about Oliver himself. He's just the most boring, generic main character I ever seen. I genuinely can't even tell you what his personality is, and it doesn't even matter, because by the midpoint of the movie, he just turns into a plot device and barely has any effect on the plot through his own actions. When he gets taken in by the girl, it's not about him anymore, it's about the company and boy do they all suck. There's too many of them. There's the mean dog, the fat one, the obvious Mexican stereotype, and the girl. There might have been another in there, but they must have had such little impact on the story that I forgot about them. The issue with introducing so many characters at once is that you can't really devote any time to one of them. They have to be treated as a collective, which means anytime the movie decides to focus on one singular one of them, I can't give a shit, because we spent no time getting to know them. Like, the girl dog has, I want to say, about 10 lines throughout the whole movie, and contributes nothing to the plot whatsoever. So why is she here? To fill a quota? And their owner. Their fucking owner. I actively wanted to see him fail. First of all, why did this dude take out a loan from this guy? What brought him to that point? I guess it would be forgiven if we actually found out what he spent it on, but the fellow lives in an abandoned boat so it's not like he's paying rent, he doesn't have any good possessions he would have spent it on, and relies on his dog to steal stuff for him. What did he need the money for? Because it makes it really hard to be on his side for this, when he took out a loan knowing he couldn't pay it back. Like yeah, if I were the loan shark I'd be looking for my money too, it's kinda how it works. And then when he steals the little girl's cat, it's like, am I supposed to like and care about you? Who is our main character here? Oliver? Again, he's just an object at this point, being handed back and forth between different characters. That's a good thing about the older Disney movies being a little more slower paced. You always felt like you got the time to see a character develop or grow attached to them. Here it just keeps chucking new ones at you constantly hoping you'll like one of them and want to buy a toy of it. And hey, I guess it worked. The movie was not a big hit financially, but made plenty of revenue through merchandising, so hey, good for you Disney, I guess. The one good thing about this film is the backgrounds. Not the animation, it's very plain and standard for a Disney film, nothing all that special about it. But I loved the background designs, especially at the start of the movie. It takes place in New York, and the backgrounds complement that well. They look like paintings you'd see in a cafe or restaurant, it's a very nice style. I also loved the song at the start, Why Should I Worry? It was really catchy, and the visuals of them climbing aboard different stuff was real neat. Too bad I can't say that about the rest of the songs, I can't remember a single one. I will say though, it is weird seeing a modern dead Disney movie. Like, the other ones always took place decades ago, like in the 50s and 60s. But this one is in the 90s, I'm pretty sure. So it's interesting to see these films get more and more modern. Oh wait a fucking second, those movies came out in the 50s and 60s, so for the time they were modern. Jesus, that's weird to think about. Oliver and Company sucks, I did not enjoy it at all. The only plus I have is that it at least felt like it went by fast. But with forgettable and unlikable characters, an unengaging story, and nothing really all that special about it, I don't think I'm going to be recommending this film to anybody anytime soon. Oliver and Company is going under the Aristocats but above Black Cauldron. And with that, we're now entering the Disney Renaissance, aka when shit gets good. <laughs> I'm back from London, by the way. Remember that plot point from like an hour ago? It's what I call a payoff. Now here's something I'm just not realizing. I have never seen any of the Disney Renaissance movies. I've been exposed to all of them in some form or another, like through merchandise, listening to the music online, etc. But I've never actually taken the time to sit down and watch any of them for myself, so I guess this is the perfect excuse to finally do so. The Little Mermaid was one of Disney's first big hits in a long time, and laid the foundation for what would soon become their formula for success. Ariel is the daughter of Neptune, King of the Sea, who dreams for more in life and wishes to go up to the surface world, especially after seeing and becoming obsessed with the human prince. So after striking a deal with this evil Octo-Lady Ursula, who is a really great villain by the way, she gets turned into a human and must convince the prince to marry her, or else she'll be turned into a little creepy urchin thing. 
Yeah, so this movie really popularized the whole I want thing. I cannot tell you how many of these Disney movies are going to start opening with the father doing something big and important, and then is like, wait a minute, where's my daughter? Only to cut to her being a free spirit and wanting to get more out of life. Like, it's at least two or three. The characters in The Little Mermaid are all very likable. Ariel is a good protagonist. They make her wonder with the outside world very understandable. Like, you'd get why she wants to defy her father's wishes so much, considering he's imposed a rule to never interact with the surface world. Although that does make the ending a little contrived when she becomes a human and he's like, well, I guess we'll never see each other again. Like, no, this is a rule you imposed on yourself. But still, it's great. Along with the batch of side characters too, Disney finally decided to make the bold move of giving the prince a proper personality for once. Really breaking new ground here. And they really went out of their way to make as many marketable fish characters as possible. Like the little yellow one. What does he ever do? I'll tell you what, he makes a good plushie. I actually do really love the sidekicks. Like Sebastian, rest in peace. He's a great comedic foil to Ariel. Even if he does just talk to the prince at one point, and if he could do that, then why doesn't he just explain to him the plan? I just don't understand. Under the Sea is a good song too. All the music here is great. Jungle Book started leaning into it, but I think this was the first proper Disney musical, and I can see why they stuck to it for so long. This film has so many catchy songs. You... you can talk. I can sing! The animation here is also phenomenal. Some of the shots here are fucking gorgeous, especially during the songs like Look at This Stuff. Mark, you, uh... you know that's not the name of the song, right? Oh, uh, I don't care. The her movements on the characters while underwater looks like a real bitch to anime, but the level of detail there is next level. There's an entire, like, 30 minutes of the movie where Ariel doesn't say a single word, but you never feel like you can't tell how she's feeling because of the amazing facial animation that perfectly betrays how she's feeling through the expressions. I'm not usually a fan of underwater settings, so I was glad to see that the film didn't completely take place there. But the backgrounds and atmosphere they build up down there is amazing. It really takes quite a boring setting in my opinion, gives it so much life through the colours and variety of fish animation going on. And since Ariel doesn't talk and can't explain to the prince that she was the voice of the girl he heard the other day, it means they can spend a lot of time developing their relationship. They fall in love on the spot, yeah, but because he doesn't know it's her, it still allows them to grow attached to each other naturally, and have it evolve over time, it's great stuff. I really enjoyed The Little Mermaid. I didn't think the step up in quality would be this damn apparent, but hey. If it means more good movies, then I'm all for it. It's just a very tight and well-rounded movie. I wouldn't say it does anything exceptionally well. Like, I can imagine some of these later Renaissance movies will absolutely trump it. But everything the film tries to do, it does very well. And I'd be really happy to revisit this movie at some point for a rewatch. I'm gonna be putting The Little Mermaid above Lady and the Tramp, but under Fox and the Hound. Fox and the Hound is a little sloppier, but I think the character stuff just puts it a little above it for me. Jeez, what a great start. What's next? Oh, for fuck's sake. Why a sequel to the rescuers of all their movies? Better yet, why a theatrical sequel? I don't understand. Did the original do that well? I never see this one discussed when talking about the Renaissance films. It seems like the black sheep of the era. And honestly, that's a good thing because this movie is shit. Like, complete and utter fucking shit. The Rescuers 2 follows the same two mice on a new mission. This time trying to see if this little boy who was kidnapped by this guy who wants to turn down the forest? Wow, what an original plot. The pacing here is awful, it takes like 20 minutes to actually introduce the rescuers. But at least when we do see him, we see that they've been given the addition of white around their eyes. And oh boy, does that decision make them all the more expressive. They're also going through a basic overdone tropey plot. The boy one is trying to propose, but this new moist comes into the picture who he thinks the girl likes more than him, and now he needs to prove himself. Oh wow, I certainly do care about this cock-blocking adventure. I've just got nothing to say, it's boring as fuck and I barely remember a majority of it, because I kept tuning in and out of what was going on, it, it just couldn't keep my attention. You know, other than the amazing CGI shots, wow, look at this. So, the rescuers are trying to stop this villain from poaching and killing this eagle, who turns out has history with the villain due to leaving them at the altar, and, and so it's up to Red and the gang to stop her before she destroys both Bird and Pig Island for her own holiday resort. But when he kidnaps the boy, it's like, wouldn't his parents be super concerned over this? Their son has been taken away by a creepy old man, but why did he even capture him? What did the boy have? And that's not even to mention the drama that arises when Red starts to worry that his friends are going to leave him behind, as he feels like people only like him now because of how he saved the island in the first movie. However, it is cool to compare shots of this one to the first film, like here. 
like this is a direct theatrical sequel, so we can see just how much Disney has evolved and improved at their craft from the first film, by comparing how both characters are animated in each, it's neat. But at the same time, it isn't exactly much of a compliment for this movie. Yeah, I sure can't compare it. Really, the most interesting thing here is Red's fear of abandonment. A good sequel should always build off an aspect from the first film, so I do really like how they went with the approach of him fearing that he'll be left behind again, and it really makes you sympathise with his character, you know, it's quite a relatable issue. I don't know why the sequel never really got the recognition it deserves. Sure, it has kind of cringy humour and Anthony from Smosh voicing a character, but the guy who created the marvellous misadventures of Flapjack directed it, so that's gotta be worth something. And all this is to say, Angry Birds 2 is actually a pretty good movie, that I'd recommend you check out. <coughs> <coughs>《Beauty and the Beast》is like, one of Disney's most iconic movies ever, so I was really intrigued going into it and seeing what all the fuss was about. I mean, this is one of the only animated movies to be nominated for Best Picture, that's gotta be worth something. Beauty and the Beast stars Belle. Her father gets taken away and thrown into a cell by this mysterious beast who lives alone in his castle, so she offers to be his prisoner instead, in exchange for her father's freedom. First of all, the animation in this movie is godly. The opening background looks so amazing and detailed and the castle set is stellar. Like, just look at how colourful this is. James Baxter, the guy who animated that one Steven Universe shot and nothing else, also worked on this film. So you know the character animation is gonna be top tier. Of course, I gotta point out the iconic ballroom scene, with Belle and the Beast dancing. This is a really great use of CGI, it still to this day looks amazing. And you can understand why it was used, because the way the shot pans around the characters is so impressive. The character designs are also wonderful, the Beast especially. He's supposed to start as an antagonist of the film, but eventually redeems himself. So it was important for them to give him a design that can be threatening, but also somewhat endearing. And so he has this super intimidating and strong silhouette. So for the first few moments you look at him, you're all scared by him, because he looks like he could fucking tear this girl to shreds. But the more time they spend showing his design, the more you see the softer and more rounder aspects of him. Which eases you up and allows you to not see him as such a threat, it's really clever. I also like the designs for all the animate objects, like the candle, the teapot, and the clock. See, it's like the hands, or like his little moustache, it's so sweet. The best thing about this film, however, has gotta be the relationship between Belle and the Beast. It's very nice seeing the relationship develop over the course of the film. It all feels very natural. I've seen some people cry Stockholm Syndrome when talking about this movie, but nah, son, they were clever about it. I'm glad they included a scene early on that establishes that Belle eventually does in fact have the ability to leave, if she ever wanted to, but instead chooses to stay of her own volition. I think it all comes down to them doing a good job at showing the passage of time, you know, she doesn't just fall in love with him over the span of a day or two, or he doesn't just suddenly start acting nice to her after an evening together. We get many scenes showing his struggle to let his guard down, and to not be so rude and angry towards her. Their conversations are supernatural, and are a joy to watch. I also like the subversion here of the Beast being the love interest, and the big strong handsome guy being the villain, but I think that all comes down to them not bringing so much attention to the switch up. Current Disney feels like it's obsessed with trying to convince you that it isn't predictable like older Disney, but all it does in turn is make it incredibly predictable, but also annoying at the same time because they're desperately trying to convince you that it isn't predictable. Because all you gotta do is think, well what would have Disney done with this story? Alright, they're gonna do the opposite. Like, there isn't a scene where the guy comes up to Belle like, I am the handsome guy and he is the beast. You are supposed to be with me and not him and we shall live happily ever after. And then she gives out a big long drawn out speech about how she's not gonna conform to gender norms or some shit. Again, very natural is how I describe the relationships in this film. It's also a great musical in general, the songs here are amazing, on top of the visuals to accompany them. Obviously my favourite would have to be the main theme of the movie. It's got a very slow pace but it works perfectly in the movie. But I also really like Be Our Guest. I genuinely didn't realise that this is what The Simpsons was parodying for their See My Vest song. You'd think they would have wanted to parody a song from 101 Dalmatians for their parody of that one, but oh well. It's no surprise to me that this movie was as big of a hit as it was, making a total of $440 million on a budget of only about $20 million. I really loved Beauty and the Beast. All these Disney princess movies are turning out to be a lot better than I was assuming they'd be. Just the amount of effort this one oozes out in every single scene makes it deserving of the current number one slot. I'm curious to see if anything will end up passing it. <laughs> Aladdin passes it. Aladdin to me always seemed like one of the Disney movies I'd like the most. I really don't know why it's taking me so long to actually sit down and watch it, but yeah, it was amazing, I loved it. Aladdin stars Aladdin, a poor boy who one day unleashes a genie from a magic lamp who will grant him three wishes, and so uses it to try and get with the princess. Quite a standard plot, but the characters, atmosphere, and soundtrack all elevate this to my favourite so far. 
First of all, I want to talk about some stuff that wasn't necessarily bad, but wasn't done as well as Beauty and the Beast. That being the animation. It just doesn't look as good, plain and simple. Like, I don't know, the action is great, but the animation is all crispy. It still looks amazing, don't get me wrong. But at times it can be a little sloppy, and comes off like this was the B project while the A team were making Beauty and the Beast. Again, it looks really good, but I have to acknowledge what came before does look better. I do, however, like the more exaggerated the movements are here. With the tone of this film being a lot more cartoony, the movements and facial expressions reflect that well, and it does work really nicely. But for me, I ended up enjoying this one more than Beauty and the Beast solely because of the characters. Aladdin is a very good protagonist. With him being a poor boy who needs to steal to eat, it could have made him come off a little like the guy from Oliver and Company who was extremely unlikable, but in the first scene he's introduced, they do two crucial things that separate him from people like that. First off, while singing his song, he straight up just says, Gotta eat to live, gotta steal to eat. Yeah, that makes sense, completely understandable. Then there's the part where he gives the bread he stole to these two poor kids. Shows you he has a heart. Reminds you that he's the protagonist here and we're supposed to be rooting for him. Then there's the elephant in the room. That being Robin Williams as the genie. What is there to say that hasn't already been said a million times about him? It's just the most perfect casting choice. Well, other than Will Smith. This is one of the first examples of one of these animated movies selling themselves in the celebrity cast. A move which unfortunately worked out so well that every animated movie now needs to have current popular celebrity voicing all the main characters. But they all seem to forget what made the genie in Aladdin so amazing. The character was actually made for Robin Williams. The animators created a character around the voice, and practically just let him go to town with improv and animated around that. That seems like it could come off as disjointed, but because of the nature of the guy, you know, a magical fucking genie, it makes sense that he'd be random and wacky. They can animate him to do whatever he wants, so he can basically say anything he wants. I also like Jasmine a lot as a character. Despite doing that same old, not wanting to be a part of the arranged marriage thing and once more freedom shtick. Like honestly Disney, the subversion isn't clever if you do it in every single movie. That's what I think worked so well about Belle actually. She wasn't even a princess, her dad was just some fucko. So they didn't have to give her some predictable arc about not following the norms. The villain here is also one of the best so far. The relationship he has with his sidekick voiced by Gilbert Gottfried is hilarious, I love it a lot. He gets super fucking evil by the end, the climax to the film is great. The design of the giant genie he turns into is amazing, along with the cool snake, I love it. This is also the film with the best music so far. I don't think there's a single song here that misses, they're all amazing. I especially love the one during the opening, and the genie song, You Ain't Never Had a Friend Like Me. I think they stick out so much because the visuals and choreography in them is stellar. I always prefer songs that progress the plot more, or where the characters are actually doing something instead of just standing around and singing to the sky. And they go all out with the visuals in these ones, it's fucking amazing. Especially with the genie, he's just constantly shifting into different shapes and sizes. Also, I said earlier that the animation wasn't as good as Beauty and the Beast, but the background design in the world they live in is nothing to scoff at. Arabia looks so bright and colourful, and the desert shots look so cool and atmospheric, especially at night with the blue and purple colour scheme, it looks so cold. Aladdin is wonderful, what can I say? They take what could have been a very tropey plot, and made it infinitely more entertaining through the memorable cast of characters, and perfect voice acting. I think I'm really starting to see the appeal of these movies now. Let's hope this keeps up. Aladdin is definitely number one for now. I did not realize until watching it how big of a hit The Lion King was. This shit made over one billion dollars at the box office. Which for a 2D animated film in the 90s, a number like that is just, it's just fucking unheard of to me, it's wild. Out of all the renaissance movies we've looked at so far, this one looks like the one that would appeal to a general audience the least. Hell, I'd even argue that The Rescuers Down Under would be more appealing. But hey, there must have been something about The Lion King that intrigued people. First thing I noticed about it is that The Lion King feels like a more refined and complete version of Bambi. They follow a lot of similar story beats. Simba is a lion cub. <laughs> Rick Cube in the script, the lion cube. And son of Mufasa, wildly respected king of the Pride Lands. He's trying to train Simba in the ways of life so that he can one day take over his ruler. But he always manages to wind up in trouble some way or another. After their villainous Uncle Scar kills Mufasa and convinces Simba it was him to blame for his father's death, he tells him to run away from his problems and to never come back. You know, both movies have that whole circle of life theme going on. Even the final shot of the two films are similar, with it showing a repeat of the beginning of the film. Which might I say is really good. They open it up with all these nice warm colours, naturally showing you the wildlife. Hinting at something big going on up until the reveal of Simba, it's no wonder why this scene is so iconic. 
I think I like the relationship between Simba and Mufasa the most here. It's built up very well, and you can really tell that no matter how many times he screws up, and will believe in him becoming the new ruler. And their relationship being so good makes it all the worse when he eventually dies, it's awful. You feel so bad for him. It really takes watching the live action remake of the film to realize how perfectly they managed to do it in the original. Like, look at this shit. Like, where's the emotion here? Not just in the animation, which looks like shit, by the way, but the voice acting, too. Whatever, I'm sure you already know what a shit show that was. The sudden switch up to Simba being older surprised me, but it was a welcome change. I enjoyed that whole portion a ton with Timon and Pumbaa. For being just silly comic relief characters, they're super likable. They're not too loud and obnoxious and work well off Simba. Their songs are especially great. All the music here is pretty good to be fair. I wouldn't say it's as good as Aladdin, but shit like Hakuna Matata are really catchy and was stuck in my head for ages after watching it. But I also like the song that they sing when Timon and Pumbaa think they're gonna lose their new friend. It was also really good. Speaking of really good, the villain Scar. Disney are really getting on point with making memorable intimidating villains and he's one of the best. He's not all over the top or wants to take over the entire world. He just wants his brother out of the way so he can be the new king, and does some pretty twisted shit to get there. And by the way, his death scene caught me so off guard, like this dude is fucking eaten alive, that's horrifying. I was going to talk about how great the animation was, I was going to gush about how colourful and detailed the backgrounds are, especially for what could have been quite the standard setting, or the character animation, and how they take what could have been boring designs and make them alive with the incredible character animation and facial expressions. I was going to talk about it. But then I realized the movie put the word sex in the sky at one point for realsies, and I realized that I was being mind controlled by Disney into knowing what sex is. The conspiracy theorists are right, dude. My fucking third eye is open. What more can I say? The Lion King is amazing. I really enjoyed it. It feels like Disney have finally gotten into their groove here. Again, I like comparing this film directly with Bambi because of how similar they are, just so I can see how far they've come with the animation and storytelling. It's wonderful. I completely understand why this movie was as big as it was. And for as shit as it is, why they chose it for the remake treatment. Lion King is going right under Aladdin. I like the characters in that one just a little bit more. Did you know that The Lion King was actually just a side project for Disney? Like a movie delegated to the B team? Yeah, Disney replacing all their bets on Pocahontas to be the big heavy hitter. And yeah, didn't happen. Why is that? Was it due to a lackluster marketing campaign? Were people getting burnt out on Disney at this point? Or was it the dang furries again only caring about their dumb animal movies? Nah, it's cause Pocahontas is a shit movie. I'm not sure if we're like, leaving the renaissance now or whatever, but yeah, Pocahontas fucking blowed, I hated it a lot. From the first five minutes of the film, I immediately predicted what the plot was gonna be about, and exactly how it would end. Pocahontas is just your average free spirit, but her father wants her to get engaged with a guy that she just isn't into. We then get introduced to this guy on the other side of the world, getting ready to visit the place where she lives to hunt for gold and- Oh, it's gonna be like your average Romeo and Juliet story, where they fall in love but neither of their friends or family will allow it to happen. Boring. I think it's the underwhelming characters that makes me not as into this one as some of the others. We've seen this Pocahontas character a million times before, as well as the guy. We've seen the stubborn father, the weary friend, the evil capitalist only interested in money. And all this is topped off of some of the most unnatural sounding dialogue ever written. You are the daughter of the chief. It is time to take your place among our people. Even you are my daughter and you must get married to this boy because that is how the rules work and oh, okay, we're just- okay, we're gonna sing now, okay? Very all right. For fuck's sake, not even the music is good. It sucks too. I cannot remember a single song. I just remember the lyrics during the songs being super on the nose. They always sing the theme of the film art right. It doesn't even feel like a song. It's like they're just singing the words. I, I know that's what a song is, but this, this made sense in my head, okay? Nobody acts like a normal person in this film. Like, okay, at the end of the film, one of the guys shoots a man from Pocahontas' tribe, and it gets blamed on the guy that she was falling in love with. But she saw the whole thing happen and never once goes, Oh yeah, no, I saw the whole thing, it wasn't actually him. She instead just stands there gawking at him like, Fucking say something, you bitch! Not even the character designs and animation or anything to write home about. I hate how stiff everything looks. It feels like they're trying to go for the same look as Sleeping Beauty, which is a good thing. Again, I absolutely adore the art direction in that film, but here it has no charm to it at all. They've all been given smaller eyes, sharper lines, and they're not expressive in the slightest. I can't relate to any of these guys in any sense. It's the fucking climax of your song. Why are you so stiff? That's not even to mention when they go really off model and it looks terrible. Just, just terrible. Look at her. She's so ugly in this shot. Why did, why did they draw her like that? 
you sure this was made by the A team? At this point in time, Disney had already perfected the formula. Now it's getting a little too steel for me. I can start to predict everything that happens in these princess movies like an hour before they happen. Maybe if this film came out before stuff like Sleeping Beauty, Little Mermaid, and especially Beauty and the Beast, I'd be more positive towards it. But Disney have already proven time and time again that they could produce something of a way higher quality than this piece of shit. These white men are dangerous. No one is to go near them. I gotta say, I, and I may end up regretting this later, but this is the worst one so far. Really. Worse than Rescuers Down Under. I can at least see that being entertaining for kids, but Pocahontas? I can't see who this appeals to at all. I don't know if the renaissance continues from here or if we're starting to go back downhill, but either way, looking at the date, I think we're about to stop off in our first detour of the video. Yeah, it's kinda weird to interrupt the renaissance for this, but I mean, it is the next in the timeline, so well, what are you gonna do? This was the first theatrical film by Pixar and took the world by storm, eventually shaping the future of animated films, noticeably being the first fully CG animated movie. I guess to talk about that aspect first, this film's animation has aged surprisingly well. It was a really smart idea to have it revolve around toys coming to life. Because of their plasticky looks and weird movements, it disguises a lot of the dated CG and makes it appear more intentional. But is this movie all style over substance? Was it only big because of the animation? Well, I personally think it was big because everything it tried to do was something that hadn't really been seen before. Like I've talked about before, all these Disney movies try to be big grand epics about princesses or magic or whimsical talking animals. Toy Story in comparison is quite different from that sort of storytelling. I'm sure you all know the plot, but for the two of you who are unaware, this is Woody. He's Andy's most favorite toy. Andy gets a new toy Buzz Lightyear. Conflict. Woody is definitely the best part of the movie. As a kid while watching this, I never realized how much of a cunt he acted in the first half. It makes sense that being seen as Andy's favorite toy for so long would give him an ego, and his character has a very natural turnaround. That also may have been why the film stood out so much. So many of these movies are just good versus evil, a good-hearted protagonist versus a cold-hearted villain. But no, it's just about a guy learning not to be such a dickhead. I guess it's got edge if I were to apply a word to it. It's just a solid character study, and that's what works so well about it. Like the fucking scene where Buzz tries to fly out the window and falls to the ground with Randy Newman singing in the background, it gets me every fucking time. The soundtrack as a whole is great. Randy Newman has a very funny voice as you could probably tell, but it adds a lot of the charm to the songs. The pacing in this film is also just oh, fucking perfection. All the story beats happen right when they need to, and things constantly progress, there's not a bit of fat in this movie. Which is a fucking miracle after you hear about all the production troubles it went through, in terms of trying to figure out exactly what story they wanted to go with with them originally making Woody this massive asshole, even worse than in the final film. And finally, the comedy. Yeah, it's funny. Ah! It's not like laugh out loud hilarious or anything, but that more cynical edge really adds to the humor. That is sin. <laughs> you mean that happy child? I've seen a lot of people try to nitpick this movie in recent times by trying to explain how the logic makes no sense. Like, why does Buzz go inanimate when Andy comes in if he thinks he's a space ranger? But I don't know, I can look past stuff like that, because it really doesn't take away anything from the film. Toy Story is still to this day a really great film that has aged almost perfectly. I really am not surprised Pixar took off like it did, and soon began to dominate the world of animated features. This movie was such a breath of fresh air among the other stuff coming out at the time. I'm dropping Toy Story above Fox and the Hound, but under Beauty and the Beast. Look, I'm Woody. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Ah uh ha, -huh, ah uh ha, -huh. give me that. Dude, I thought The Hunchback of Notre Dame was gonna be boring as fuck, but I ended up loving it a lot. Hunchback is about a man trying to drown a baby who was born with a deformity. Like, right off the bat, this film starts with attempted child murder. But after being warned about the gods being upset with him for doing that, he decides he shall raise the child as his own, keeping him locked inside the bell tower never to leave. The villain here is the best thing about the movie. I love the opening when he's warned about what might happen to him if he goes through with killing the kid immediately shows that he's not just a one-note bad guy and has his own set of fears. Like, he sings an entire song about how he doesn't want to be sinful, and also that he wants to fuck a girl, but we can just ignore that part. And giving him a direct tie to our hero is great, because it gives Quasimodo a reason not to want to betray his wishes, and makes it all the more heartbreaking when he fucks him over, because that's the person he saw as his father for his whole life. Quasimodo has a really good design. They put themselves in a tough spot with him. They need him to look hideous and deformed, so that there's a reason for him not to want to go to the outside world, but also appealing enough so that the general public aren't disgusted by him, and therefore don't want to watch the movie. And this struck the perfect balance here. 
The whole film looks great, especially the backgrounds, but again, is that even a surprise at this point? Quasimodo's arc is also one of the best out of all these films. I love that when he goes outside for the first time, it's not all res of sunshine, with people accepting him immediately. Like, no, they put him up on a stage, tie him up, and throw rotten fruit at him. It's horrible. Like, the standard Disney fantasy way to go about this sort of story would have been to have him go outside and everyone learns to love him, and the girl who he likes falls in love with him and they all live happily ever after. But no, that doesn't happen. The girl who he's in love with ends up getting with the strong, handsome guy character. It's like the movie is from the perspective of the comic relief secondary character. While a different movie is going on where the other guy's the main. The scene where she kisses him is so sad, Quasimodo is so sympathetic. But at the same time you can understand why that's happening. You know that realistically they'd never work out together, and he has to face that harmful truth. It's a very dark movie in terms of what the character has to go through, but that's why I like it so much. Make way for the captain! Go, make way. Look, it's Patrick Starr doing his Patrick Starr voice. It's not relevant, I just want to talk about it. The thing I like the least about this movie is the dumb comic relief side characters that come in the form of these gargoyle guys. I think the thing that's most annoying to me about them is that they could have been really good. I feel like they had an idea for them that just eventually got forgotten about. So they only ever talk to Quasimodo up in his tower, and any time another character comes in they turn into inanimate objects again. Like obviously the implication here is that he's imagining them. His only friends are the ones that he imagines himself, while alone up in the bell tower. That, that idea is genius. Except for the random parts where the gargoyles directly interact with the outside world, like with the goat and during the final battle scene. Whoops, must have slipped your mind. And it sucks because they do something really horrible by convincing Quasimodo that the girl is into him and that he needs to go for it. He never thought that before, but they put the idea in his head. This would make sense if it were in his imagination, like he personifies his friends telling him that she does, but it's all in his head. But no, since they're real, they really were just setting him up for disappointment. Still though, they don't do a whole lot so it doesn't ruin the movie. The most they have is their love song that sounds like Family Guy music. Hunchback of Notre Dame is an amazing movie. I loved it way more than I thought I would. With a fucking stellar villain, an incredibly likable protagonist, and great music and animation, I would say this is my second favourite film so far. Hunchback is going right under Aladdin. I don't know if it's heresy to put it above Beauty and the Beast, but what can I say? Just like the characters more. Glad to see the renaissance is finally picking back up again. But I wonder how long that's gonna last. I wanted to like Hercules so fucking bad. <laughs> Genuinely, I really, really thought I was gonna absolutely love this movie. But in the end, it's just kinda... Alright, it's got a lot of issues. And to be fair, this movie starts really good. Not in terms of like the story or the characters or anything, I literally just mean the first couple minutes. I think the song is really catchy, and the way it's visualized is dope. I suppose I'll get that out of the way first. The style of this film is exactly what I want out of one of these movies. They combine a bunch of different themes and aesthetics for this movie, and it works really well in my opinion. I love how they have this Las Vegas vibe for their world. It makes it look so distinct like nothing we've seen in a Disney movie before, and it meshes super well with the Greek mythology aesthetic. I also love the funky gospel music they interject the film with, sung by these ladies on a vias. The animation gets so cool and colorful during those segments. The animation as a whole, again, is embracing a style more akin to Sleeping Beauty, with the more angular designs, and it works perfectly. You know, ignoring young Hercules' oddly protruding calves. And the designs for all the mythical monsters and demons look great. The CG isn't too bad for the time. I especially love the look of the gods in the underworld with Hades and his minions. But like, everything I like here is just style. It's all flair, no substance. You know, when I think back to Hercules, like, oh, that was a good one. I have to then remember there was a movie in between the neat visuals and catchy music. Hercules is the pride son of Zeus, destined to one day put a stop to Hades. But to prevent this, Hades gives him a potion that strips Hercules of all his powers, meaning he must be sent down to the human world to live among regular people. But after finding out about his true calling in life, Hercules must prove himself a hero in order to be given back his powers and allowed to be a god. That's an alright idea, but in execution? I don't know, they just didn't do anything all that interesting with it. They never actually take the time to establish Hercules to us before his call to action. They spend so much time on the opening of him as a baby that all we get is a two minute scene of him going to town and having everyone thinking he's weird. Then he just goes off and sings his I Want song. And it's a good song, again, all the music here is wonderful. But I don't know who this guy is, so why should I be invested in this? Then he goes in his way and tries to get training from this little trainer guy voiced by the legend Danny DeVito. And then it starts to move way too fast. The dude sings a song about how he doesn't want to train anyone anymore, but when the song ends, he's like, oh, okay, sure, whatever, I'll train you. 
They don't even slow things down to properly explain to the audience that this is like a fantasy world, where humans coexist with these mythical creatures. I just assumed they were all in hiding or something, but no. I like all the action scenes of him proving himself a hero, but the plot around that just feels so rushed and sloppy. Not even the romance feels well developed. Meg is your standard, I'm not just some damsel in distress character. Like this subversion is getting really fucking annoying when you're so on the nose about it. Hercules, look out! Meg! The best thing about the film is definitely the villain, and that all comes down to the performance by James Wood. This dude kills it as Hades. He has the least threatening voice of any of these guys, but it makes it all the funnier when he talks to Hercules like he's trying to sell him some car insurance. The only thing I wasn't a fan of with him was his two bumbling sidekicks. Again, the question has to be raised, he's the ruler of the underworld, why doesn't he just get some competent henchmen instead of demonic Ren and Stimpy over here? Again, I don't know. I, I want to like Hercules really badly. I don't even hate it. I think all the stuff I like about it elevates it enough to be like a solid 6 out of 10. Like, it's good, you know? But the pacing is just so fast and annoying, I never felt like any of these characters were getting enough time to develop for me to actually start caring about them. They're trying to cover way too many plot points in such a short time span. I'm going to be putting Hercules right above the Jungle Book, but under Sleeping Beauty. Because again, the aspects of it I like, I really fucking adore. Excellent! Into your name. And that's the next 10. Yeah, I can definitely feel us moving out of the renaissance by now, which sucks, it feels like we just got here. But oh well. At least with the introduction of Pixar, we get more diverse movies to look forward to. <laughs> Mulan was an interesting one. There were a lot of aspects I really enjoyed about the film, along with some stuff that I wasn't as into. But overall, I'd say it's a good movie. A group called the Huns are invading Imperial China, and so the Emperor requires one man from each family to join the army. But due to his poor health, Mulan decides to sneak out and join the army herself, pretending to be a man, in order to protect her father. I think the plot here is great. It's cool having a female protagonist here that isn't just a standard Disney princess. Nah, she wants to fucking fight. Early on in her training, she gets told that she isn't cut out for the army, and is told to travel back home. I mean, fuck, that's amazing. She doesn't have to fight in the war, and her father doesn't either. That's perfect. But it's clear to us at this point that it's no longer about protecting her dad. Her goal now is to prove herself worthy. That's like some Scott Pilgrim shit right there. Oh, fuck, no, I shouldn't have brought up Scott Pilgrim. Now half the comments are gonna mention nothing but how happy they are for me talking about it, while the other half is gonna be pissed I'm talking about it. Shit, shit, back to Mulan. I hear in the 2020 remake they completely removed that part of her arc. She's just a badass from the start and wants to show that she's an independent woman who don't need no man. But here it works way better. Her decision to stay and begin pushing herself is done without saying a single word. It's an excellent piece of visual storytelling. And speaking of the visuals, I really love the Chinese aesthetic. It's always been one of my personal favorites, and they do a good job with it here. Mulan's home looks amazing. The saturated greens work so well against the pinks of the cherry blossom trees, and the reflection of the water looks so good. And I love when they show smoke that stylize it like spirally clouds, it's so fucking pretty. Mulan is a very likable protagonist. She goes through a lot of struggle in this movie, and takes a lot of the time to train by herself and get better. It makes you want to see her succeed in the end, and makes it all the more satisfying when she does. I also really liked her dragon sidekick Mushu. He's very funny. Sadly though, I can't listen to him talk without hearing Donkey from Shrek, it's just Eddie Murphy doing his Eddie Murphy voice. In terms of the side characters, I wasn't all that into them. For a movie that seems to be going for quite the progressive angle, you know, a girl who's super badass and can fight these huge evil guys, I felt it a little underwhelming that all the men are dumb fat stereotypes. I don't know, it just seemed like the most obvious thing that could have been done with them. The only one who wasn't a bumbling fool was the love interest, which just makes things super obvious who she's gonna end up with by the end of things. Like, we wouldn't want to give off the impression that Mulan would go out with someone who's fat and ugly, would we? Ugh. The love interest was okay though, even if I wish Mulan and him got some more time to talk and just interact. You know, he likes her purely in the fact that she's able to fight good. When we find out she was lying about being a man, he wanted nothing to do with her. I am glad whoever that whole liar reveal trip doesn't go on for too long. That would have gotten very obnoxious. Last thing I guess I'll comment on would be the music. It's good. Definitely not my favorite out of these movies, but I still really enjoyed some songs like Mulan's I Want Peace and the one about the army training. It's quality stuff. Overall, I'd say Mulan is a good movie. It teaches a solid moral. The gender isn't really important to whether or not you can do something. It all depends on if you're willing to put in the hard work to get there. I will say that among these other great movies such as Aladdin and Hunchback, I'd argue that those still manage to be better through having a better variety of characters. Like, Jesus Christ, I completely forgot to even mention the villain from Mulan. He's so forgettable, I forgot to even talk about him. Mulan is a good movie. 
just not a great one. And for those reasons, I'll say that it goes under The Little Mermaid, but above Lady and the Tramp. Wow, okay, I forgot this one even existed. A Bug's Life is one of the only Pixar movies I've never seen before. I don't know, as a kid it just never interested me all that much, it seemed like such a boring setting. I mean just look at this shit, these visuals look so steel and uninteresting. Apparently this is one of the films that the fine folks over at Pixar are most proud of. So just what happens in A Bug's Life? The most predictable, tropey, a liar revealed plot ever. Joy. So we have this ant who's an inventor, but because of this he comes off as weird to the rest of his colony, and is generally unloved by everyone in it. And when the colony is threatened by a gang of grasshoppers led by the most evil villain of them all, Kevin Spacey. <coughs> Our mean ant guy decides to set out on a quest to retrieve some folks who can come and help them fend off the grasshoppers. So that's pretty decent. So the movie's gonna follow him in a solo road trip adventure trying to find some warriors and take them back home. Nope. Instead, he runs into a gang of circus bugs, but because of a wacky misunderstanding, he thinks they are warriors, and takes them back to his colony to save. Yes, this leads into an incredibly obvious lie-revealed plot, with the rest of the movie taking place inside the ant colony, where of course they end up getting along well with the ants, up until the moment where they're found out, and suddenly everyone hates them and our main character. Except the main ant didn't even know they were circus bugs until much later too, so it's like, why is he punished? I don't know, I guess this is why lie reveal plots annoy me so much. I've talked about it a bit with other films, but I guess it's important to actually explain why it's an annoying trope when done wrong. The only way to make a lie revealed plot work well is if we've seen the relationship build up enough to where that breach in trust impacts the viewer. You can understand a character feeling hurt that they've been lied to, and therefore care about the liar then trying to redeem themselves. But here it's not between two characters, it's between one gang of bugs and one colony of ants. Meaning you're not really attached to any one of them in particular? It also doesn't work because they reveal it so late in the film that the circus bugs have already proven to the ants that they're capable of taking the grasshoppers on. Like when they defeated the bird, and we see that they've spent ages putting together this big plan that seems foolproof. But then they're like, Well, you know, you've already proven to us that you're capable of saving us, but you're not the warriors we thought you were, so... Welp. Guess you gotta fuck off and stuff. It feels unrealistic, when the option is either try out the plan anyway because it's your only option, or DIE. Yeah, I'd assume they'd want to try it out. But honestly, I don't even give a shit if they live or die. They do that thing where to make the protagonist seem more sympathetic, they make the whole town act like cunts to him. But as a result of this, I no longer care about the ant colony because they're assholes. Then the queen has a dumb scene like, Ugh, Nobody believes in me, it's so hard being a queen. But so far we've seen the residents be nothing but nice to you, I don't give a shit, you're a cunt. The only character I really like here was the villain, and that's only because I find it interesting when we see that the reason he acts so intimidating to the ants is because he's actually afraid of them, because he knows as a collective they're more powerful than him. That's a really neat idea, a villain that's only trying to appear powerful out of fear of being overthrown, but they don't nearly expand it enough to become interesting. And finally, while the animation is a definite step up from Toy Story, I personally think the character designs are really shit for a majority of the characters. I like the villain and the fat German bugs design, but the rest of them? Nah, this ain't it, Chief. Like the Mian Ant. What does this design tell me about his character? Nothing. Zilch. Aside from the occasional funny moment. Oh, look at the beautiful colors of the blood. We drew one of you dying because our teacher said it would be more dramatic. <gasps> I really did not enjoy A Bug's Life. Its plot is just way too tired and overdone, and they do really nothing original with it. I'm gonna be putting it right under Cinderella, but above 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> Tarzan fucking rules, dude. This is another that I can safely say is amazing. I absolutely loved it. Tarzan starts with a mum, dad, and their baby getting lost at sea and stranded on an island. After his parents are mauled to death by a tiger, Jesus Christ, Tarzan is then raised by a gorilla, where we see him grow up and feel like he doesn't belong. Up until a small group of humans come gorilla watching, and he becomes fascinated by human life. This is a very sweet movie. I like Tarzan's mother a lot. No, not the one that's murdered. I mean, his monkey mother. The scene where the two of them are talking about how him being different was okay was really nice. I enjoyed it a lot. Makes me wish that these Disney parental figures weren't always missing or dead. And the characters of Jane and her father were also cool. It's a little bit of a stretch to have her general fascination with Tarzan turn into actually being romantically invested in him, because he can barely speak. 
but it develops well enough. It was never really an issue for me. It's kind of like they're doing a better version of the Hercules thing. You know, having your whole world shaken up one day after finding out you belong to a different species. Is God a species? Whatever, you get the point. But this one is done way better, because the time is properly spent showing Tarzan training and trying to get better. They don't just immediately cut and show him as an ultra cool action hero. The only real characters here I didn't like was the villain. He seemed a little too mustache twirly for me. Just has such a fucking vendetta against gorillas, it's a little weird. I was not expecting it to end with him being fucking hung by his neck though, like what the fuck, that was dark. And then there was the comic relief gorilla voiced by Rosie O'Donnell. She sure did a good job of getting on my nerves. I sure did love the scene of her and her monkey friends beatboxing. That was definitely necessary. The animation here is phenomenal. Besides the obvious stuff like great facial expressions and movements, the parallaxing in this film is insane. Disney adopted this animation technique here called Deep Canvas. Now I'm no expert on animation lingo, so all I'll say is that it makes the movie look all cool in 3D at times. Despite being entirely 2D, shit's impressive as fuck. I do really like the grinding scenes through the jungle. Apparently they were influenced by a lot of Tony Hawk for this and it shows. This stuff was super entertaining to watch visually. The jungle here overall looks sweet. It's such a step up from Jungle Book. The colors are great, especially in the waterfall scene. And I really don't know what to say other than it looks great. I also like the Phil Collins songs. That's all. I don't have a ton to say about Tarzan, honestly. It's just a really, really good movie that you should check out. I loved this one a ton. With my favorite aspect being the relationship between Tarzan and the people around him, especially his mother and Jean. The payoff for the Han thing was just fucking epic. Tarzan right now is going above the Hunchback of Notre Dame, but under Aladdin. Toy Story 2 was always my favorite as a kid. I remember my family bought a DVD 2 pack of the first two films, and I would only ever want to watch the second. I fucking adored this movie. And I'm really happy to say that this is one that I've actually grown to appreciate more on this rewatch. First of all, the animation in this one is such a step up in quality. It's crazy, the humans actually look like humans. Andy no longer looks like a creepy space creature, and his sister is no longer a little baby alien. It's wild. But on top of them, the movements look a whole lot better. Like, I love Bullseye's run, it's really wacky. We see a larger variety of sets, it, it's good stuff all around. Now, what I really love about this movie, and can appreciate way more than when I was a kid, is that Toy Story 2 is a really, really good sequel. And that's important. There's a big difference in being a good movie and being a good sequel. A good movie is just a good movie, there's no need to elaborate on that. But a good sequel is one that can build upon a theme from the first movie, showing that through the characters' new mindsets, or meeting new characters that challenge that. For example, this movie is all about building upon the themes of toys not lasting forever, and the idea that Andy's gonna one day grow up and not really care about Woody anymore. So wouldn't he rather go and be put in a museum where he can be loved from thousands of different kids every day? Like, there's no set right or wrong answer here. Woody can see the pros and cons of both, and manages to have his mind changed a couple times. Like, you can see him actually try to process what to do, but ultimately realizes that as a toy, it's his duty to be there for Andy when he needs him most. Really sells the idea of Woody being loyal. It's great seeing the character he's become after going through his downward spiral from the first film. I also love how much more Buzz and Woody's backstories are expanded upon. You know, we see that Woody just wasn't some random cowboy toy. He was the star of this giant merchandising chain, and was super famous at one point. It's shit like this that makes this universe feel lived in, like it has history that these characters exist outside of Andy's room. Going back to the whole multiple Buzz thing was neat too. Again, it's cool to get to compare what is basically Buzz Lightyear from the beginning of the first movie with current Buzz. We see just how far he's come. And dude, the callback to the introduction of Buzz was so clever. This film includes a lot of references to the first movie, but this was definitely my favorite. Also, big shoutouts to the reveal near the end where You've Got a Friend in Me was actually a song sung by Woody on his TV show. I completely forgot about that detail. I'm so happy when I saw it because it's such a simple callback, but it brings everything full circle. I love it. And while the focus wasn't on them nearly as much, I do think the changes made to the secondary toy characters were for the better. I didn't go into it much during the first movie's review, but dude, these guys were such fucking cunts constantly. Especially Mr. Potato Head, I hated him as a kid. Y you know what, scratch that, I hate him now, the prick. I'm just glad they toned it back for this one. Hell, they even included a line joking about it. No! And did he give up when you threw him out of the back of that moving van? Oh, you had to bring that up. I also really love the brand new characters they've introduced. You know, Jesse and Bullseye. More so Jesse, like obviously Bullseye doesn't do much, he's just horse. But her backstory is really well done. 
makes it completely understandable why she'd have abandonment issues, and also gives Woody more of a reason to want to stay with him, out of fear of letting her down. This is all on top of being a really funny movie, like Zerg's brief appearance. Has no relevance on the plot whatsoever, but it doesn't need to as long as it's funny. I just can't get over how much of a perfect sequel this is, I can't name a single flaw. Well, okay, other than the scene where the prospector sits the remote in front of Jesse, like she has her eyes open, she would have seen that easily. But who cares, that's just a dumb nitpick, the villain is still great. Again, because he's not a straight up one no villain, he's just a guy who feels like he's been fucked over by the world and wants a happy life. A again, it's that moral dilemma thing, I love it. Toy Story 2 is phenomenal. Pixar are really starting to hit their stride here after that slight stumble with A Bug's Life. I'm putting Toy Story 2 above Tarzan but under Aladdin. Shit's starting to really get good. I spoke too soon. Yeah, so apparently the first Fantasia film was such a big hit that Disney wanted to make it a tradition, so they made Fantasia 2000. What was it with the 2000s constantly wanting to remind you that it was indeed the 2000s? Anyways, Fantasia 2000 sucks in my opinion. I don't even want to waste my time in writing about it, so you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna read you the notes I took while watching it. It's about the same experience you'll get from me trying to elaborate upon them. Oh, for fuck's sake. I like the visuals of the opening. What the fuck, cheaper by the dozen guy? Mm, decent CG. The UPL one had a nice art style. They just replay the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Boring. Don't care, I'm sorry. And really, that's all you need. I'm sorry, I'm sure there are people who really love these and think they're absolute eye candy. I wish I could have the same experience with them, I really do. But I just can't get invested. Sometimes I struggle to turn my mind off and just watch the pretty visuals. My bad. Apparently this movie was a huge flop financially. They put a budget of 80 million into this, and it only managed to make back a total of 90 million. They probably lost so much money here. Only good thing about that is that it means I think this tradition is over at the second attempt. This just didn't seem like the kind of thing that would catch on or be as appealing in our modern times. Or, well, the 2000 times, or fuck off, you get what I'm saying. Fantasia 2000 is gonna go right above the first Fantasia, for one reason and one reason only. It's shorter. I have never heard of this movie before. Dinosaur. Really tells you everything you need to know. This movie is about dinosaurs. That's honestly it. I'm not surprised that they only decided to call it simply Dinosaur, because I too would have struggled to come up with a title for this film that is quite literally just dinosaurs walking for an hour and a half. Okay, so Dinosaur is about this dinosaur guy who is, uh, okay, sorry folks, gotta cheat for a little bit here. This is the story of Aladar, D.B. Sweeney, an Iguandan dinosaur raised by a family of lemurs. Their world is turned upside down, however, when meteors strike, turning their green world into a desert wasteland. Teaming up with a herd of other herbivores, the trek is on to find the nesting ground, where water and vegetation is bountiful. But with carnivores behind them and nothing but desert around for miles, it doesn't look promising. Okay, I understood a majority of those words. I do not care for dinosaur movies. You may think dinos are cool, but I've always hated them. I'm glad they're dead. They suck. Dinosaur is completely reliant on its visuals. Disney really wanted to boast their fancy new capabilities with the mysterious world of CGI, and use dinosaur to show the world just how realistic it could look. Yeah, the reason why it's taken up until recently for studios to create CGI movies that feel like they can rival the design and creativity of 2D films was because every studio out there felt like the only way to make CG look good was to make it realistic. There's just one issue with that. This movie was made in the year 2000. This thing is a glorified tech demo, and it looks shit by today's standards. I was gonna say it looks shit, period, but after reading up on some reviews of the film from the time, I was surprised to see that this blew people away. I mean, I guess I can't judge. For the time, I'm sure this looked breathtaking. But looking realistic for the time ages your movie by a ton. And also doesn't equate to having good designs or environments. This film is so fucking visually boring, because it just wants to be real life, which completely defeats the point of it being animated. I constantly find myself losing track of our main character because they all just blend together. Why is that? Because he's just a fucking dinosaur. The most impressive thing about the visuals that still feel like they hold up are the backgrounds. Like fuck, these look really realistic. Oh wait, that's because they fucking are realistic! They just use live action footage for all the backgrounds! This is the Lion King remake all over again. I mean, the Lion King remake was dinosaur all over it, fuck off. And the live action only makes it worse, because we're looking at these nice realistic shots on these locations, and then they fucking plop a shitty looking dino on it. They're not even attempting to tell any kind of plot here. Why was the main dinosaur raised by lemurs? 
At first, I thought they were going for a Tarzan thing, like he believes he's the only one of his kind who doesn't fit in well. But no, we're quickly introduced to the other dinos, all of whom I have already forgotten about. Don't worry though, Disney, I can answer that question for you. See, every single aspect of this movie was cleverly added in order to show off a different aspect of the CGI. Why are they dinos? Because they can show off their cool scale textures. Why do they want water? So they can show off that impressive liquid physics. Why are there lemurs if they contribute nothing to the plot? Gotta show off the first somehow. You can show off your cool animation all you want, Disney, but next time I'd actually like you to build a proper plot and interest in characters around it, because I think this may be one of the most pearly aged films ever made. Dinosaur is getting put at the bottom of the list. It is abysmal. For as much as I hated Rescuers Down Under and Pocahontas, they did indeed have a story. This all raises the question, if I watch a movie but can't recall a single thing about it, then did I ever really watch it? Next. Emperor's New Groove was one of the Disney movies that had the most troubled development cycles. It was originally going to be called Kingdom of the Sun, and was going to be something much more akin to the Prince and Pauper, with the Llama Herder and Prince switching places for the day. But after many, many retoolings, it became what we now know as the Emperor's New Groove. It stars Cusco, the egotistical leader of some village. He acts like an asshole to all of his subjects, and ends up letting one of them know that he plans on destroying the entire town to make room for his new pool. This is until he's transformed into a llama by one of his disgruntled workers. And now he must figure a way to turn back to normal, learning to be a better person along the way. They do a good job at establishing his character. The entire first half of the movie is basically selling you on the idea that he's a cunt. Makes it all the funnier when bad stuff keeps happening to him, and in turn makes it all the more satisfying whenever we see him start to appreciate the people around him more, and becomes more humble. I like his friend Pacha too, it might also be Pacha, please let me know a million times if I got that wrong. But he's a really nice contrast to Cusco, just your average family man. John Goodman also gives a great performance as him. I love him in anything he's in, he's such a cool voice. Kronk was also a highlight of the movie, he really stole the show for what's basically just another villain's incompetent henchman. You don't care that he's so dumb because the way they work off each other is just too amazing for you to even question it. The mean villain lady on her own could have been boring, but with Kronk next to her they both become infinitely more entertaining. And it's all in the performance. This role was made for Patrick Warburton. Literally. I think this set in stone the type of character he'd be cast as for the rest of his life. It's such an iconic role of his. The movie has an incredibly simple plot, but the characters make it so much fun to sit through. You know what's also weird to consider? This is kind of the first Disney movie that's solely trying to be a comedy. Like yeah, this movie doesn't give a shit about anything other than just making you laugh. This is also one of their first movies that leans into the more meta humor. It's probably the most extreme example of it. With Cusco narrating the whole film, then the regular him just interacts with the narrator version too casually, and there are times when he will just pause the movie so he can come on screen to explain stuff. I can appreciate the humor a lot here. It feels like a 2000s Disney TV show actually, with how fast-paced the comedy is. It's constantly hitting you with joke after joke, and it really works out in its favor. My only real nitpick with this is that you can't have a movie be turned to 11 at all times. You gotta slow things down at times, to remind the audience why we're to care about this character, and that they're not just a 24-7 joke machine. And I can feel the writers understanding this and wanting to push for that. They try to insert scenes that are more slower paced, or where the characters just sit there in silence and reflect on stuff, but someone working at Disney must have thought this would lose the kids' attention, so they interrupt what are supposed to be sad scenes with jokes. Excuse me, two seconds here, um, I'm the one in the car, remember? This story's about me, not him. It's not a huge deal. Again, the movie's only really trying to be funny, so it doesn't bring a down or anything. It's just that I think it shows a certain lack of confidence in the executives, in believing that people will be invested in their story enough to not be bored during moments like this. What greatly complements the humor, though, is the animation style. The character expressions are very exaggerated, the timing here is excellent, along with very quick movements that really sells the comedy. I can definitely appreciate them trying to do something different here. My only real nitpick with the art, however, is that there is way too much green here. Way too many scenes feel like the characters are just going through fields, a bit of variety would have been nice. I don't know why this film failed as much as it did, it was a huge box office bomb. But it is nice to see it cultivate more of a cult following as time has gone on, because I really enjoyed The Emperor's New Groove a ton. What it lacks for in stories and heartfelt moments, it more than makes up for with the amazing comedy and characters. And for those reasons, I'm going to be putting The Emperor's New Groove pretty high on my list, right above The Little Mermaid, but below Fox and the Hound. I didn't even know this one was a thing either. Wow, a lot of ones from this era that have completely went over my head. I mean, I guess I can't blame myself. With a title as generic as Atlantis The Lost Empire, what is there really to remember about it? 
Anytime I heard about this movie, I always got it confused with Help, I'm a Fish. Anyone remember Help, I'm a Fish? I fucking loved that as a kid. Atlantis is one of Disney's biggest flops ever. On a budget of 120 million, it only made around 180 million. These movies are getting more and more expensive to make, and their turn is just getting worse and worse. Guess I can't be surprised they eventually just switched to CG. Atlantis is about this nerdy guy who everyone thinks is a nut for being so obsessed with the lost city of Atlantis. But one day is greeted by this old man who knew of his grandfather. And so they and a bunch of guys they hired are gonna go to the lost city using a map they now have. And steal it's like, possessions or something, they want money. This is until they get there and realize that the thing they're trying to steal is what's keeping the residents of the city alive. And fucking conflict arises. I'll get into him more later. Our main character is a bore. I didn't care about him or his dumb grandfather in the slightest. You just can't throw in a parental figure death and suddenly expect me to care about what's going on. No, not even if he's voiced by Michael J. Fox. Dude, imagine being him. Imagine being told, you're gonna be the star in a Disney movie. Think about how cool that must have been, how excited he must have been. Hey kids, your dad's gonna be the main character of a Disney cartoon. Then they all go to the premiere and watch this snooze fest. They probably fucking bullied him. The real stars of this movie, the side characters. The people that are hired to help them go to Atlantis. I didn't care about any of them to begin with. They all seemed fairly simple in one note. But there was a really nice scene later on in the movie where they all sit around and tell each other their backstories and what they plan on doing with their take of the profit. You know, it makes them a little deeper, makes them feel like real people. What didn't make them feel like real people was their double cross on Milo. Milo, Milo is our main character, by the way, I didn't mention it. Yeah, so they'd apparently planned this whole double-cross thing to take the prized possession from Atlantis and take the money for themselves, but it just ruins all the development they had. If it were something that just happened on the spot, then that would have been fine, but it comes off as if it were premeditated. And then, to make it worse, they all become good again after Milo makes one little fucking speech. Pick a fucking side and stick to it. I don't know, it sucks because I was kind of liking where this one was going, but shit like that completely ruins it now, because I now like none of these guys anymore. The animation here also sucks. The designs are fine, but they shove in so much dated CG, like in the opening shot. And the movements they do don't feel like they fit the style of writing they're going for. Oh, really? I, uh, so, where you from? I love really? I have family up that way. Beautiful country up there. You do any fishing? Oh. Ah. Like, the way that was animated didn't fit that type of joke at all. It wasn't really anywhere near as fast as it should have been. There's not much to say, really. Atlantis was just a bore for me, personally. I've heard this one, too, has had a bit of a resurgence in popularity in recent times. I can only imagine that's due to kids who watched it when they were younger and I old enough to voice their thoughts on it. But as someone who's only watched it for the first time today, I think it sucked. Atlantis The Lost Empire is going right below Pocahontas, but above Dinosaur. Disney sure is on a losing streak. <laughs> Monsters Inc. fucking rules. This may just be my favorite Pixar movie of all time. Hell, one of my favorite movies of all time, period. As a kid, I watched it constantly, even at the PS2 game Scar Island. Look at this box, it's cardboard for some reason. I got it second hand, so I've always wondered what the bonus content missing was. Anyways, Monsters Inc. focuses on James P. Sullivan and Mike Wazowski. They work at Monsters Incorporated, which is the company that provides power to the city of Monstropolis, through going through doors into kids' bedrooms at night and scurrying them, with children's screams being their power source. This is until a little girl accidentally makes her way through the portal into the monster world, and Mike and Sully need to get her back home. My favorite thing about Monsters Inc. has to be the characters, Mike and Sully especially. They do a perfect job at making you believe like these guys are lifelong friends. The way they talk and bounce off each other is so entertaining with the constant playful jabs at one another. This could come off as mean-spirited if done too much, but they know exactly when to reel it in, and show you that at the end of the day they're good friends and would do anything for each other. Like when Sully offers to do something as simple as submitting Mike's report for him, or a more extreme example being Mike coming through for Sully in the end by returning to Monstropolis after being exiled. I'm a little upset that the new series coming out on Disney Plus doesn't just solely focus on these two, because a more laid back show of them just doing whatever could have been really entertaining in my opinion. But I get it, Billy Crystal and John Goodman can't be cheap. Boo is also a great character. In context of the film, she's more of a plot device up until the ending. Like, she doesn't really talk and her personality doesn't go much beyond little girl. But she's a good plot device. You know, it's a really interesting dilemma, giving Mike and Sully the choice to whether or not they even want to help her. But Sully has a good heart, so he wants to get her back home. Their relationship was so sweet. They build up from him being scared and gross out by her, to then caring deeply about her and being more of a parental figure so nice to see unfold. And dude, that ending, do I even need to mention the ending? Not the last shot, I mean the scene where Sully is saying goodbye to Boo. I think what I like about it so much is that a generic movie would treat this as some sort of red herring. Like they have this really sweet and heartwarming scene of him saying goodbye, but oh no, there's a villain right there, we gotta fight some more! But no, he just says goodbye knowing he'll never see her again. But then they fucking hit you with that part at the very end. 
Usually in a movie where one character needs to give up a friend, and they literally hit you with, Oh no, here they are, you can actually see them again. It, it feels cheap, like the film didn't actually want you to get upset about them separating, but here it works in its favor completely. Not only does it symbolize the lengths Mike is willing to go through for his friend, by finding the pieces to the door and putting it back together, but they imply a lot of time has passed, so when he finally gets to see Boo again, it ends with this. Boo? Oh my fucking heart, it gets me every time. And also, I think this is one of the only Disney or Pixar movies to actually have their twist film feel like a natural thing that we could see happening. It doesn't come from nowhere, because they already established that they're having trouble making the power necessary to stay afloat. So him taking this measure makes complete sense for his character to do. They explain it perfectly. I'll kidnap a thousand children before I let this company die! Okay, okay, last thing I want to mention. The soundtrack for this movie is godly. I adore it. Not only does it start with this funky jazz piece... <laughs> That then comes back at the end with Mike and Sully singing lyrics to it, that's just so fucking good. But the score is also incredible, especially the song that plays at the end with Mike and Sully at the door, I love it so much. Monsters Inc. is incredible. It's just a movie that hits on all fronts. The characters, the plot, the animation, the score, it misses nothing. Monsters Inc. is number one, it's perfect. I really would be surprised if another film passes it, but there are a ton later on that I have yet to see, so who knows. And with that, let's move on to... Lilo and Stitch was another one of my favourites as a kid. I was born in 2002, which is right when these movies were coming out, so this was around the era of Disney and Pixar that I grew up in. And after revisiting Lilo and Stitch, this shit hits a lot harder than I remember it. You know when you're a kid and you like a movie a lot, but tons of stuff going on and it doesn't make sense to you and you don't know why? Yeah, this movie was filled with that stuff for me. Why does Lilo randomly bite this girl? Who is this man in black guy and why is he taking her away? If Nani is Lilo's sister, then where are her parents? Why do we never see them? The last one was just me being fucking stupid that clearly said they die in a car crash. Despite being about aliens, Lilo and Stitch has a very grounded story. Nani is thrust into the role of parental figure after her mum and dad die, and now needs to take care of her sister Lilo, who is having a hard time relating to and fitting in with the kids around her. Doesn't just stop there. The main antagonist here is a social worker, who just for some reason dresses like a men in black guy, who will take Lilo away if Nani proves herself unfit to look after her. You know, then aliens and stuff, you know how it is. Lilo gets a new, well what she thinks is a dog, but in reality is an alien created by a mad scientist who she calls Stitch. And despite not being capable of showing affection for others, he must learn how to, or else he'll be captured by the scientist and taken back to the space prison. Somehow these two completely unrelated plots mesh perfectly together. What makes everything feel cohesive is that sense of Ohana, and Ohana means family. Be prepared to be reminded of that 50 times throughout the film. That's not a bad thing, it's sweet. I love that aspect a lot. The scene with Stitch trying to imitate the ugly duckling by going out and looking for his family, taking the book literally, and believing that he actually has a family that will come for him if he just does it, that's, it's so sad. But it makes it all the sweeter when he eventually finds his family with Lilo and Nanny. There are a lot of quiet, slower paced scenes in this film that adds to Stitch's character, he's the best thing about it. Also, his design is just fucking perfect, it is one of Disney's best characters. He has universal appeal. Girls think he's cute and boys think he's cool, perfect. This film isn't all depressing, however. It's fun when it needs to be. Like the scene of Lilo trying to make him a stand-up gentleman so she goes around trying to turn him into Elvis, I loved that part. I don't have much to say about Lilo and Stitch, honestly. It's just a really, really good movie that I love a lot, and I would recommend you watch for yourself. It was a lot more depressing than I remember it being, but you grow very attached to all the characters and want to see them achieve their goals in the end. If you've never seen Lilo and Stitch before, then go watch it. I want to leave details to a minimum here, because I'd rather not spoil much of the movie for you. Check it out. I'm putting Lilo and Stitch under Aladdin, but above Toy Story 2. I very much enjoyed it. Excellent. Enter your game. That's movie number 40. Glad to see we're picking up in quality again after Pixar started sealing the show from Disney for a while. Sadly, however, we're heading into Disney's transition from 2D animation to 3D. Why did they switch? Was it purely for money? Or were the movies they were releasing just that terrible that audiences were sick of them? For my sake, let's hope it's for the money. I was not looking forward to Treasure Planet at all. It looked so fucking boring. A dumb little space pirate movie about this twerp. Meh. This was the start of Disney's proper losing streak. Bomb after bomb after bomb. This was one of their biggest disasters. On a budget of $140 million, it only managed to rake in around $110 million. Yikes. 
And that sucks, because apparently the directors of this film really wanted to make it, like this was their passion project. Hell, the only reason they made Hercules was so that Disney would allow them to make Treasure Planet. So what was so important about this one in particular? What story did they just need to tell? Well, this is an adaptation of Treasure Island, obviously. Except this time there's an entire planet that they've gotta look for. So this guy called Dr. Doppler and this delinquent kid Jim Hawkins hire a crew and a ship to go with them to the planet. But this guy has warned Jim to beware the cyborg, who turns out to be a member of the ship's crew. Could he be the cyborg Jim was warned about? Yes. I'm glad they waste no time on establishing John Silver as the villain. They could have easily pulled that twist villain shit. And while it takes a while for Jim to find out who he really is, the audience is in the know from the scene he's introduced. Because of this, they're fully able to devote time to developing him as a character. And is that great because John Silver may be one of the most underrated villains of all time. He's just a guy who wants money. He isn't possessed by greed, he doesn't twirl his non-existent mustache at the thought of killing Jim. He has feelings, he acts like a real person. Over the course of working together, he finds himself caring for Jim, and they end up having this sort of father-son relationship. Their characters are the best thing about it. It's obvious that Jim has father issues, but instead of him tragically dying or some shit, no, he just walked out one day and never returned. And that makes it all the more heartbreaking when he finds out that Silver was working against him. I really enjoyed the part of the film where the two of them were stranded on a planet at opposite ends of the field. The protagonist is able to look out the door and look, there's the villain, right there. They're able to openly talk and interact whenever they want, that's really cool. And it's made clear that Silver still cares about him, but is just putting his greed above others. It's a really cool dynamic to see unfold. I wasn't that big a fan of the other characters, sadly. Like, did we really need two comic reliefs? Like, the little shape-shifting cloud can accept, like, whatever, he's just a sidekick. But did we really need a loud, obnoxious robot who chews the scenery of any scene he's in? I've seen people say, well, he's only introduced an hour into the movie, so it doesn't take up a lot of time. But that's not a plus. Why introduce a character so late in your movie? He literally wasn't necessary at all. Whether or not he revealed the booby trap wouldn't have mattered as they triggered it anyways. The animation here is gorgeous too. It's a shame this is one of their last 2D animated films, because I'd argue it's the last great one in terms of visuals. Sorry to bring him up again, but Doug Walker bitches for like 3 minutes in his video on this, about how it doesn't make any sense that the pirate ships are in space, but I find it a really appealing art style. I forgot the word for it. I, I know it's not steampunk, but it's the closest thing I have to call it. Either way, I like it a lot, it's so cool and mechanical. Silver's CGI arm is so badass and has aged so well, I can barely even tell it was 3D for a majority of the film. Does Treasure Planet deserve the cult classic status it has these days? Well, unlike Atlantis, I'd say, yes, definitely. It does have some flaws. I think they sat on this film for so long that it caused them to have too many ideas. The pacing is very fast at times, like they're trying to shove in as much as possible. And outside of the main two characters, I didn't find myself really caring about any of them. But their dynamic holds the entire film in its shoulders. Again, if I like your characters, I'm willing to put up with a lot of shit. And this is one of the best relationships ever in a Disney movie, in my opinion. Treasure Planet is a very good movie. It's not great. Again, the storytelling can be a bit sloppy at times. But I'm really glad that I've managed to finally check it out. I wouldn't mind watching this one again someday. Treasure Planet is going right under Sleeping Beauty, but above Hercules. Finding Nemo Another Pixar film I actually haven't seen before in full. I've seen bits of it here and there, catching it on the TV. But I don't know, nothing ever really compelled me to want to watch the full thing myself. So after sitting through it now, was it worth no longer sleeping on it? Yeah, I'd say so. It was nothing incredible, like... The Incredibles. Oh wait, they, I haven't reviewed The Incredibles yet. Finding Nemo follows Marlin. After his wife is... Eaten alive and killed along with all but one of his kids, he is now extremely overprotective of his only son, Nemo. This causes Nemo to seek more freedom, which eventually backfires when he gets taken away by a fishing boat, meaning Marlin and his new friend Dory must go rescue him. And find Nemo, if you will. This is more of a road trip movie than anything, meaning the plot doesn't really take place in any central locations. Each scene shows our main cast traveling to a new part of the ocean, meeting different wacky characters along the way, slowly getting closer and closer to their destination. Overall, I think that approach works well. The ocean is such a huge and vast setting, so being stuck in just three or four locations would have felt very limiting. But because of how many different sets there are, it really adds to that effect of Marlin and Dory traveling across the entire ocean to get him. And speaking of, I really enjoyed the dynamic between those two, it's handled very well. Dory isn't just a burden, she has short term memory loss, but she isn't dumb. So she does help out a lot throughout the adventure, and she never gets on your nerves too much. Even if she is voiced by Ellen DeGeneres- GET HER FACE OFF THE SCREEN! Get it off.
And Marlin is probably the best thing about it. They make it clear just how deeply he cares and loves his son, and that he was only overprotective because he wanted to keep him safe. The scene of him talking with the turtle guy was very well done. His arc is handled super good. I like a majority of the side characters in the film. Considering most of them only appear in one scene, it's definitely a good sign that I can remember a good handful. I liked the aforementioned turtles, the big group of fish who plush reads with them, and especially the shark who's in this group of other sharks who are trying to rehabilitate themselves on eating fish. Yeah, I was not expecting him to be presented like this in the film. The posters all made me think that this was the main villain of the movie, but no, he's just in like two scenes. But eh, I remember him. And I do appreciate that the film felt the need to have a B-plot, showing us what Nemo was doing during their search, with him being stuck in a fish tank at the dentist's office. I like how much of a looming threat the little girl is presented as. Did you know she is listed on the official Disney villains wiki? I mean, she definitely has the creepiest design of them all. The skeleton guy from Black Cauldron has nothing on Darla. But these Nemo parts are very good. It further goes to show that just because he was going too far, doesn't mean that Marlin was necessarily a bad guy for doing what he did. And Nemo learns to be appreciative of how much his father cares for him. The whole movie really thrives on that father-son bond. I don't think I'd give a shit about this one if I didn't like the relationship at all. And finally, the animation is pretty good for the most part. I can't say I'm the biggest fan of a lot of the faces on the fish. Like, some of them look a little too humanoid and I don't like that I can see their face wrinkles and stuff. But when thinking about how it could have been done better instead, I realized this was probably the best option that could have went with so well. Like I talked about with The Little Mermaid, for an underwater setting they do a good job at making each set look varied and unique. The colors complement the mood perfectly, being dark and dreary when it needs to be, but colorful and sweet when the scene calls for it. The lighting is also very impressive, I really like the scene of them with all the jellyfish, it looked very nice. I enjoyed Finding Nemo a lot more than I thought I would. I didn't absolutely adore it or anything, but for what it is I think it's a pretty solid road trip movie, with lots of likeable characters and a good message. It's going right under The Little Mermaid, but above Mulan. Dude, Brother Bear was the fucking shit when I was a kid. I had it on DVD and fucking adored this movie. I watched it all the damn time. I adored it. You have no idea how upset I was to start watching reviews on the internet, only to find out that people hate this movie. I was heartbroken. Brother Bear is stellar. What are they talking about? Then I decided to do something that shook my world forever. I watched the film for the first time in about 15 years. I completely forgot about... Oh, I don't know... 80% of this movie. All I remembered was silly burr antics, while somehow tuning out the other hour and a half of complete shit. I don't even count this one anymore as one that I've seen because I barely recognized anything that was going on. I like, Mandela affected myself into thinking this was a completely different movie. So Brother Bear is about this guy that I can't remember the name of. In the place where he lives, everyone is given this little totem at a certain age, with the animal on it symbolizing the sort of person you are. And if you show those qualities, you gotta put your handprint on a wall, which is like a big deal. He ends up getting a burr, which symbolizes love, and that makes him all pissy because he's a manly man and he can't be going around loving shit. So he gets all mad and tries to kill a burr who stole his fish. Then he gets his shit kicked in and his brother ends up dying as a result of him provoking a fucking bear. And you know what he does next? He goes out to kill the same fucking bear again, this time actually doing it, and because magic or whatever, he's now turned into a bear, where he's now befriended by the son of the mother bear he just murdered. How sweet. The main character is such an irredeemable asshole, I do not like him at all. He has no reason to be such a dickhead to the cub when the cub is literally taking him to the place that transforms him back into a human. The relationship is awful, it does not develop nearly enough for me to actually start to believe that they're becoming lifelong friends or have a brotherly bond. It's just one guy being a cunt and the other acting oblivious to it. There's only one part of the film that almost works. Almost. And that's the scene where he actually explains to Koda that he was the guy who killed his mother. I appreciate that they didn't go for some liar revealed shit. As soon as he finds out he killed her, he sits him down and tells him. And this part is quite sad. The part where Koda starts slowly stepping away from him trying to deny what happened, like that's awful. But there's one thing that completely destroys any emotion the scene could have had. Turn your fucking radio off, I do not want to listen to Phil Collins singing over this. We don't actually hear him saying the words to Koda. It's all done silently with the music playing over the scene. And I understand why they do that. One, because they wanted the visuals to sell the scene. They don't want anything taking away from that, and wanted to solely focus on Coda's reaction. And two, Disney probably didn't want the words, I murdered your mother, in their family film. But the song they chose just ruins the moment, and that sucks because the rest of the soundtrack for this movie is actually pretty good. 
Honestly, the only reason I think I enjoyed this movie so much as a kid was solely because of the On My Way song. It's definitely the best song with On My Way in the title, right above Send Me On My Way From My Siege, and I'm On My Way From The Proclaimers. But that does not save the movie at all. A good soundtrack means nothing if the film has shitty unlikable characters, an incredibly slow pace, and overall it's just a really boring film. It's too bad. Again, I really loved this one as a kid, but eh, I guess it's just a part of growing up. Brother Bear is going right under Oliver and Company, but above the Black Cauldron. I cannot believe how shit these Disney films are getting. Let's hope they at least went out in a bang with their last 2D animated movie before the switch to CGI. What the fuck, this is how they went out? Really? Home on the Range. Bust a moo. Got milk? This movie is utterly shit. Home on the Range is about this cow called Maggie who was sold to this old lady's farm. But oh no, the lady only has three days to pay off her bank loan of $750, or else her farm is getting closed forever. And so Maggie, Grace, and Mrs. Calloway set out in town in search of a way to make money. Then they become bounty hunters. Yep. That's the whole movie. They're trying to catch this criminal guy whose bounty just so happens to be $750, what are the odds? They try to make it more intense by adding all these twists and turns and other people trying to get the same guy such as this ultra cool bounty hunter guy, and a talking horse who wants to prove to the cool bounty hunter that he is also cool, but none of it is interesting. First of all, they barely introduced any of these characters before setting out in their adventure. I don't know why Maggie needed to be the new cow on the farm, because it barely comes into play at all. One of the cows doesn't like her very much, but her being new wasn't necessary for that. All it means is that you struggle to feel any connections for the relationship, because they met each other for like 5 minutes before needing to set out in their adventure. And it barely even feels like an adventure. It's trying to be like a road trip movie, but in that case they should have taken some cues from Finding Nemo because nothing interesting happens. They almost drown randomly, but that's about it. They barely meet anyone in their travels, which makes the world feel so empty and bare. This is until the very end of the movie, where they meet this rabbit guy who suddenly becomes the main character. Yeah, we certainly needed a comic relief character among these three cunts. Well, okay, the yellow one was alright. She was nice. These two bitches, though, were so unlikable, especially the main cow. This also has to be one of the worst villains in a Disney film ever. We have this guy whose plan it is to steal all the cows on the farm so that they go out of business. Then when it's auctioned off, he comes in and purchases it, and he plans on doing that for every single farm in the country. It's not even the stupidest part. The way he steals the cows is that he hypnotizes them through... yodeling. I think the writers thought that joke was a lot funnier than it actually was. And speaking of the humor in this movie, it is terrible. It's so forced and clearly trying to be hip with the kids. I was expecting a lot more Liam Kai puns than they actually did, but they did give us this to compensate. As a treat. Say, girls. God milk. Fuck! Just kidding. What was even the joke there? Like, the, the animation... Like, what the fuck? The animation isn't even good. The designs are terrible. I really like to overemphasize how fat the cars are, which can be a bit creepy at times. And I don't know, there's just nothing all that special about it. They don't really go all out with the western theme, and it sucks because I feel like if it had come out 10 or 20 years prior, it would have looked really good. Home on the Range is genuinely terrible, there is nothing good about it. I'm not surprised this one caused Disney to switch to CGI, only making 145 million on a 110 million budget. Home on the Range is going very low on my list, unsurprisingly. I'll be putting it above Dinosaur, but under Atlantis Lost Empire. I'll give it to Atlantis. I could at least see a good movie trapped behind all this shit. But the idea for Home in the Range was just terrible from the start. But the thing is, 3D animation can't excuse a shitty script. So unless they up their game with the writing, we're gonna continue seeing Pixar upstage them. Oh yeah, by the way, what was Pixar doing around this time? Oh, I don't know, just making one of their best fucking movies of all time? Dude, Disney must have been shitting bricks around this time. They were consistently getting upstaged by these guys. The Incredibles is one of Pixar's most iconic franchises, and for good reason. It's amazing. It stars the Parr family, made up of husband and wife Bob and Helen, and their three kids, Dash, Violet, and Jack-Jack. They have superpowers. After superheroes have been made illegal and forced to live their regular lives, and after 15 years of the same old office job, Bob starts to have a midlife crisis, and heads out in a secret mission to relive the glory days. I think what I enjoy most about The Incredibles is that it isn't just a superhero parody only setting out to be a big action movie. What really holds the film together is the relatable family issues. If I'm being quite honest, I could care less about the superhero aspect or action stuff. The main thing I get out of this movie is the characters and their interactions with one another. 
Bob and Helen's marriage seems incredibly realistic. Yeah, see what I did there? They fight and argue, but at the end of the day, you know they still love each other, and that they can both understand where the other one is coming from. The whole family dynamic is great, and they have plenty of scenes that perfectly show that off, like the dinner scene, the part after Bob comes home from the burning building. This is a film that completely warrants the two-hour runtime. Another amazing aspect of the movie is the villain. Again, they pull the whole twist villain thing, which can be an annoying plot device, but it's done amazingly here, because they give you one scene that lets you know early on who they were before they're a villain, a scene of them being all mysterious where you don't quite know who they are, and then bang, in the next scene you see who it is and you get the payoff. It's amazing. What's even more amazing amazing is that he's voiced by Jason Lee, the incredible actor of Dave from Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> it means we still get the impact of the surprise reveal, but it also means that we've got like an hour and a half to see this guy interact with our main character, and not be shrouded in mystery. Syndrome is just a great character in general. His plan makes complete sense. Mr. Incredible denied him of being a sidekick, so he's gonna create a giant robot that will kill all of the other supers, while at the same time learning their powers, so he can then jump in and save the day, and be renowned as a hero. Then when he gets older, he'll make everyone a super. Because when everyone's a super, no one will be. Fuck, that's such a good line. This film has so many moments like that, you know, just random things that you quote to yourself from time to time. There's... A company... Is like an enormous clock. Is like an enormous cl Yes, precisely. The where is my super suit moment, and of course there's my personal favorite. But what are you waiting for? Me too, kid. The animation in this film is also amazing. I love that they went for a more stylized look despite still being one of Pixar's earlier films. The more angular designs from the characters are great, especially Bob's design, it's really good. Some aspects have sadly aged though, such as the regular non-stylized humans. The angular ones definitely look better than the more rounded ones. Like, the first shot of Violet being introduced looks very rough. The animation here hasn't aged perfectly, but for the time it was super impressive, such as the locations. Like, the island set and the water looks amazing for when this was released. Probably not that unique of an opinion, but I love The Incredibles, it is an astonishing film. Really grounded and realistic characters, and one of the best villains of an animated film, The Incredibles is one of the best movies I've seen yet in this marathon. For now, it's going just under Monsters, Inc. They're both very good films, and they're very close to me in terms of quality, but I think the relationship between Sully and Boo puts it slightly higher for me personally. But oh, look out, Pixar! Disney is about to take their step in a proper CGI family film, ignoring Dinosaur. Let's see if they're able to finally show him up. Oh no, I bet Pixar's quaking in their boots. Welp, here it is. What you've all been waiting for, Chicken Little. This movie is reviled by critics and general audiences alike, seen as one of Disney's worst movies ever made. Nowadays, Disney won't act like it never even happened. Now, I grew up watching Chicken Little a ton. Not nearly as much as Monster Zink or Brother Bear, but whenever it was on, I was always eager to watch it. But even when I was young, I had one constant thought about the film that a lot of other people had too. This is mean. The entire basis of this movie is shitting on one character who basically did nothing wrong. On one fateful night, a young chicken little believes that the sky is falling, and sends the town into a frenzy. But when they all think he was only hit in the head by an acorn, he becomes a huge laughing stock. We then cut to one year later, where the mockery doesn't seem to have slowed down one bit. What a nice bunch of townsfolk. But what matters most to Chicken Little is that his father doesn't seem to love him anymore because of this. So the movie is basically an hour and a half of a little kid trying to make his dad like him by taking an interest in the dad's hobbies. That's depressing. Like, a good chunk of the film is dedicated to him trying to become a baseball star, but the scene that leads into it is so sad he goes, y You know, Dad, I want to try it for baseball and, and be like you. And then Buck Cluck the cunt starts going, N -n No, you shouldn't do that, son. You want to you wanna lay low in the town. Like, what the fuck? I get what they're going for. Sort of. But they needed to have a couple scenes of him actually being sympathetic towards his son. Oh, and don't you worry, they did. They just cut all of them out of the fucking movie. There's like three different versions of the opening for the film, and they went with the one that presents him as the most unlikable prick ever. He should be listed on the Disney villains wiki. And then when he finally plays baseball and wins a game for the team, his father suddenly likes him again. How fucking shallow. Now when it turns out the sky really is falling, Chicken Little refuses to tell his dad in case he stops loving him again. Like, what the fuck? This is so fucking depressing. Then it turns into an alien movie for the next half an hour. I stopped caring at this point. The kid alien looks like a burst wisp. They have this sad, sappy scene at this point where the dad is like, Oh, son, you should never have to feel like my love is something you need to earn. It's, it's unconditional. 
Actions speak louder than words, cunt. They couldn't even go through with their dumb sappy shit because it's so obvious he was being fake. Because the rest of the scenes are of Chicken Little trying to save the day, while his dad is gritting his teeth like, Oh yes, I sure do love my son. I'm gonna fucking murder him. And this is all out of a desperate attempt to latch onto trends from the time. Or, well, one trend. Somebody. Chicken Little desperately wants to be Shrek and it is so apparent. Chicken Little and Shrek literally start with the exact same joke. Storybook opens. Once upon a time. Then one of the characters acting as a narrator makes some witty comment about how overdone and tropey it is. But here's the thing. In Chicken Little, they actually planned on starting the movie with the trope. They animated an entire narration for this book part, explaining the backstory of Chicken Little. But I can only imagine some executive demanded it be edgier and more reverent. So they cut it out and turned it into a joke. It's a Disney movie that actively hates the fact that it's a Disney movie. Not even the animation is good. For a first go, it's fine, I guess. But pair this up against what Pixar were doing at the time. Like, we just saw Incredibles and how good that film looked. What's this movie's excuse? Well, all the animators who were used to doing 2D were now basically forced to quickly learn how to animate in 3D. Meaning it came out not so good. Okay, that's a pretty good excuse. One thing I will say about Chicken Little, and it's not much of a compliment, but it is entertaining. When this film was about the baseball shit, I was enjoying myself. Albeit because of how bad the movie was, but enjoying myself nonetheless. It definitely did not feel like an hour and a half, it flew right by. And I'd rather a bad movie that does that than drag on and on forever. There was a lot riding on Chicken Little. See, the higher ups at Disney and Pixar were also beginning to notice how much one studio was outperforming the other. And so one of the biggest factors in depending on the details of their extended agreement was the performance of Chicken Little. So what they made was a film that constantly mocks the old Disney formula and tries to stand out by being edgy and hip with the times. Didn't go over well. Sorta. See, the requirement was to show Pixar that they were capable of making movies that do financially well. Critically was a factor, but not as important. And Chicken Little ended up doing alright at the box office. So for as much as they want to throw it under the rug nowadays, Chicken Little did a lot of good for Disney. Chicken Little is a bad movie. Wow, what a hot dick. But I've definitely seen worse than this during the marathon. It's got a good theme song too. I got a feeling in this town I'll never live till I live down the one mistake that seems to follow me around. But they'll forget about this guy when they all realize this guy is gonna try to learn to fly or hit the ground. Chicken Little is going above Aristocats. Fight me. I feel like Cars gets a bit of a bad rap. I feel like due to the excessive merchandising and terrible sequels and spin-offs, people just look at the entire series as trash. And don't get me wrong, I'm very certain that a large factor behind getting this movie made was the fact that little boys love car toys, so fuck it, just make an entire movie about anthropomorphic cars. But I think that mindset isn't giving the first film enough justice. Is it amazing? No, not really. But for what it is, I think it's a fairly solid movie about an asshole having a turnaround, and learning not to be so egotistical. Cars stars Lightning McQueen, this rookie race car who's on top of the world. However, on the way to the biggest race of his life, he gets lost and winds up in a nearly abandoned town Radiator Springs, filled with kooky characters that desperately want to make it a popular hotspot again. So being tasked with fixing the broken road, Lightning is stuck there and slowly learns to get along with people who live there. Lightning McQueen is the only good thing about this movie. I like that he's an asshole at first. His turnaround feels very natural. The parts of him sitting in Radiator Springs ranting and raving to himself was pretty entertaining for me. And some of the characters he interacts with in the town are decent, like Sally or Doc. Didn't need a joke about tramp stamps though. But he gets a good scene here or there for all the important ones. Such as the cow tipping scene with Meter, and the racing scene between him and Doc was real nice too. You know, the whole thing is about humbling him. He starts so egotistical that you don't feel bad for him whenever each following scene is basically just knocking him down a peg. And right when you feel it's getting excessive, they start to ease up on it, like eventually giving him the chance to leave, with him of course choosing to stay of his own volition, and letting him go around the racetrack to practice. Then this all cultivates in the sweet scene of Lightning deciding not to be such a prick to the residents where he goes around supporting all their businesses, and eventually putting it back on the map by fixing up the town and promoting it by telling people to visit. And of course, this all results in the big race, which I'm still quite split on. Like, I get what the point is and know that the other option wouldn't have been as impactful, but Lightning is doing the race and one of the asshole racers knocks the other one off the track, and despite having the lead, Lightning stops right before he finishes the race, allows the other guy to win, and pushes the damaged one to the finish line. It's a good ending. And I appreciate that it's a crucial point in showing that he's willing to put others above his own victories or success. But at the same time, as a kid, it was like, the finish line is right there. Come on, just go an inch further. Please, lightning. 
This is also where Pixar's animation starts getting really good, especially with the lighting. The shine off the cars, like in the racing scene, looks so impressive for the time. I really love the look of the scene where Lightning and Sally are driving through the mountain area, it is gorgeous. I'm gonna ignore all the weird questions that arise with a world where cars are alive, but for the sake of not nitpicking, I'll leave it. For the sequel. Really, my biggest gripe with this movie is that it's two hours long. Yeah, that's it. I don't think it should be as long as it is for such a simple story. If this were told in a quick hour and a half, I think it would have gone over much better. Cars is an okay movie. The side characters either aren't anything special or downright annoying. It starts to drag after a while, and it's just nowhere near as good as most of Pixar's previous films. But I still like it due to the arc that the main character goes through. I always love those asshole redeemed stories. And for that, Cars is going above the Great Mouse Detective, but under the Jungle Book. Meet the Robinsons is an extremely sloppy movie, with deeded visuals, poor piecing, and not a completely thought through story. But I love it. Yeah, Meet the Robinsons is great, and despite recently rising in popularity, I still don't think it's given the credit it deserves. This movie came out at a very bad point for Disney. As you could probably tell, their movies weren't performing well at all, especially critically, and their sister studio was consistently upstaging them at their own game, so a lot was riding on Meet the Robinsons to do well. Lewis, who I like to call Seth Green, is a young inventor who was dropped off in an orphanage when he was born. After one of his inventions fails spectacularly, and he settles on quitting forever, a mysterious kid takes him to the future to help him fix his time machine, as an evil man in a bowler hat has stolen the only other one in existence, and plans on using it to destroy Lewis' dreams and conquer the world. I'm going to refrain from getting too much into spoilers with this one, because I do think the film is worth watching if you haven't already, but it really is amazing, because this film should be bad. It should be terrible, but you can just feel the heart and soul poured into every little aspect, so you're able to look past a lot of the minor setbacks. First of all, the positives. The main character has a very relatable issue. Every time he screws up, he impulsively feels like quitting, and that he's just not capable of doing what he wants to do. Not only does it cause you to sympathize for him, but it also complements the message of the film quite well, that being keep moving forward. This also might be one of the best Disney villains ever. I feel like this was the start of the whole evil bad guy who is seriously incompetent in what they do and are more funny than threatening. And he may just be the best thing about it. Mary is short for, um... Marion. <clears throat> Can that be a boy name? Yes. Then yes! Yeah, this movie is also really funny. I have laughed out loud at many of the jokes here, and making me laugh is an accomplishment. Again, like I was saying before, this is nowhere near a perfect movie. It has quite a few flaws. But surprisingly, I don't find them bringing the film down at all. First, there's the pacing. It's not the best. The stuff with Lewis and the future goes by way too fast. They completely rush through his introduction to the family. And then by the next scene, you're supposed to find it believable that they'd be willing to adopt him the next day. And while we're at it, a lot of the time travel logic makes no sense. Like when Lewis takes the bowler hat guy to the bad future after he already prevented it from happening. And don't even get me started on all the paradoxes this film would have caused. Again though, I'm too busy being entertained by the film for this stuff to even come to mind. It's all stuff I randomly think about on a rewatch, or when thinking back on the film. I love that the future is kept shrouded in mystery. The twist that happens with that blew my fucking mind as a kid, and for that I'm not going to spoil it. It does cause everything to come full circle however, and gives Lewis that perfect motivation to keep moving forward. The last aspect of this film that also isn't the best is the animation. I'd argue it looks worse than The Incredibles at points, which came out like two to three years prior. The future looks really basic, like it's just this one city we barely see in a house. And the humans are starting to get better, but still not great. Some of them have quite the uncanny feel to them. Meet the Robinsons is a mess, I won't lie. But again, the effort they put in just oozes out of the film. You can tell they were really trying with this one. And I can appreciate that a lot more than something like Chicken Little, which constantly tries to be edgy because of its insecurities and not wanting to be another Disney movie. Meet the Robinsons isn't like that. It's earnest. This whole movie was basically just a big symbol for what Disney was going to do after so many blunders. Keep moving forward. And for that, and all the other amusing aspects such as the characters and comedy, I'm putting Meet the Robinsons above the Emperor's New Groove, but below Fox and the Hound. Disney's finally starting to get back on their feet. Let's see how Pixar was doing around this time as well. Oh, you know, just making another fucking banger. Ratatouille is such a simple movie, but every single aspect of it fits perfectly together. It's right up there near The Incredibles tier for me. Remy is fascinated by food and cooking, aspiring to be a world-renowned French chef. Only issue is he's a rat. I mean, I, I, the mouse.
So to be able to help out in the kitchen, he decides to befriend and take control of this incompetent chef called Linguini by grabbing his hair and pulling at it to move his arms. Again, it's very simple, but it works really well. And I think that's because this movie has a really good message. That being that no matter who you are or where you come from, you're capable of achieving your dreams if you work hard enough. There's gonna be a Pixar movie that shits all over that message later on, but for now let's just bask in how beautifully this film handles the subject. Ratatouille could have easily fallen into the same trap as A Bug's Life, but they cleverly avoided everything that made that movie shit. That mainly being when Remy screws up, and is therefore separated from his family of rats, he's the only one who suffers the consequences. He doesn't feel like he needs to make it up to them. He's not like, I shall set out in an adventure to find us a new home. Nah, he just goes out and pursues his dreams. We see his family later on, sure, and we do have Remy allow them to eat the stuff from the kitchen, but you can tell that more so comes from a place of him caring about them, instead of feeling the need to make it up to them or prove himself like in a bug's life. I'm glad the movie barely focuses on the rat family, because the stuff between Remy and Linguini is amazing. Their relationship is very well handled, despite the two of them not being able to properly communicate with one another. I also like all the side characters. If I were to have a small complaint with the film, I guess it would be that I wish they did more. But that's only a complaint because the little screen time they did have, they made their presence known and were very enjoyable. Like the love interest, and I really liked the thumb guy, I forget his name, I just know him as the thumb guy. The ghost of Gusto was also a nice touch. As a kid, I literally thought this was the ghost of him, and was confused as to why he was talking to a rat of the mind. But after rewatching it, that's clearly not what they were going for at all. It's like... The personification of the side of him that aspires to be a chef, and is the part that keeps pushing him towards that goal, it's really cool. The ending to this film is perfection. Look, this is me every time I watch Scooby-Doo 2. And the whole speech he gives at the end about being a critic was very powerful, I loved it a lot. The animation in this film is gorgeous, Paris looks so fucking pretty. That shot of Remy looking over the rooftops at night, so good. And this is all complemented greatly by the score. The score for Ratatouille is great. They invoke that feeling of worry and fear when it needs to, like when Remy is running through the building, but when it wants to, it just has this grand and whimsical sense of wonder, like the orchestral version of the main theme. The main theme is also amazing in general, but I sadly can't play it or else Disney will strike me down with the ban hammer. But everything just works out in the end. Remy gets to work as a chef, they get to open up a new restaurant, and include a nice little tiny rat restaurant upstairs. It's not realistic in the slightest and very fantastical. Like, no, if a critic found out that a rat was cooking the food, they would not be okay with that no matter how good it tasted. But that's what's so good about it. It's what it stands for. Anyone can cook, and anyone is capable of achieving their dreams. And that's what makes Ratatouille such a special movie. It may not be one of Pixar's most grand adventures, but I think it more than makes up for it with a very important and inspiring message, and a host of great characters. Ratatouille is third in the overall list, right under The Incredibles but above Aladdin. Wow, Pixar sure is dominating that top five. Let's see if that continues with their next entry, WALL-E. <laughs> wall Wally will always stand out to me. It holds a very special place in my heart. This was the first movie I think where I was going to watch it at the age of 6, and my sisters did not want to watch it at all. That was weird to me. This was the first time I was the only one interested in the movie, so it was just me and my daddy went to watch it. And I fucking loved it. It's just weird to me, because this is the exact opposite sort of film I would recommend to a 6 year old. For the most part it's very quiet, there's practically no dialogue for the first half, other than the TVs and such. It's not all that cartoony or exaggerated, it's quite the serious setting, and it's a love movie. Everything a six-year-old boy would be bored by. But I think it sticks out to me because Wally was the first time I realized what I really wanted from a movie. What I enjoyed and cared about the most. With that being the characters. After the Earth has become so overpolluted, to the point where there isn't even breathable oxygen on it anymore, all humans are sent up into space to live in comfort, while little robots are sent down to contain all the trash down there. One of these robots being Wally, a small little robot that has become obsessed with human life, collecting different artifacts that he finds among the rubble. This is until one day when another robot is sent down from space, Eve, who Wally immediately falls in love with. After finding a small sign of life on Earth through this small plant, Eve is then sent back up into space to show the captain, with Wally following close behind. All of this is perfectly presented and readable to the audience, without saying any single word other than Wally and Eve. Except for one offhand showcase of a news broadcast, but still, it's great. This is one of the most charming movies I have ever seen. I love how calm and mellow it is. It's just about this little robot wanting to impress the girl he likes, and it's so sweet to watch unfold. And you feel so bad for him whenever she locks up and he stares by your side, taking care of her till she gets back. Sadly though, I do have to talk about probably the biggest complaint I see with this movie. That being the criticism that the film should have been a short film, that only focused on the Earth stuff, and that it starts to suck once they go up into space. 
Fortunately, however, I do not agree with this complaint in the slightest. I like this beast stuff. Is it as good as the regular Earth segments? No. But I still believe that the second half of the film is a pretty fun time. It's just not as good. Once they get to here, the goal is no longer focused on Wally trying to get with Eve. It's more so Eve trying to get the plant to the captain, while Wally looks for her. And so the film sidetracks into a variety of different gags with him going to different parts of the ship and letting things run amok. But again, I don't think these segments are bad in the slightest. I actually like the lesser emphasized moments, such as the two big chunguses on the ship looking away from their screens and finding love. That was sweet. And the part where Wally and Eve fall outside the ship and do their little dance together, it's so great. It's here we see that Eve is finally starting to feel the same way about him, that's adorable. Not to mention the visuals get especially breathtaking at these parts. That scene where Wally is flying through space and touches the stars is so freaking sweet. But even on Earth, they do a great job of portraying how polluted it is, mixed with the random live action videos they play. As a kid I genuinely thought the backgrounds here were also live action, they were that good for the time. My biggest gripe with the film has to be the villain. I get it, you gotta raise the stakes somehow. But what was his goal here? He doesn't want them going back to Earth and wants humans to continue relying on technology? But why? What does he get out of this? You know, this would have been a whole lot easier if people didn't decide to program sentience into every one of these robots. Still, Owali is amusing. I don't understand the criticisms for the later half of the film at all. While I like the earlier stuff a whole lot more, I still think the space aspect is worth sticking around for. With the best part of the movie obviously being the relationship between Wally and Eve, Wally is going right above Tarzan, but under Toy Story 2. I do have to agree that I wish the movie were overall a more consistent experience, but it's still a great time. Excellent! Into your name. And that was movie number 50, I think. We're like two-thirds of the way done now. And the films just seem to be consistently getting better and better. From Pixar, that is. But Disney is finally starting to find their footing in 3D. So let's see if they can manage to get even better with their next film. Dude, what? Bolt was only Disney's third CGI film? That's so bizarre. I remember it coming way later. I guess maybe that's because Pixar are releasing these films so fast, while Disney has larger bricks in between theirs. But either way, I remember Bolt was a movie I really enjoyed as a kid. Mainly, I remember finding it cute how desperately he wanted to get back to his owner. The relationship was really sweet. However, after rewatching it, Bolt is one of the most by the books, plain Disney films ever. There is nothing all that special about it. Bolt is a dog who stars with his owner Penny in a TV show, where they're presented as big action heroes who stop bad guys. Only issue is Bolt isn't aware it's a show because the director wants to torture the dog so they can get real emotion out of it. After a cliffhanger ending where Penny is taken away from Bolt, he escapes his home and goes out searching for her. Meh. It's a neat idea, but they don't really do much with it. All it's used for is your average fish-out-of-water jokes, where the dog doesn't know how to act normal, or much of anything about the real world. They just aim for the most basic dog jokes you could think of in a day. Hey, stick your head out of the window. Trust me, dude, it is amazing. Wait a minute. You do not know how to beg for food? Let me teach you how to. It feels like at times they're trying way too hard to have that whole cute factor thing, where the audience is in awe of this cute dog doing cute dog things, but it doesn't work for me personally. Except for the opening. That shit was fucking adorable. I don't like any of his sidekicks either. Eventually he runs into this fat chungus hamster who's obsessed with TV, so of course he's starstruck and loves everything about Bolton and indulges in his fantasy. That he really is a super doge. And the cat I just feel bad for. She's dragged along this entire adventure against her will, after Bolt threatens to literally throw her in traffic. But to not make the audience hate our main character in the scene she's introduced, they have to show her being the biggest bitch possible. So I don't really like anyone. But after she starts to learn to appreciate Bolt, and they start getting more friendly, there's a nice little scene where she sets up a home for them to stay in, where they can have all the food and freedom they want. But Bolt declines it so he can go and look for Penny again. And I feel bad for the cat because she was rejected in favor of the most boring plank of wood, cookie cutter child character possible. All she does in this film is cry and moan about her dog, but they could have done so much more. They keep saying how the girl wants a normal life and isn't really interested in being an actress. So why is she? They act like the mum is on her side here, but no bitch, you signed her up for this and are probably also taking the money. I wish they actually explored that, being a child actor, instead of just ignoring it. But of course they can never explore it because this is a Disney film, home to some of the most exploited child actors around. Speaking of, Penny is voiced by Miley Cyrus. You can definitely tell what era of Disney this film was released in. She sure does a good job at saying Bolt 50 million times. What a brilliant voice actress. They definitely got her purely for her talent. Not even the animation is all that good. The humans are starting to look a little bit better, and the fur on the animals looks pretty impressive at times. 
but the film has no style or flair at all, it looks so generic, especially the side characters and the environments. I don't know. I wanted to like Bolt considering I enjoyed it a lot as a kid, but I guess after rewatching it I now remember why I hadn't seen it since that initial time in the cinemas. Bolt isn't a bad movie, it's just decent. You might like it, but I personally got nothing out of this one. I'm going to be putting Bolt under Cinderella, but above A Bug's Life. Dare I even ask what Pixar we're doing around this time? Yep, of course there were. I'm not sure if people would think I'm dumb for saying this, but I actually believe Up to be an incredibly underrated movie. Yeah, one of Pixar's most popular films. Underrated. See, when people praise Up, they're always talking about the first five minutes. Oh, the opening is amazing, it is so good, some of the best from Pixar. And then are indifferent towards or either flat out hate the other hour and a half of the film. Mostly because of how much of a tonal shift it is from the start. However, I'd argue that much like WALL-E, while not as stellar as the opening, there is still a lot of fun to be had with the rest of the film, as well as a good message that ties itself back to the beginning. Up is about Mr. Fredrickson. His wife and he had always planned on eventually moving away to a place called Paradise Falls. But sadly, after his wife dies, this dream was slowly forgotten. Until he decides to one day pack up and fly there, using his house with a bunch of balloons attached. I feel like this movie was created just based on someone sketching the visual of a house floating from balloons. It's such a simple yet creative idea. As the film goes on, they sort of start to lose that simplicity. It then becomes about a young boy scout who followed the elderly man meeting a rare, nearly extinct bird, whom he calls Kevin, which is being taken away by this talking dog called Doug who wants to take him back to his master, who in fact is an old adventurer that Mr. Fredrickson used to admire as a child. Then it becomes a big action fest where they're trying to save the bird. And yeah, at this point it does kind of devolve into your standard kids flick. I'm not here to argue that this is better than the opening or anything. Like, seeing their relationship slowly progress is so sweet, so when she starts to get ill and dies, you feel that shit hard. This moment is filled with so much great symbolism too. Like how we see that Ellie always has to do Carl's tie, so at her funeral he's wearing a bow tie. That's fucking, that's heartbreaking. But I'd like to argue that the other parts of the movie, the more standard adventure film parts, add to the overall message that was set up at the beginning. I feel like people miss a certain scene that happens way later on in the film, and it's when he finally gets what he wants and arrives at Paradise Falls. He then looks through Ellie's photo album that she had saved for when they arrived there, only for him to find out that she had already filled it up. Filled it up with all their moments in their lives together that she cherished. Showing that getting to Paradise Falls slowly became less and less of a goal for her because she was just happy being with him. And instead of wanting him to dwell on that fantasy together, she wants him to go out and start a new adventure all for himself. This is when Carl realizes that he's been so focused on that one thing, that he's completely avoided the different adventure that's been right in front of him the whole time. And that's when he finally sets out to see if Russell and the bird. And I think that segment is extremely important in circling things back to the beginning of the film, making the random shift in tone to a big grand epic adventure make a little more sense. What allows me to still enjoy up throughout those segments are the charming characters. Carl works very well off of Russell. He could have easily been your generic fat comic relief kid, but they do a good job at keeping his annoyance to a realistic level. Like you can imagine this is how a kid would actually behave. Plus, they do add a sense of relatability and innocence to his character when he starts talking about his family life. How he doesn't really get to see his dad anymore and that his mum doesn't take care of him. That scene was really sad. To be fair though, I did not enjoy the talking dogs. They felt like it was purely done for the sake of marketing. Despite that though, Up is an amazing movie, the whole way through. Sure, it has kind of a weak villain and the opening is the best part, but I think that does a disservice to the entertaining adventure that is the second half of the film. That perfectly complements the message of the opening. Up for now is gonna go above Toy Story, but under Beauty and the Beast. I really enjoy this one. Princess and the Frog is another one I avoided when it came out in theaters, because duh. Girl movie. I think around this time Disney was attempting to remind everyone why they were so great in the first place. And obviously the perfect way to do that would be to try and recapture their same magic by doing another princess movie. Sadly it didn't work out so well. Yeah, this film was a big failure. I can only imagine it has something to do with them limiting themselves to the little girl market, instead of marketing it as a more general family movie. Because honestly, I think if I were a kid and I'd seen this one, I would have liked it quite a bit. Princess and the Frog stars Tiana, this girl who in her attempts to save up money to open a restaurant, forgot to have any sort of social life. On the day of her best friend's ball, she meets a frog who claims to be a prince, and after kissing him she herself winds up becoming a frog too. So now the two of them must try and find a way to be turned back to normal. I was absolutely loving this film at the beginning. The stuff with her trying to start up a business was very entertaining to me. I think that all comes down to Tiana as a character. 
She's very persistent, and it's made clear to you that she's worked extremely hard to get to where she wants. So in turn, the audience wants her to succeed. I also liked how they managed to subvert my expectations in some areas that made it a way more pleasant experience. Like, for example, Tiana has her best friend who's incredibly rich and wants to be the one who marries a prince. Of course, you'd assume this is to set up some sort of big rivalry or jealousy when she finds out Tiana is falling in love with him, or just by virtue of being a rich character, she'd act really snobby and above her poor friend. But no, she was the most likable character in the film, I loved her. I wish she were in it more. She's just nice. And when she does find out about Tiana and the prince, she's all cool with it. She gives up her chance to marry him so they can be together. But like, everything I enjoy about this movie comes to a screeching halt around 20 to 30 minutes in. And that's because I was thoroughly having a good time up until Tiana got turned into a frog herself. At this point, it just became an average adventure movie. We gotta find the witch of the forest who can see of us. Cue the wacky cast of side characters that meet along the way. To be fair, I liked the crocodile. He was entertaining. Probably the best part about that portion of the film. But the Firefly one? Dude, I don't get it. He was so annoying. I was stunned whenever they decided to kill him off. Not because I was shocked they'd do something like that. Not because I was sad due to being invested in the character. Stunned because I couldn't believe the filmmakers expected me to have some sort of emotional reaction at this. I laughed. The villain just fucking steps on him. To be fair, he does have an okay song. Oh yeah, that's another alright thing about the movie. The music for the most part was very good. Especially Tiana's song about a restaurant, it was pretty rad. It's all very jazzy with the trumpets and such, and the upbeat ones did a good job at making this feel like a fun adventure. Even had a solid villain song too. Sadly, that's the best thing about him. He barely has any presence despite the cool design, and I absolutely love the stuff going on with his shadow. The movie as a whole looks amazing. It really does come off like a modern day 2D Disney princess movie They hadn't lost their touch a bit. I especially love the swamp scenes, the yellow and greens work so well off each other. I'm not sure if this film would have done better if it had been done with CGI. Maybe a little bit. But again, I think the failure was mostly down to its marketing. Either way, I enjoyed Princess and the Frog. I didn't love it or anything. Again, I think it peaks around 30 minutes in. But I'd be happy to check this one out again. There's enough in the later half to make it worth watching, I feel. For now, it's going above Pinocchio but under Dumbo. Oh my god, Toy Story 3, the greatest Pixar movie ever made, it caused me to cry, which means it's a good movie. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that I'm attached to these characters, and so putting them through a big change will have some kind of emotional effect on me. Toy Story 3 is decent. <laughs> Even as a kid, I remember being a little disappointed by this one. It was the last day of primary school one year, and I recall the class being given the choice to either watch Toy Story 2 or Toy Story 3. I thought it was pretty clear that 2 was the better film, and that we'd all agree to watch that, but no. We had to watch Toy Story 3 as it was so much better. So yes, I may or may not have a personal vendetta against this movie. To start, I actually really love the opening of this film. A compilation of Andy growing up and playing with his toys, with You've Got a Friend and Me playing in the background, only for the song to stop on Our Friendship Will Never Die, like that hits hard. I think the concept and idea of this movie is great. Andy is all grown up now and doesn't play off his toys anymore, so feeling neglected and worrying about being thrown away, they all set off to deck her so they can be played with forever. This is until they get there and realize it's an awful place, where children don't take care of their toys, and are forced into staying by this bear called Lotso. I know it's kind of an unoriginal take, but it really was bothering me throughout how many plot points just felt reused from the second. I'm sure it wasn't intentional, but was there really no point during production where someone stopped and said, Hey, doesn't this sound exactly the same as Toy Story 2? The characters start by undergoing the realization that toys don't last forever. They go to a new location and are promised of being admired forever by a nice old toy who we discover is actually a villain out of his realization that he was unloved. Like, sure, the overall film is different, but these plots are exactly the same. And I guess I wouldn't care as much if each of them weren't done infinitely worse than in the second. Everyone just feels slightly out of character, enough to bother me. Like, after I sang the praises of the side characters for not being complete dicks anymore in Toy Story 2, they're all now back to being cunts again, and not believing Woody. Like, what does he have to gain from lying to these guys, and this is what kicks off the entire plot. And Lotso is a way worse villain than Pete, I don't even exactly understand what his plan is. Like with Pete, it's made clear. He was sick of never being bought, so he wants Woody to stay with them, so they can go to Japan as a full set and be admired on display forever. Easy. With Lotso, he wants to be the head honcho of the Dekar, everyone goes through him. But like, he already has that position of power. Why doesn't he want Buzz and friends to be in the big kid's room? What sort of threat do that pose? It's not that there's a shortage of toys in the little kid's room. They clearly just play with what they get. I don't think any of them are able to communicate to a worker that they want a more diverse selection of toys. And even if they do, the worker isn't going to blame the teddy bear for it. Just let them in the big kid's room, you have nothing to gain either way. 
I don't know. It just seems like his purpose is to stop the good guys, and that's pretty boring to me. This one came out a long time after too, so it was cool getting to see the improvements made in the animation department. The lighting here is so good, the shine off the toys looks amazing. The environments are also very nice. They strike a good balance between realistic yet still cartoony enough, so it's not jarring. But, after saying that, if you look at Toy Story 3 as a standalone movie and ignore the other two, it is a fairly alright film that clearly a lot of people were entertained by. I just can't help but pair it against the other two and see it as the weaker of the three. I will give it this, however. The ending is really spectacular. The whole film is way more depressing than I remembered it being as a kid. The opening being really dull and drab, the colors don't pop as much with the toys all defeated and depressed, and the incinerator scene, while a little too melodramatic in my opinion, does do a good job at showing this really is the final hurdle for the characters to clear. And the ending with Andy giving them all to Bonnie was very sweet. I like that Andy isn't just a heartless one-note teenager. We see here that he really did and still does love Woody, but he's willing to give him up if it makes this little girl happy. Boy, I sure I'm glad there aren't any sequels to this film that will ruin that. Hmm. And the final shot up to the clouds that are the same as Andy's old wall pattern was a great touch. Toy Story 3 is a film I want to like a lot more than I do. As a standalone movie, it's okay, and as a sequel, it's pretty weak. But I appreciate what the filmmakers did to make sure that everything is tied up with a neat little bow. I can't lie and say that ending isn't very well done. So for now, Toy Story 3 is going under Sleeping Beauty, but above Treasure Planet. I like their relationships more in Treasure Planet, but Toy Story 3 is definitely a more solid film than that. Much like Princess and the Frog, I did not want to watch Tangled at all when it came out. I was sick of these goddamned female movies. Make something for man, Disney. But this isn't my first time watching it. I think my sister may have got it on DVD after it released and I watched it with her one day. And I really enjoyed it. I think a lot of the choices made for Tangled were done as a result of Princess and the Frog doing so poorly. First of all, they called it Tangled. Something a lot more general and ambiguous than just calling it Rapunzel. They add in some wacky animals for the younger kids, and a cool outlaw character for the boys. No surprise this one ended up performing way better. Tangled is about Rapunzel. When she was born, she gets kidnapped by this elderly lady, who wants to use the essence in her heart to regain her youth. And so she has trapped her in this tower away from society, until she's thrown into action by this criminal guy who's stolen some jewels, which she only promises to return if he takes her to see these lanterns. I like how the plot usually avoids a lot of the common tropes we see done in these princess movies. First of all, there's Rapunzel. This could have easily been similar to Cinderella, with her being in an abusive household that she absolutely hates being in and just wants to leave. She's completely content living in the tower, she likes it. She just really wants to find out what those lanterns are for because they look cool. Same with the mother character. With her being the villain there, again, could have made this very similar to Cinderella, with her being a one-note bad guy. But no, they have a very good mix between a motherly, yet villainous tone with her. At points, it seems like she genuinely does care for Rapunzel and treats her as if she were her actual daughter. This woman was willing to go out in a three-day walk just to get this girl some white paint. That's gotta be worth something. Like, her character is just kind of like a gaslighting parent. That's it. That's the villain. This is all complemented very well for design. Again, it manages to strike that perfect balance between looking motherly, but still with that hint of mystique to her, like it's clear she's the bad guy. I also liked Flynn Rider, the guy Rapunzel sets out with. Their romance is established very well, it doesn't just happen immediately, but also doesn't come off as forced and unbelievable. The scenes of them spending time together are fun. I liked the bar scene especially, had a nice song too. All the songs are good. Nowhere near the best from Disney, but they're pretty high up there. What is a big step up, however, is with the animation. They're finally starting to get that Pixar level of quality, it feels like. The lighting is super good, especially in the scene where Flynn and Rapunzel finally make it to the lanterns. And the her is definitely a big achievement. It looks like a real bitch to deal with. Making sure all this was working properly must have been a pain. I do have one hope for the future, though. We're getting to the point where Disney CGI films look good in stills, but in terms of the motion, I want to see it get a bit more cartoony. There were many moments where I wished they pushed the expressions way more, they're just too static. The only character that I felt was truly animated perfectly was the horse, and that's because they're able to reach a vast variety of emotions with them, and the posing is very exaggerated. I want to see that out of the human characters too. I think I speak for everyone when I said Disney had a rocky transition into 3D. But it appears with Rapunzel they're finally starting to find their footing, and I can only hope it gets better from here on out. Rapunzel was a very good step in the right direction, with it feeling like a fresh take on an old story, with a great cast of characters, wonderful visuals, and some pretty good songs. I'll be putting Tangled under Sleeping Beauty, but above Toy Story 3. This was a great one. Again, I hope they can manage to keep this up. Well guys, pack it in. Disney just made another blunder, go figure- Wait, wait, wait a minute. Cars 2? 
that means this is a bad Pixar movie? The unthinkable has happened. Sure, A Bug's Life was mediocre and I didn't enjoy Cars as much as some of the others, but none of them had been flat out bad before. That was until Cars 2. Again, as a kid I loved the original Cars. I was so excited to watch the sequel in theaters. But even as a child I can remember being absolutely dreadfully bored by this movie. They could not have made a lazier cash grab that genuinely comes off like no love was put into it whatsoever, and was purely done for the sake of marketing. Instead of this one being some sort of progression from the first Cars, taking an aspect and exploring it further, or getting our characters and putting them through a new struggle. This wants to be a spy movie. A Cars spy movie. Doesn't work. Lightning McQueen is challenged to a World Grand Prix, where he faces off against- Whoa, don't worry about that kids, cause we got Meter. Look at Meter, isn't he silly? How would you like it if we devoted 90% of our movie to the comic relief? Yeah, Lightning isn't the main character anymore. While on this world tour, Meter accidentally gets mistaken for a spy, and gets taken in by this organization who's been trying to find out who's been causing all these car combustions going on throughout the different races. And so we go through each and every tired, overdone spy trope known to man. Such as... Oh boy. Gadgets. Whoa. Disguise montage. Oh my god. Yeah, those are the only real two, I guess. I wanted to come in and start screaming about every little thing this film does wrong, pick apart every single scene, because believe you me, they're all terrible. But instead, I'm gonna sum it up in one simple word that I've already used to describe it. Boring. This film is so fucking tedious. I have no idea why Pixar keeps insisting that the Cars franchise of all things are what they dedicate their two hour runtimes for. Meter is an inherently annoying character. It's not a bad thing. Again, in the original film, I think he works quite well off of Lightning. He's supposed to be that dumb, carefree hillbilly type that clashes against McQueen's more egotistical and self-indulgent personality. Why would you then separate Lightning and Meter from each other and only focus on Meter for a majority of the film? I don't understand the process. I mean, I understood the process well enough. Spy movie means more car designs. Spy movie means gadget accessories. Spy movie means more money. But in context of making a good film, I don't understand the process. The new characters are forgettable. I don't care about this lame-ass twist villain. I don't really care about these new spy characters. All they really do is that dumb fucking trope that I really hate, where Mater keeps messing up and they just go, Whoa, this is something I've never seen before. This guy must be a real professional. And the characters from the first film do absolutely nothing. They have zero presence here. Why is it a Cars movie? Just make it a separate IP. Because the fact that they're Cars complicates things tenfold. Like, the animation looks nice, yeah. I especially love the look of the Tokyo place, it's super bright and colorful. But the more time we spend exploring this world, the more questions I just start to ask while watching. How does this world function? Being a car seems like hell when everything else basically works like our regular world. Again, like, Tokyo looks nice and it looks like they actually spent time building this for cars. But then when we go to London, it just looks like regular fucking Britain, like this could have been taken from the fucking Minions movie or something. We get to see planes. Wow, those seem very cramped and like they wouldn't be able to carry too many people. Airports must be hell in this world. The planes are anthropomorphic too. Jeez, being a plane must suck. These cars can be racers, sure, but they can also be chefs, designers, hotel managers. But if you're born as a plane, fuck you, I guess. You gotta carry cars around. Wait, how does the reproduction of planes even work? Oh, forget that off the fucking screen. I didn't want to see that. I'm gonna stop now before I have a fucking aneurysm. I think you get the picture. This film is not only an awful sequel, as it feels entirely disconnected from the first, but is also just a bad movie in general, as it features a boring plotline, boring characters, and a comic relief star that makes me want to bash my fucking head in. Cars 2 is going under Brother Bear but above Black Cauldron. You know, at least it made me feel something. Even if that feeling is absolute misery. A sequel to Winnie the Pooh? In 2011? Seems like Disney finally got a good thing going, but suddenly just took a U-turn right back to trying their hand at another 2D movie. Sadly. Unsurprisingly. It didn't work out and this was the last traditional hand-drawn film before shutting down their studio. Much like the first one we looked at, this movie doesn't follow much in terms of a plot. They sort of just bounce around different stuff until it eventually ends. The first segment of the film revolves around Eeyore losing his tail, which, correct me if I'm wrong, seems to be the only thing they ever do with him. Glad to see they pulled out the big guns for this film. Then after that it turns into Christopher Robin disappearing and leaving a note saying he'll be back soon. <laughs> but all the characters think it means he was taken by a creature called a Baxin, and now they freak out trying to rescue him. How silly. And that's the movie. It, it, it was an hour long. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess I can't be too mad. I take an hour long Winnie the Pooh movie over a two hour one. But the fact they couldn't even be bothered to make a film that fills the average runtime makes me wonder why this was made in the first place. All the characters are generally the same, except they've somehow been made even more stereotypical. Like Pooh's big arc in this movie is that he finally decides to do something nice and put his friendship above Honey. Hooray! Like, I don't know. Of course I can't be too mad, it's clearly just a baby movie for babies. But I still feel like I was able to get some modicum of enjoyment out of the first film. Like, it was definitely more charming than this one at least. The first one attempted to touch on the philosophy of growing up. But with this one, there's no substance. They had no idea how to even market this movie, nothing happens. So they had to get in that epic trailer voice guy and have him do the generic This summer, everything changes shtick. I can see you're going to be rather feisty today. One thing I can't for sure give this movie, it's the animation. For their last 2D movie, they definitely wanted to go out in a bang in that department. The movements all look so fluid. I love the nice watercolor backgrounds, and seeing them do more with the storybook aesthetic like the letter ladder. Speaking of that, that is literally the only somewhat redeemable scene in this whole film. The tongue twister jokes were pretty funny, and I liked how they didn't draw much attention to the fact that Isle can literally just fly out of the hole they're stuck in. Is what I would be saying if they didn't drag it on and on and on for like two minutes. Again, it's only an hour, but they're desperate to stretch scenes out for as long as they can to even meet the bare minimum. That's true, Rabbit. It lags a bit in the middle. Dying straight. I think a way they should have extended things more while still keeping it interesting could have been done using alternate styles of animation throughout. There was this part where they were describing and singing about the Baxin, and it's done with this neat simple chalk style, and it's the only part that somewhat managed to keep my attention. Should have done way more shit like that. Like, is Winnie the Pooh really that popular to deserve a movie like this? Apparently. I did some research and did you know that just Winnie the Pooh contributes over five billion dollars a year to Disney? How? I guess I can't blame him then, although I still don't think there was much demand for this. Even then, I could probably see a baby finding some enjoyment out of this movie. Only issue is a parent is well less likely to take a baby to the theater because they tend to scream and whine and piss everywhere. So as you could probably guess, this movie made a grand total of 50 million at the box office. What a shock. Winnie Pooh 2, Electric Pooh Galoo is going under Atlantis, but above Home on the Range. It sucked. I remember liking Brave a lot when I was younger. And by when I was younger, I mean when I saw it in the cinema and no other time. I think we may have another Bolt situation on our hands. When hearing about Brave over the years, I'd always seen it classed under the bad Pixar movies. But I recall it being good. What's everyone's problem? Am I the positive one for a change? Nope, Brave sucked. Regrettably, I did not find much to like about this one on my rewatch. I don't know, it just came off like Pixar were going, oh yeah, we can like Disney Disney and make an amazing princess movie, and fell flat in their face. Might also have something to do with the fact that they fired the director midway through production, but I guess we'll never know. So just what innovative direction did Pixar take for their first princess film? Brave is about Merida. Her mother is setting her up for an arranged mar- Oh, for fuck's sake! Really? This again? I never even realized it, but somehow Princess and the Frog and Tangled both managed to avoid this dumb shit, but no, here we go again. Merida just wants some freedom in her life. She wants the chance to change her fate, and so sets out to the forest where she's greeted by this witch lady, who gives her a magic dessert that will do just that. So her mother turns into a bear. So her mother turns into a bear. When this happened, it all came back to me. When I was sitting in theaters, liking the direction in which it was going, and then BANG! Disappointment. Oh. The trailers mention nothing about this being Brother Bear 2. Immediate drop off. While cliche, the opening was at least a little bit entertaining. The bow and arrow contest reminded me a lot of Robin Hood, actually. I was enjoying that. But when the film just switches tones and becomes about Merida trying to change her bear mother back to normal, it becomes so boring. We get loads of wacky jokes about being a bear. I can relate to that. I mean, we've all been there, right? I just don't care. Merida is a dickhead. This bitch intentionally fed her mother the potion that she knew would have some kind of effect on her, and then throughout the rest of the film moans like, oh, it's not me fault. I take no responsibility. Ah, right, well, now I know how you guys feel whenever you have to listen to my voice. I just don't get this direction it takes. Like in Beauty and the Beast, the prince was turned into a beast because he was acting like one, showing no remorse for his fellow man. But here she does nothing beast-like. All we get is Merida yelling and calling her one for no reason. And in theory, should be the shortest movie ever. Hey dad, I was confronted by this lady in the forest and she gave me this thing that I watched turn my mom into a bear. Just so you know, you know, if you see a bear in this house, it's your wife and yeah, you know. 
Don't don't cut its throat off, thanks. But no, we have to run around for 15 minutes doing that dumbass misunderstanding shit where Merida waits until the very end to be like, That's your wife, you stupid prat. I'm sorry, I really hated this one. Not even the animation was all that special. I like the art style. I honestly wish we'd see more animated movies that don't just take place in America or England. Give me a big budget animated movie that takes place in Ireland, by God. But despite some nice set design and a good score, I thought a lot of the scenes were so dark that I could barely tell what was going on at times. Especially around the end in the castle scenes, it looked very bad. The best thing I can say about Brave is that when I looked at the Wikipedia page, I realized someone had edited the entire thing to be spelt like how a Scottish person pronounces things. That, that's more entertaining to me than anything in the movie. Brave sucks, full stop. Unlikable characters, a boring story, and full of shitty tropes I was glad Disney had forgotten about. It's going under Bambi but above Peter Pan. Dude, you have no idea how hyped 10 year old me was for Wreck-It Ralph. I think this was the first movie ever that I followed the development of. You know, as a kid with no internet, all I was able to do was see a trailer when it came on the TV and be like, oh, I want to see that when it comes out. But with Wreck-It Ralph, I saw the trailer on YouTube and was like, I must be like one of the only people who knows about this movie's existence. I gotta tell people. Yes, it was because Sonic was in it. Using the modern Sonic design though, when Sonic the Fighters is used to represent him, which is a game that uses the classic Sonic design, is gonna dock you a couple of points, however. Sorry, I don't make the rules, Disney. Wrecker Ralph is a story about a video game bad guy from a Donkey Kong clone. After feeling like he's not been respected for 30 years because of his role as a bad guy, Ralph sets out in seek of a medal that proves he's capable of being a hero, but in turn runs into this little girl from a Mario Kart clone who is in the same position as him, so he reluctantly decides to help her in order to get it. I still love this movie. I think the strongest thing about it is definitely the relationship between Ralph and Vanellope. Sure, it has that same old learn to love each other kind of thing, but I don't know, I think it works very well here, due to that mutual understanding with the two of them being in the same place. Makes you feel bad for both of them, and in turn wants you to see Vanellope succeed, because if she does, then that also means that Ralph inadvertently succeeds. And that breakup scene was done really, really well. The voice actors really give it their all in that part. Their characters just work super well off each other. John C. Riley and Sarah Silverman really were the perfect choices to portray these guys. I absolutely love Ralph's realization at the end, where he puts everything aside and decides to go and see Vanellope at the last minute, the part where the villain drops him to his death and he accepts it, giving the speech that we saw at the start of the movie. As a kid, I was genuinely so close to crying. I really thought he was gonna die. I want that though, that, that emotion. Ralph is such a brilliant character. And that last scene of him reflecting on his adventure with that fucking amazing line. Because if that little kid likes me, How bad can I be? Oh, I fucking love it. Speaking of the villain, Disney were really starting to love their twist villains around this time. And despite how heated the trope has become, I think they pull it off perfectly in this one. They set it up with a throwaway line in the first scene, hit you with the seemingly pointless exposition midway through, and bang, pay off at the end. Makes complete sense and surprises the audience, I love it. I don't know, I feel like I don't have much to say here because I'd rather people just go out and watch the movie for themselves, it's so good. I guess I can comment on the animation. They're continuing to evolve the style that was already great and tangled, it's amazing. The humans are way more stylized, meaning their expressions can be pushed a lot more. They do a great job, particularly with Ralph and Fixit Felix, they're very expressive. They also do a good job at blending a lot of different video game styles into one cohesive art style. I guess in some ways it could have been cool for each video game to have its own art style, so them coming together in this big hub world could have had more of a wow factor, like whoa look at all these clashing visuals, but it probably would have been too distracting for the viewer. It's a very colorful movie too. The colors pop so much, especially in locations like Sugar Rush and in the Fix-It Felix game. I guess it's just so cool how artificial everything looks. Reminds me of Toy Story in some ways. Strangely enough, this feels more like a Pixar movie, while Brave is something more akin to what Disney would do. Weird. Also, they got fucking Firefly Isle City to do the ending theme for this movie. It slaps so fucking hard, go listen to it right now. Wreck-It Ralph is amazing. Call it nostalgia, or that I only like it because it panders to me, but I don't care. I'm allowed to gush about something every once in a while. Wrecker Ralph is going under Beauty and the Beast, but above up. Imagine now if we could just get both Disney and Pixar releasing high quality movies at the same time instead of only one or the other. I can only dream. Oh boy, a pointless sequel to Monsters Inc, just what I wanted. This one is already miles more interesting than some of the others by not just being a sequel, but a prequel movie that follows Mike and Sully when they were younger. That's pretty cool. But despite not being held in a very high regard, I gotta say, 
I really, really love Monsters University. Mike has been working his whole life towards getting into the SCAR program at Monsters University, so he can eventually become a scarer for Monsters Inc. This is until his dreams are destroyed after clashing with another kid in the program, Sully, which causes them to both get kicked out. So to prove himself as a proper scarer, Mike gets a team of underdogs together in an attempt to win the campus's SCAR games, which will allow them all a place back in the program. This plot is generic as fuck and I love it. College settings are great, I wish more cartoons would take place in them. I've seen some people say this plot is tropey and yeah, they're right, but I don't care in the slightest because of the characters. You know you have a good set of characters if you can put them in any scenario and they still remain entertaining, and that reigns true for Mike and Sully. It's cool seeing them meet each other for the first time. From how great their dynamic was in the first film, you'd think they were always best friends, so it's interesting to see how they were rivals for a while. The first Monsters Inc. movie was definitely more so focused on Sully out of the two. Mike was clearly more of a sidekick than anything else. So I do appreciate that for this one, it's Mike's movie. We're seeing things from his perspective for the most part. We get to see how hopelessly optimistic he is, thinking his plans are foolproof and that just because he's studied enough means they're going to accomplish their goal. Then we switch to another character's point of view and see just how wrong he really is. That's the best thing about this movie that will keep me coming back to it, Mike's arc. Mike's arc is so fucking depressing and completely steps all over the message of other films such as Ratatouille. No, not anyone can fucking cook. Some people just simply can't and they're gonna have to deal with that reality. But despite being way more depressing and realistic, I think the message of Monsters Inc. managed to be 10 times more uplifting and inspiring. So Mike finds out that Sully cheated on the final event of the Scar games. Sully knew that Mike wasn't scary and so he fixed the machine so that it would find him scary no matter what. This causes Mike to have his big moment. He takes over a door, heads on over to the human world, and gets ready to scare a kid. But they don't scream. They aren't scared of him in the slightest. And when Sully follows him and finds Mike out by the water, we get one of the best scenes of any Pixar movie in my opinion. Mike talks about his aspirations, how desperately he wanted to be a scarer, and how he thought that just wanting it enough would let him get there. And Sully doesn't sugarcoat it to him. He tells him to his face that he isn't scary, not at all, but lets him know that he isn't the only one with issues or things that hold them back. And when Sully says this fucking line, it gets me every time. How come you never told me that before? We weren't friends before. And then, fucking geniusly, Mike devises this plan where they're gonna get Sully to scare a bunch of adults to open the doors back up. So we see from this point, he finally realizes that throughout the film, he was a pretty good leader. He planned things out extremely well. Even though Mike and Sully do get expelled by the end of the movie, they don't give up hope. Another great message for the young viewers from the first movie, that may be around college age by the time this one came out, that you don't need to go to university to get the job that you want. They both work hard, start at the very bottom, and manage to work themselves up, and Mike finally ends the movie working at Monsters Inc. Not as the scare he wanted to be, but he was able to realize his potential, and that there are multiple other options out there for him. And that's why I like this movie so much. It all holds together on that message, an extremely important message for kids to know. No, you're not going to be able to do exactly what you want, but that doesn't mean there aren't other options for you. Anyways, I'm sorry, I know I focused on that aspect for majority of the review, it, it really is just the best thing about the film. When it's not focused on that, it's your standard college movie just in a monster world. But hey, I like college movies, so that was fine by me. It's also got a great score, random to bring up, but they brought back the same kind of style as the first, but they fused it with that generic college football music and I really love it. They also part alongside the 2D visuals that they had at the start of the first one too, it, it looks really good. Monsters University is not one of Pixar's best films. The trophy plot might turn quite a few people away, but I think by doing that you're ignoring that this plot is done in favour of a very well done message that I love a lot. And for all that, Monsters University is going under Fox and the Hound, but above Meet the Robinsons. And that's 60. Excellent. Another mixed bag. It's weird to see how much Pixar are flip-flopping in terms of quality, but it's good to see that Disney have finally gotten on the right track. I wonder what we have next. Oh fuck, we're here. Like the biggest movie Disney has ever made. Frozen. This film was fucking everywhere for like two years back when it came out, you could not avoid it. And so as a natural response, I actively tried to avoid it. For as long as I could anyway. And I'd managed to successfully do that until today. So just how I was Frozen. Is it really deserving of the official label of greatest movie of all the time? Meh. Elsa and Anna are two sisters. Elsa has ice powers for some reason, and their parents leave at some point and are then killed, causing the two of them to slowly drift apart, as Elsa no longer wants to be seen in public because they might be freaked out at her. 
Then one day, Elsa goes in public and everyone is freaked out at her. So she covers the land in ice and runs away to an ice palace. So Anna, this guy she meets called Kristoff, his dear Sven, and their snowman Olaf must go and convince her to turn off the snow. But she won't because the snow doesn't bother her anyway. Where do I start? Uh... <sighs> Okay, I guess I'll start with the fact that this movie is incredibly fucking obnoxious. At this point, Disney were really getting sick and tired of people calling out their formulas, and so as a response, they wanted to avoid doing them all here. So their way of avoiding them is by actually doing the trope, then stopping to go, Wait a minute here, guys. Doesn't this seem like kind of a weird thing to do? Does this not make any sense? This is most apparent with the shitty, awful fucking twist villain. Seriously, stop it. I'm sick of twist villains. This time the villain is... Wait a minute. The prince is the villain? Disney's really breaking new grinds here. This definitely isn't something they already did back in 1991. At least in Beauty and the Beast, it made sense why he was the villain. He doesn't have a sudden turnaround. You can see him coming from a mile away. He's just bad from the start. So Anna meets this prince, and because it's a Disney movie, they want to get married after only one day of meeting each other. And throughout the whole movie, each character has to go, Wait a second. You are marrying someone after one day? That does not seem like a smart decision. We are so clever and subversive. Then Anna is about to die and needs true love's kiss and the prince is like, Fuck you cunt, I'm a bad guy now. When you die, I'm gonna take the land. Then he walks out of the room, but it's like, Just, just stay in there with her until she dies. Why are you leaving? You're asking for someone to come in and save her. Better yet, why did he even need to announce his plans to her? If he had just kept his facade up and married her, he would have been king. Like, like what the fuck? Don't worry though, Disney, I understand. Being subversive is way more important than being competent. The only characters I like here are Kristoff because he's a sane human being, and Elsa's arc of letting people in is well done. It makes sense why she'd be so hesitant because her parents tried to shut her out from the real world. I liked all that stuff. What I also liked was the music. Is it like the most amazing music ever in a Disney movie? Not in the slightest. But for what it is, I enjoy a majority of the songs. Funnily enough, Let It Go was the one I enjoyed the least. There was no build-up to it at all. I had always assumed it was near the end of the movie, but instead it's slapped dab in the middle and feels so out of place. The song is about her acting all confident and proud of her powers, but the next time Anna meets her, she's being a big ol' shut-in again. The pacing overall isn't great. A majority of the film was pretty uneventful and boring. They spend way too long setting up the plot and not enough time in the actual adventure part. They meet Elsa really early on. I don't know. I can't truly say that I hated Frozen. I wasn't pulling my hair out or begging for the experience to end. But mostly I was just unengaged and just felt like the film was going through the motions. The only times it ever really brought anything out of me was the few pleasant songs, and getting annoyed every time they wanted to be tongue-in-cheek. Enchanted already did the subversive thing perfectly! There's no point in trying anymore, Disney! I would say check out Frozen if you hadn't already, but I realize now I'm like 8 years late to this so you probably already have. I'm gonna be putting it above Robin Hood, but under The Great Mice Detective. It was decent. Now, Big Hero 6 is one that I actually did see in cinemas, and I recall having no opinion on it. Didn't really leave much of an impression on me. But was that just because of 12-year-old me being too much of a cynical asshole? Or is the film really that mediocre? Big Hero 6 stars Hero, a young inventor who's starting to go down a bad path by using his skills in robotics for illegal activities. This is until his brother takes him to the school he goes to, which blows him away and inspires him to want to go there too. However, on the big day where he shows off his invention, a fire causes the building to explode with his brother in it, killing him. Hero then later comes across his brother's old project, Bemax, a helper robot, who he then takes with him to try and solve the mystery behind this masked figure, becoming superheroes in the process with his classmates. First of all, I feel like they could have completely dropped the opening of the film. They spend so much time establishing Hero as this young delinquent who needs to be set in the right path, but it never comes back again. I know that his illegal fighting robot led to the inspiration for his invention, but I feel it could have gotten to that point another way, because it just comes off like it was a reason for Hero needing to look up to his brother. I guess I wouldn't have minded if it ever came back up again. Like maybe when Hero first meets Bamax or at some second act low point, Hero starts to go back down that life of crime again, and maybe uses Bamax as his new fighting robot. Like that seemed obvious to me, but no, they never do it. I suppose this all just comes down to me being confused on Hero as a character. I don't really know what his goal is, he's way too easily swayed in different directions. At first he seems obsessed with money, he doesn't really care if he's doing illegal stuff, he just wants money. Then after one single visit to his brother's school, he's obsessed with wanting to go there. Then after his brother dies, he doesn't really have any sort of aim, just sort of becomes a superhero because why not? Again, I feel like it should have been way more focused on his loss, him having to go down a bad path before remembering what his brother expected of him, and he sort of takes over his brother's role at the school. But I get it, superheroes were becoming extremely popular and marketable around this time, you gotta do it. I also don't buy the relationship between Hero and his brother's classmates. 
Again, Hiro just visited his brother's school for the first time and was only introduced to these guys days ago. I'd get why they'd want to make sure he's alright after his brother's death and all, but I don't buy that they'd become good friends after that. They have no mutual interests or chemistry at all. They're all pretty boring together. It has that issue where there's so many new characters to be introduced that none of them really get all that developed, so they don't go much beyond their one-note personality types. One of them is very smart and wears glasses. One is more arrogant and edgy. Then we have the coward one. And then there's the cool slacker guy who's obsessed with superheroes. What a unique band of characters. This definitely seems like the sort of thing that would have been improved by making this a TV show and not a movie. I've never seen the animated series before, actually. If you have, let me know if these guys become any more interesting. The worst aspect of this movie is definitely the villain, though. You know what I miss? When a Disney movie could just have a villain at the start, it gives us an hour and a half to get to know them, watch them devise their plans, maybe sing a song about it, interact with the hero, really build that connection. What if we just have a faceless foe where for the first hour and a half they're completely devoid of personality, so that at the end we can go, <gasps> Old man Jenkins, it was you all along! Yeah, I mean, that's just as good. So it turns out that the villain is... The school teacher who was also the guy responsible for blowing up the building that killed Hero's brother. But like, the teacher liked his brother. Does he at least show any sort of remorse for what he did? He went in there to save you! That was his mistake! Oh, of course not, he's just a one-note bad guy now. This guy's plan isn't even terrible. This scientist company got his daughter trapped in an alternate dimension, so he wants to use Hero's little robot ship things to bring her back. You could so easily make this guy sympathetic, but no, he's just a villain, he's gotta be a cunt. The only real plus I have about this movie is the aesthetics. I like the idea of fusing Tokyo and San Francisco, it creates a cool environment. But that does not make up for this plot at all. I was enjoying Big Hero 6 at first, but when his brother dies, the competence goes with him. It just turns into a boring, generic superhero plot. I enjoyed this way less than I remembered. Meh. It's gonna go under a bug's life, but above 101 Dalmatians. Inside Out is a movie that people either really seem to love, or really seem to hate. And sadly, I lean more towards that negative side. And it's weird, because I think all the pieces are there to make a good and compelling story. But this movie really feels at the world building, and setting up the rules, and that's what I think brings it down. So inside everyone's head is a small little world, with a bunch of islands representing different parts of you, such as your family, friends, special interests, etc. And at the very top of this world are the emotions, who are able to cause their human to switch between each feeling. Joy, sadness, disgust, anger, and fear. After moving to a new town, a young girl called Riley's emotions start to become out of whack, as they struggle to cope with this new change which results in joy and sadness clashing, and sending them out of the tower they stay at. So now they must try and make their way back, while Riley must now deal with our two of her most important emotions. First of all, I want to mention something extremely nitpicky. I'm aware this doesn't matter at all, but we end up saying that everyone in the world works the same way and has the same set of emotions in their own head. But like, when it's the mum's emotions, they all have her hair and glasses, or when it's the dad, they all have mustaches. How come Riley's don't have anything that reflects her, and only has the base marketable ones? What isn't a nitpick, however, is that even when they're in the mum or the dad, the different emotions all still act like that character. The dad's emotions all like sports and act the same, same with the mums. But it's confusing because the emotions in Riley's come off more like they're piloting a mech, rather than being a part of her. They always speak of her in the third person, and can influence her actions on a whim, which makes Riley come off like a robot. I can't get attached to Riley, or care about what she's going through, because she doesn't act anything like a real person. Riley has no personality. Yes, exactly, thank you. But when there's a scene where Riley is on the top of a stairway, gets excited to slide down it, then starts to get all sad and walks down them instead, then halfway down realizes, no wait, I do want to slide down it, then gets all happy again, like, <laughs> am I to take this seriously? If you ignore all the human stuff and treat the movie just as an adventure between sadness and joy, that's where it picks up a lot in my opinion. They definitely weren't as stereotypical as I thought they were going to be, for characters literally called Joy and Sadness. The film teaches a pretty important lesson too, with Joy never wanting Riley to experience sadness, which grew as an animosity towards her, with her then needing to realize that being sad is important and you just have to process it. I wish they spent more time focusing on the fact that Riley was losing all of her islands, which caused her to be emotionless and depressed. They don't explore that nearly as much as I would have liked, she just gets in the bus that decides she no longer wants to be on the bus. And by, she decides, I of course mean she was controlled to no longer want to be in the bus by her feelings. The big thing I got it inside out was the visuals. The world that set up inside her head was really cool looking. I liked the seemingly endless library of memories, the different islands representing Riley, and when they decided to change the animation style where it got all abstract, it was real cool. 
I'm realizing now I completely forgot to mention the imaginary friend character whom joins joy and sadness on their adventure. I think the filmmakers expected me to care that he died, but again, I forgot he was even there to begin with. Despite my thoughts on it, I can definitely see why people like Inside Out. It's a fairly solid film with some likable characters and a fun adventure. I can see why this would appeal to a much younger audience, like this is a fantastic kids movie. But my nitpicking brain just can't help but have a field day with this one, with how many random rules they set up making absolutely no sense. But the movie is good and entertaining if you don't care about Riley and don't give a shit about the logic. So if you can look past that, then go ahead and check it out. I didn't think Inside Out was amazing, but I also didn't think it was terrible. And for that, it's going to go in the very middle of my list. It's going right above Frozen, but under The Great Mouse Detective. And thankfully, Pixar decided to grace us with two movies this year. Let's see if the next manages to be any better or worse. Oh boy, the good dinosaur. Glad to see that one dinosaur movie wasn't enough. And as an even better sign, this is like Pixar's least popular movie ever. Not just financially, but also critically. People hate this movie. Which sucks, because when the first trailer came out, this looked like it was going to be one of the most dark and serious movies yet. Then we saw the actual thing and saw what's basically a fucking tech demo for their environments. The good dinosaur stars Arlo, this cowardly dino who lives on a farm with his family. On one of their stone wall thingies, they have this footmark thing of Arlo's mother and father, with the promise that he and his siblings will one day be able to put theirs there if they are able to prove themselves. Oh boy, just like Brother Burr. After a thunderstorm kills Arlo's father, and Arlo himself gets whisked away by the river, he must now try and find his way home, with his only accompaniment being this young caveman boy. It's so fucking boring. This entire movie feels like a test, like they put no effort into the story, no effort into the characters, all they wanted to do was prove that they were capable of making realistic landscapes in CGI. That's it. And don't get me wrong, the landscapes are stunning, they are the only positive thing about it, but that also means it causes the movie to have no style whatsoever, because all it's trying to do is look like real life. And then they pair these super realistic backgrounds up against goofy ass wide eyed dinosaur designs, it doesn't fit in the slightest, it's uncanny. Arlo's design is so bad, he looks like Yoshi but remove all of the charm. I hate his wrinkly knees and his legs look like they could snap in half just by looking at him the wrong way. His voice also really gets on my nerves, I can't stand it. I can't stand any of these characters. I don't care that his dad dies, his dad was a cunt, his siblings were cunts, this little kid is a cunt. They want the movie to have this vibe of a man and his dog, except the dog is a man and the man is a dino, but I don't care, I don't like these people. So much of this film is silence, just Arlo setting up camper trying to make his way home. They clearly wanted to go for something a lot more atmospheric here. Again, adding to my theory that this was all just one big way of stroking their dicks about the visuals, but when I don't care about any of these guys, it just makes me so incredibly bored. I'm not wasting any more time in The Good Dinosaur. It doesn't deserve it. This is the second worst thing on my list, going right above... Well, well Dinosaur. The Good Dinosaur. More like... The Not-So-Good Dinosaur. Good night, everybody. Zootopia. Disney sure did enjoy pandering to the furries with this one. I mean, we got the nudist segment to them literally using the word anthropomorphic in the trailer. It was obvious Disney knew who they were marketing this one to. Not to me, though. As a kid, I find the advertising to Zootopia very obnoxious. Or as it's known where I live, Zootropolis. Yeah, I think there was like a zoo or something called Zootopia over here, so they had to redub the entire movie with the new name. But this was around the stage where I was really getting fed up with films marketing themselves with memes and pop culture and, whoa, smartphones, Snapchat, Instagram, MySpace. It, it put me off of it, and I have successfully avoided the movie. Until today. It was good. Not amazing. Honestly, I think the hype around Zootopia is a little overblown at times, but for what it is, I had a nice time watching it for the most part. Zootopia stars Judy Hopps a bunny who wishes to one day become a police officer, which she is continuously mocked for and told that bunnies can't be part of the police, because of preconceived notions about what a police officer should be. When she does finally become one, however, she comes across this sly fox called Nick Wilde, who she then blackmails into helping her with this big case that if she solves, will give people a reason to finally respect her. The world building in this movie is very strong. The town of Zootopia is just begging for a TV show to be made about it. It's so vast and diverse. I honestly wish we got to see more of it in the movie, like the desert place, we never went there. But they do a great job at establishing that this is a perfect place on the outside, where Predator and Prey live in harmony. But the more of it you get to see, the more you realize that isn't exactly the case. Judy and Nick's relationship is also very well done, I like him a lot. Their rivalry at first doesn't seem like pure hatred, it's very obviously just tongue-in-cheek remarks made towards each other. 
or Nick purposefully trying to waste her time so they don't get to continue the search. And the way it develops into genuine friendship feels very naturally done. The scene where Nick explains to her about how when he was a kid he was treated different from being a predator, and even then, the confrontation where we see that Judy herself has some prejudice towards him because of that, was a great piece of drama that landed itself towards the later half of the movie. The only aspect where I feel it falls apart is that this is very clearly a not very subtle parallel to racism in the real world. For the most part, it's done alright. But the section of the film where Judy is looking around the town and noticing that people are treating predators differently and are acting scared of them isn't really as powerful or deep as they wanted it to be, because everything seemed fine up until she herself warned the public that predators have been having seemingly random mood swings and are reverting back into a more primal form, and have attempted literal murder. Yeah, I mean, if I were pride, I'd probably be a bit concerned too. But that's not the biggest problem with the movie. The biggest problem is clearly... the smartphone jokes. <laughs> nah, I'm joking, but they really are fucking annoying, though. They just date the film and comes off like they're trying to pander to kids and teens way too hard. But no, the biggest problem with this film is the villain. For the most part, they have a pretty solid mystery going on. The side characters we meet are all fun and progress the plot well, but the actual payoff is so shit. It was the mayor's secretary who had a grand total of one minute of screen time. The butler did it, basically. This just comes off like the writers wanted to have some big surprise for the audience, but didn't realize they had done nothing at all to hint in the movie that she would be the villain. So there's two levels to being subversive. Doing something the audience doesn't expect, but still doing something that the audience is satisfied with. And Zootopia was only capable of doing one. Otherwise, Zootopia is a pretty good movie. The ending is very quick, so for the most part it doesn't drag it down too much. I still get enough out of the character interactions to recommend checking it out. That is, if you can ignore a shitty, rushed conclusion and obnoxious humor. Zootopia is going right under Tangled, but above Toy Story 3. Did Finding Nemo really need a sequel? Never mind a sequel. Did Finding Nemo really need a sequel that focused on Dory, the one-note comic relief sidekick from the first? I'm, I'm having flashbacks to the Cars 2, and that's not a good sign. I mean, I could stop here. Really, that's all it is. Take everything I said about Cars 2 and just apply it to this one, they're both just fundamentally flawed. Well, despite most universally agreeing Cars 2 is a shit movie, there's actually a surprising amount of people who love Finding Dory and find it to be quite a heart-wrenching film. Let me tell you why they're wrong. Just kidding. Mostly. Finding Dory tells us the much-anticipated origin story of the fan-favorite character. We see that she lost her parents at a young age, and because of her memory loss, eventually forgot that she was even looking for them. And so one day, while out with Nemo and Marlin after the events of the first movie, we see her suddenly remember and set out in a hunt for them, with Marlin and Nemo following suit. Everything they avoided doing with Dory in the first movie, they fall right into with this one. That being making her annoying. Just by proxy of being the center of every single scene, she is way more likely to get on my nerves. I really hated her here. First of all, I really can't stand when a movie desperately tries to go for that cute factor just like Bolt did. And they think that to make Dory all the more sympathetic as a kid, all they gotta do is make her all tiny and give her bulgy eyes and a big wide smile. Aww, she's so cute. Oh no, I hope she gets her family back. They also really wanna ram in her, whoa, oh, I forget things. <laughs> so the audience understands for the rest of the film. But because of this, it causes everything to get so repetitive, every single scene is structured around her forgetting something, and I, I'm sorry, I just don't care. From here on out, it mostly follows the same structure as the first movie. The characters go from set piece to set piece trying to find the respective thing they're looking for, meeting marketable side characters along the way. I do appreciate, however, that this one spends way more time outside of the water, with the latter half being inside an aquarium. It's a nice change of pace. Seriously though, this movie just feels like they wanted to have everything. They couldn't pick one story and stick to it, so they had to go for it all, and because of that it feels like this shit is going on forever. You have no idea how unbelievably baffled I got when I thought we were getting near the conclusion, and looked at the timestamp to see that we were only one hour in and had 50 more left to go. I seriously contemplated just turning it off then and there. But nope. I stuck it through to the end, and you know what? I'm glad I did, because it proved to me 100% that they had no idea what they wanted to do for this. I had two predictions going into Finding Dory. Prediction 1. Dory will find her parents and be reunited with them, however there will be some twist where she gets separated again, or they die, or she can't stay with them so it's bittersweet. Or prediction 2, she doesn't find her parents, she doesn't reunite with them, but as a sweet gesture Nemo and Marlin comfort Dory by telling her that she does indeed have a family, that they're her family and will always care about her, so it's bittersweet. I could have never predicted that the filmmakers would go for both of these endings, and then some. 
So not only does Dory meet her parents, not only do we still get the scene where Nemo and Marlin tell her that to them she is also family, but she also gets to keep and stay with her mom and dad. Nothing bad happens, she gets everything, every possible ending. The conclusion of this film is atrocious, it is one of the most pointless, tedious action fests I've ever seen. I wanted to bash my fucking head and it was getting so repetitive. They just keep flip-flopping back and forward between the same plot points. Wait a second, my parents aren't in the truck, I'll go into the ocean. Oh no, Nemo and Marlin are stuck in the truck, I need to go rescue them. Dory gets in the truck and gives her a little speech. Whoa no, Nemo and Marlin managed to escape and are now in the water, but now Dory is stuck in the truck, we gotta go back and rescue her now. Like just fucking end it at some point, Jesus Christ I get it, you want the illusion of stakes. I'm done, I fucking hated finding Dory. Pixar were known and got popular for their innovation, what the fuck is happening here? Now all we're getting is shitty attempts at what Disney can do better and soulless sequels. Let's hope that changes. I say as I shed a tear because I've already looked at the list and know we still have like four more fucking sequels to go. Finding Dory is going under Brother Bear but above Cars 2. Again, this was around the time I didn't really watch cartoons or anything animated. I was way too occupied in my fees of watching epic teen sitcoms such as iCarly or Victorious. So I never saw Moana. All I ever knew about it was that it starred Dwayne The Rock Johnson and that's about it. I was initially a little worried going into it. Like this is another Disney princess movie, right? I surely hope they took some notes from Pixar on how not to do one for the modern day. Moana stars Moana. I gotta stop doing that. <laughs> she wants more freedom and to leave for adventure which is against her father's wishes that she must stay and be a ruler. <sighs> okay, to be fair, they don't exactly do the trope. There's no love interest to be seen, thankfully. And I do like how naturally they show her interest in the water and exploring the ocean. Like it's shown as something she was obsessed with as a kid, but eventually did start to lean more into becoming the ruler her father wants her to be. She wasn't all pissy like Merida. She did it just fine and enjoyed doing it and is then able to leave on a boat to get more supplies for her island, or else they'll be in danger. Which is more so an excuse for her to finally get off the place, like it's a little bit deeper. Okay, so there's this island that has a power source of a little green rock in it, and one day a god with a magic staff called Maui comes in to steal it, which kills the island and he gets supposedly taken out in the process. This is until Moana eventually runs into him, and because of Maui being extremely egotistical and full of himself, he sets out with Moana to get the stone back, so they can see of the island and he can once again be seen as a hero. I like how the two of them work off each other. Moana herself isn't all that interesting of a character, she's just your standard fare. But when paired up with Maui, they can be quite fun together. Maui is super powerful and he knows it, that's what's so fun about him. The Rock does an amazing performance as him, it's perfect. His song just so amazingly encapsulates his personality, I love it. He's just constantly pulling the DreamWorks face at any given time. All the music here is great. I also enjoyed Moana's I Want song, it was very catchy. Okay, I lied, all the music is great except for one. So for the most part, the film follows your standard adventure movie formula. Go from location to location, meeting new friends, new enemies, learning more about the world, butting heads with each other and eventually making up, yeah. All that is fine and dandy, except for one fucking random scene that completely comes out of nowhere. And no, I'm not saying that as a positive. So Moana and Maui go into this like, underworld place, I think, where they meet this random giant crab called Tam Tamatoa, Tamatoa, who is covered in gold and shiny objects and sings a big whole drawn out song about how shiny he is. It sucked. The song sucked. The character design is awful in my opinion, and it just ruined the good pacing of the film and managed to keep up at that point. No, I'm not gonna mention it. I mean, hey, at least the visuals look good. Movie looks wonderful as a whole. I heard that they wanted to give the water such a distinct personality in the film that they had to end up giving it its own rigged character model, and it paid off because this is some of the best looking water in an animated movie. I also really loved the aforementioned neon visuals in the crab scene, they were dope. I always appreciate it when a film goes for a stylistic change. And I also enjoyed the integration of 2D animation, like during Maui's song. My biggest issue comes down to the character design. It feels like Disney is so preoccupied with making all the characters look perfect and marketable that they forgot to actually make them look somewhat realistic. Nobody looks like an actual person here, it's too unrelatable. None of the men have any sort of body hair, everyone has completely smooth glossy skin. Just look at Moana's grandmother, like what the fuck, she should be way more wrinkly. She dies pretty early on despite looking like she was in perfect health. And finally, I had one complaint with the story. Not so much of a complaint, just something that they should have expounded upon. So naturally they have to do that whole breakup thing where Moano and Maui aren't really friends for a little bit, before Maui comes back to see if the day when all seems hopeless. 
but we never actually get a scene showing Maui's realization that he wants to come back. He just fucks off for five minutes, then returns. I hate that in movies. I can understand it in a TV show, where there maybe isn't a lot of time to develop characters in such a short runtime, although there are some pretty abysmal examples of this. This is awful. Ida wouldn't be in this situation if it weren't for me. Maybe it would be better if I never came here. I can't change the past. But this is a two-hour movie. I could think of a couple parts that could have been cut in favor of a stronger narrative. Even still, I thoroughly enjoyed Moana, it was very good. I think I still like Tangled more for the better characters, but I'd still recommend checking this one out. Moana is going right under Zootopia, but above Toy Story 3. <laughs> Fuck. Really? Was two not enough? I remember everyone being blown away by the trailer for Cars 3. Wow, this looks like the most serious Pixar movie yet. What the frick happened to Lightning? I wanna know. I wanna know so fucking bad. I just can't do it. I can't take this shit no more, man. Then the film came out and nobody watched it. Including me, I did not give a single shit. But after seeing it now, was I missing anything amazing? No. I desperately wanted to like Cars 3, but it is a slog. Definitely nowhere near as bad as the second one, but still such a pointless movie. First of all, let me address that they completely avoid the existence of the second movie in this one. It is never acknowledged. They act like this is a direct sequel to the first one. Not only that, but Meter himself is barely in it. I can recall maybe three scenes where he had actual speaking roles. I was shocked. It's like they wanted to make up for the second one. But the thing is, removing Meter doesn't automatically make a good movie. Because instead, he is replaced with the most bland set of characters around. Cars 3 picks up where the first movie left off. Lightning is a star racer, winning cups all over the world while keeping his ego in check. This is until one day when a new car comes onto the scene, made from new technology and trained on state-of-the-art hardware. He's simply just better than Lightning, and with more coming onto the track, he slowly becomes a joke. This is until Lightning has a slip-up during a race and crashes, causing him to take time off to heal. So the movie is basically just him training back up again to finally take on the new, advanced racers. Yeah, so the whole plot of this movie revolves around a training montage, except it's been extended for two hours. Love it. The only aspect of this story that I like is how at the very least it feels like a sequel. They go more into Doc from the first movie and his big wreck that cost him his career, and how Lightning doesn't want that same thing to happen to him. Oh yeah, that's right, Doc died in the last movie? They, they kind of brushed over that. Just like the second one, however, they completely removed the side characters from the equation here. They are barely in it at all beyond the 30 minute mark. The focus is all on this new car girl who's helping Tree and Lightning. Get this, she's a car trainer, but she doesn't know how to drive on a road, what oh It becomes fairly obvious from this point on they'll be going for a whole cycle thing, where Lightning decides that he wants to be the coach for this new girl, mirroring Doc's career. Only issue is the plot remains on the part of McQueen training to do the race up until the last 10 fucking minutes. Lightning goes through so much shit, so much training, and then after he starts the big race we've watched him prepare two hours for, he does a couple laps then goes, wait a second, yellow girl, you've got to be the one to do the race. I can't do the Owen Wilson voice, he goes, wow, that's, that's what he does. It's the first movie's ending all over again. I get the impact of this, I get narratively why they're doing it, but fuck off, this is the big payoff. I want to see Lightning do the race, not this bitch. It's not satisfying in the slightest. Of course she ends up winning her first race despite barely knowing how to drive before. Glad to see they decided to ditch that whole plot point of Lightning being able to beat him as long as he acted smarter than them. Gotta set up this new character so the kiddies wanna buy a toy of her. I can't even see kids being interested though, this movie is so fucking boring. Scenes drag on and on forever, I could not give a shit. The only saving grace is that I can at least look at the pretty visuals and good animation. But I don't even wanna give the movie that much credit. Your movie can look as realistic as you want. But if your only goal in mind is making an environment that looks as real as possible, then I don't give a shit, I'm sorry. It's not impressive anymore. Any studio can make a realistic setting. What I want to see from these movies are unique and distinct art styles that take advantage of the fact that it's a cartoon. I'll take that over boasting how many individual blades of grass you're able to fit on screen. I mean, shit on DreamWorks and Illumination all you want, but at the very least their movies look exaggerated and cartoony. Cars 3 is shit. It's nowhere near on the level of terrible it is Cars 2, but in some ways I think that's worse, because I can talk forever about why Cars 2 is a bad movie, and why each and every decision was wrong. This movie could have been good, but they couldn't give enough of a shit to make an engaging script. Cars 3 is going under Finding Dory, but above Cars 2. Thank god, Pixar have finally made another movie that isn't a sequel. I didn't know what to expect going into Coco. 
I knew nothing about it, hadn't even seen the trailer. When people brought it up to me, I'd always confused it with that other Skellington movie, Book of Life. So I am pleasantly surprised to say that I very much enjoyed it. Definitely feels like a return to form for Pixar. Miguel is a young boy living in Mexico with his family. His great-great-grandmother has a strict rule against music, as her husband walked out on her and their daughter, Coco, to pursue a career in it. This is an issue for Miguel, as he loves music, and secretly wishes to be the famous guitarist Ernesto, who Miguel believes to be his great-great-grandfather. So one night he sneaks out to take his guitar, which ends up sending him to the Land of the Dead, where the deceased are all ascending to the living world for one night only, the Day of the Dead. So now Miguel needs to find his way home, without agreeing to give up his interest in music. I like that the whole plot revolves around family, those are always some of my favourites. Being a white Irish boy, I unsurprisingly don't know a whole lot about Mexican culture, so it was genuinely interesting to see how close they hold their family together. And learning about the dead, the dead traditions with putting up family photos and such, it was cool. I love how all that stuff ties back to the story seamlessly. The concept that you only exist in the land of the dead as long as someone in the living world remembers you is a really sad one. Then the realisation that the man Miguel pals around with in the dead world is his actual great-great-grandfather, who Ernesto killed and stole his songs, is being forgotten because his daughter Coco had pretty bad dementia is awful, it's so sad. I loved all that stuff. There was so many subtle things that stuck out to me that I really enjoyed. Like how the biggest song that Ernesto stole, Remember Me, was a song that his grandfather wrote for his daughter and her alone. It was really sweet. It was also a very good touch too, how the version Ernesto sings is all big and bombastic, while the version that his grandfather sings is very quiet and mellow. Fit perfectly in showing both of their personalities. And of course it would make sense that he doesn't know the proper way to perform the song, because he never wrote it. I will say though, a big issue I have is that it all leads to a pretty generic and tropey payoff. They unironically do that thing where the villain is announcing their plans and the characters turn on a camera and microphone so the audience can hear them, like come on, that shit has been parodied to death. But in some ways I can also see why that was done, since it fits into that whole idea that he wants desperately to be loved. So the worst fate he can have is people seeing him for what he really is. In general though, I wasn't a big fan of the villain, and that's because he shouldn't have really been a villain. He stole the songs and didn't give credit, that should have been it. He's a bad guy, but not necessarily a bad guy. But the twist that he actually straight up murdered Miguel's great-great-grandfather was so dumb. What he did was shitty enough, why did you also need to make him a murderer? And from this point in the film, his entire character changes now, he just acts like a one-note villain. I don't know, I guess I liked him more when it was more subdued. The visuals of this movie are amazing. Does it look as realistic as Cars 3? Nope. But it stands out infinitely more because of the wonderful art direction. I'm personally not a fan of the human eyes on the Skellingtons. I think it's kind of gross. I probably would have preferred Jack Skellington eyes. But the Land of the Dead itself looks great. The oranges pop so much and the colours in this film are superb. How many people are going to get annoyed that I'm saying Skellington? I can't comment on how accurate the Mexican town is portrayed, but hey, it looked nice at the very least. At this point, I would have just said, yeah, Coco was a super solid movie. I enjoyed it quite a bit. But that ending, that fucking ending, this is how an old lady looks, Disney. They aren't all smooth and perfect like in Moana. The scene where Miguel tries to get his great-grandmother to remember her father by playing Remember Me was so fucking sad. I was so close to crying. I don't know what it is about these old ladies, man. It's just like the fox and the hound. And then in the next scene, they show that she dies. Like, what the fuck? You already made me feel sad. Why'd you have to hit me with that? But I love that too. When a movie can bring such genuine emotion out of me, that's when I know I'm watching something special. Something that feels like a lot of care and heart was put into it. I very much love Coco a lot. You shouldn't sleep on this one like I did. Go watch it. For all the tropey moments, it more than makes up for it with the more emotional family elements. Coco is going under Toy Story but above Fox and the Hound. What the fuck? Did Disney fall asleep or something? This is like the third Pixar movie in a row. And oh joy, it's another pointless sequel. This time it's for The Incredibles. If you remember the second highest movie on the list right now. Hey though. For as shitty as Finding Dory and the car sequels were, I did actually enjoy Monsters University a lot, so I'm not ready to throw away Incredibles 2 just yet. Let's see what they did. Incredibles 2 picks up right where the first left off. Like, exactly where it left off, it's the same fucking scene. After a fight in public causes them to get into deep shit, this entrepreneur and his sister devise a plan to make supers legal again, by strengthening their image with the public. Despite being eager to get back into action, they think that Bob should stay off of this one, until relations are improved, and have Elastigirl be the face of the plan. Meaning she must now go out in missions to protect the people, while Bob faces the struggle of being a parent for three kids. It's like a TV show plot. Incredibles 2 isn't better than the original, not even anywhere near the same quality. It doesn't evolve any aspect from the first film and really shouldn't have been made to begin with. But I really liked it.
I don't know why, I'm kind of stumped on this one. Because in theory, I should hear it. It has a shitty villain, it feels quite directionless at times despite needing to be two hours long for some reason. The characters come off more like stereotypes of their original selves. But I don't know. I just like the Parr family. That's genuinely it. Like I said with the first one, I could give less of a shit about the action superhero elements of those movies. I just like this family, no matter the situation. First of all, let me comment on some stuff that's really pedantic and nitpicky, but a sad causation of making a sequel 15 years after the first movie. 1. They changed Tony's design? He looked like a regular boy in the first, now he's like a Ken doll. Dumb. Bob sounds so much older compared to the first one, it gets kinda hard to watch at points. Oh, hey, Rick. Violet thinks a friend of hers, a kid named Tony, I love never seen young her in people. And 3. Stop it. N never mind, there are only two, I couldn't think of any more. The obvious thing they should have done here was to have a sequel that takes place 15 years after the events of the first. Age up the characters a bit. That way the plot has more of a reason to not be directly tied to the first one, and we also get to be reintroduced to these characters by seeing how their lives have turned out. That would have been cool. But I understand, we gotta keep them young so that they all remain marketable, especially Jack-Jack. Remember how he had like, one dedicated scene to him in the first film at the very end? Now he's the complete center of Bob's B story, oh boy. The villain here also sucks dick. Again, they go for that shitty twist villain trope, but I wouldn't have minded if they were in any sort of way tied to the story. In the first one, Syndrome was perfect because it was related to Mr. Incredible, there was a personal connection there. Here, the screen slaver is just the entrepreneur's sister who hates superheroes and wants them to be illegal because her dad died because a super didn't rescue him. Okay. But like, supers are already illegal. If you want them to remain illegal, why would you then go out of your way to help make them legal again? Only to try and ruin their image at the last minute. It makes, it makes no fucking sense. Seems like it was just done for the sake of having a twist villain. It's so weird because the more I talk about this one, the more I'm just gonna bitch about how many dumb decisions they make and how I would have preferred them do it. But when I was watching this one, it's the only time in this entire marathon where I've looked at the timestamp, saw I was only an hour in and went, Oh boy, there's still an hour left. I, I wanted to see more of it, and it all comes down to me liking these characters and watching them interact. I don't care that Bob's story revolves around him taking care of children, because I simply like Bob. I don't mind watching him do something mundane. Realistic family troubles are the shit, dog. Watching Bob and Helen have a realistic parental argument? That's what I call epic. I don't know, I'm gonna stop here because I'm quite confused myself in my opinion on this one. I guess I'll just reiterate what I said about the previous sequels. There's a difference between a good movie and a good sequel. Incredibles 2 is a fucking terrible sequel, but as a standalone movie, I gotta say, I really liked it. It's going above Finding Nemo, but under Little Mermaid. Are you annoyed by that? Well, fuck you, it's my list. Excellent. Enter your name. And that's number 70. We're on to the final stretch now, let's hope both studios give us some heavy hitters before this ends. There is only one good thing about Ralph Brooks the internet, and that's that it proves to me that I don't just enjoy the first movie for completely shallow reasons. Because this film features just as much, if not more, Sonic, and I hate it. This movie fucking sucks. And the worst part is, Sonic was gonna have more scenes, but they cut them out of the movie. Fuck you, Disney. Take everything I enjoyed about Wreck-It Ralph and throw it out the window. That's Ralph Breaks the Internet. First of all, why can't it just take place in the arcade again? I don't know, I'm sort of of the belief that a story revolving around going inside the internet will never work. And if it does, then it'll only be because of the characters are writing, and the actual internet aspect will become incredibly dated and hard to watch. Ralph Breaks the Internet picks up not too long after the first. But oh no, Finelpi is starting to become bored of her predictable life as an arcade character, while Ralph is too preoccupied with making sure that everything stays exactly the way it is. This is until the steering wheel for her game breaks, and so the two of them need to go to eBay to get a new one before her game is unplugged. This leads into a hilarious plot where they need to raise $27,000 to pay for the wheel, and need to make Ralph an epic buzz tube star to get money, so he recreates so many popular memes such as ASMR, eating challenges, Fortnite. Okay, I, I like the Fortnite. I like Fortnite, I remember. See, the thing is, I wouldn't care about any of this. Well, okay, I would care a little bit. But I would be able to overlook it if I still liked these characters and what they go through. I don't know how it happened, but they somehow managed to make Ralph and Vanellope just as unlikable as each other here. 
Okay, so to go back to Vanellope, who only after around six months or whatever is getting bored of her arcade game. You know, the game that we spent the entirety of the last movie trying to allow her to take part in. Nah, she doesn't want it anymore. She wants to stay inside the internet now in an online racing MMO with a bunch of generic realistic characters. Whoa, radical. And then Ralph, they just make excessively needy. I get that's his whole arc here, but it's too much. First of all, Ralph is like 40 and Vanellope like 8. His obsession with her comes off a tad creepy at times. He's so fucking defensive and insecure, it makes him come off like such a whiny baby, because Vanellope isn't gonna be by his side 24-7. But at the same time, it's weird because I'm not like, Go away, Ralph! Just let Vanellope do what she wants! You need to learn that she'll be your friend, no matter where she is. Because I genuinely don't care about either of them now, I think they're both cunts. But what oh, we can't focus on making likable characters who grow through arcs that make sense. Look over here, it's Groot! You know Groot! It's the Disney princesses too! Ugh, man am I right. The princesses get Vanellope to sing her very own I Want song, and it is one of, if not the worst song ever sung in a Disney movie. The tune is bad, Sarah Silverman sounds like a cat being stepped on, and the lyrics are truly, truly dreadful. I cannot stand when a song is running so dry on lyrics that they just start naming random shit going on in the scene, and this song is nothing but that. It's so lazy. You can just think of a lazy rhyme like, uh, what well, rhymes with this? A, a, a dollar store. Storyboard artist, remember to put a dollar store in the scene so the character can point and acknowledge it. Somebody had to write this scene, storyboard it, push it through the concepting stages, model and texture a moon, and somehow this was the end result. I like how they set up an entire B story, with Felix and the girl taking care of the kids from Sugar Rush while Ralph is gone. Wow, <laughs> that sure is ripe for comedic potential. It literally never comes up again until the very last scene of the film. Ralph, this is an important mission, a noble mission! I will cover for you. Um, yeah, Felix, you want to maybe tell me how you plan to cover for Ralph? Wasn't the whole issue in the last movie that you realized without him your game would be shut down? Not gonna go into that? Okay, cool. That's what I hate about this film. It's lazy disregard for everything set up in the first. The shit all over what the characters stood for and who they were. The shit all over the rules they set up. And it's all just an excuse to put the characters in such an obnoxious, unfunny internet setting, where they go for the most bottom-of-the-barrel internet jokes. If this were the script for the Emoji Movie, everyone would have shit on it. But for some reason it's given a pass because, oh my god, Disney being self-aware to modern culture, what a gimmick! Fuck Racket Ralph, Ralph breaks the internet. All my homies hate Racket Ralph, Ralph breaks the internet. It's gonna go under Chicken Little, but above Aristocats. <music> Toy Story 4. I fucking love sequels. We're in the age of the sequel. I love it. Racket Ralph 2. Like, okay, I can understand why you'd want to do that. Cars 2. For marketing, it makes sense. But Toy Story 4. You mean the series of films that already had a definitive ending like seven years ago? I think anything they would have done for this would have failed. In terms of making a movie that feels like it needed to exist at least. I guess to start I'll talk about the good aspects of this movie. The animation. That concludes the good aspect- okay, I'm kidding. The visuals in Toy Story 4 are fucking breathtaking. The lighting is very nice, especially at the carnival. And overall, they did a fantastic job at making these scenes look realistic. Whether or not realistic was the right style for a Toy Story movie, I can't deny that it looks stellar. Like, just look at the individual dust particles here shining through the light, it's jaw-dropping how good this film looks. Toy Story 4 takes place shortly after the events of the third movie. Woody is beginning to get a little worried after Bonnie has stopped playing with him. Not even a sentence in and we've already shit over the entire ending of the last one. I want you to remember back to the ending of Toy Story 3. Andy never actually intended on giving Woody up. He only gave him to Bonnie under the promise that she would take good care of him. Eh, fuck it, just throw him in the closet. I don't know, again, it feels like this movie more than any of them had no reason to exist. And so the only way they're able to create conflict again was to take something from the third movie and turn it on its head. But that also means unwrapping the perfectly tight bow around the trilogy. This doesn't feel like any sort of proper send-off anymore. The characters aside from Woody have barely anything to do. They're rarely in it, so the ending isn't emotional in the slightest. Woody is leaving behind all his friends forever. Why didn't you make this film an adventure that all of them go through, so this feels like you're properly breaking them up? Not even Buzz feels relevant anymore. To be honest, he hasn't really had anything to do since the first film. But they've turned him into a generic dumb guy now. His entire presence in this movie revolves around one gag that isn't even funny. It's such a frustrating movie. 
So much of it is the characters almost getting to where they need to be, but something happens at the last minute that sends them back to square one. That's not intense, it's annoying. May also have something to do with the fact that Forky is a character I don't particularly care for. So whether or not he gets back home, I couldn't give less of a shit. The villain sucks so hard, too. I get they wanted to go for a bad guy that could be sympathetic, by having it be this doll who, much like all the villains in this franchise, is bad because they felt as if they were unloved by an owner. But they want to use her defect of not having a voice box as something I should feel sorry about, like, Oh, all she wanted was to be with a kid. But no, she tried to rip Woody's out of his back, that could have fucking killed him, I don't like her. I was happy when she got a voice box, sat in front of a girl she liked, and the girl went, Nah, this toy's lame, I don't want it. Good, that's what you fucking deserve! But of course she has to have a happy ending where she finds a kid who loves her. Glad to see her being such a cunt to our main character's pet off. It's at least cool getting to see Bo Peep again, but she might as well be a completely different character now, as she wants Woody to come and be a lost toy with her and forget about Bonnie. And Woody fucking goes through with it! In context of the movie, it works because they completely avoid addressing the other three, but looking at it as a whole, wasn't Woody's most likable trait his loyalty, especially towards his kids? Seems kind of strange to ditch that in favor of an idea that you only went with because it leaves audience shocked, and somewhat leaves things open for a Toy Story 5. Toy Story 4 is shit. Even if I ignored how much it ruins the perfect ending of the third movie, on its own it's just not a very good movie, with a frustrating plot and shitty characters. It's gonna go above a bug's life, but under Bolt. The more I think about this one, the more I can't stand it. Frozen 2. I saw this film in theaters when it released, you know, despite never actually seeing the first one, and I remember nothing about it. We didn't need a sequel to Frozen. Disney needed one, but the actual plot wrapped itself up quite nicely in the original. There was no potential for a sequel here at all. Frozen 2 picks up a little bit after the ending of the first one, where Elsa is starting to hear the singing voice in the distance that's calling her. So her, Anna, Kristoff, Sven, and Olaf set out on another quest to see what it is. I turned it off halfway through. I'm willing to admit it! I quickly remembered why I had no recollections of seeing this one. It's boring. First off, this plot comes off so lazily. The movie just starts with them as a kid again, and the dad has to give some exposition like, Oh, did, did you know there was this, like, other clan who lived in the woods that we never mentioned before, and they used, like, magic and shit? This is so it doesn't feel completely out of nowhere when they reintroduce this later on. But newsflash, if you have to begin the movie by establishing something that was never brought up in the first one, then guess what? It's gonna feel like it comes out of nowhere. And since this one can't rely on the plot of the sisters being separated, it means we finally get to see them interact and notice just how little chemistry they have. It was excusable in the first, considering they hadn't properly met each other in years, but what's the excuse here? They don't mesh well at all, their interactions come off so forced and stiff. They also have the same plot as the rescuers down under, where Kristoff is trying to propose to Anna but something keeps happening at the last second that prevents him from doing so. This entire film just feels like it's trying to ride off the coattails of the first, because it so desperately wants to remind you of it. They have an entire part where Olaf explains the plot of it, and even has a handful of songs that feel exactly like they're trying to replicate the success of Let It Go, but the fact that nobody remembers this movie shows that wasn't really achieved. I'm gonna stop here. I'm not going all that in-depth because, again, I stopped watching at about the 45-minute mark. You might say that's cheating, but I say it's a testament to how utterly fucking bored I was watching this. Hell, I watched the entirety of Dinosaur. I have already watched Frozen 2 once, but never again. It's gonna be going above Finding Dory but under Brother Bear. I can only see very, very little girls liking this film, and that's probably purely out of their enjoyment of the first one. <laughs> I completely avoided Onward when it released. It looked so basic and boring, and appeared like it was just trying to be the same concept as Zootopia, except with mythical creatures instead of animals. Whoa, what if, like, the wizards had the smartphones? But after watching it, what I think? Eh, I didn't love it, but I also didn't hate it as much as I thought I would. Onward stars Tom Holland as Tom Holland. He lives with his mom and brother Chris Pratt. Should have been Jack Black as their father died when Tom Holland was very young, so he never met him. On the day of his 16th birthday, he gets a gift from his dad, a magic staff that will bring him back to life for a single day to spend with his kids. But sadly, after the spell doesn't work properly, they must go on an epic quest in search of a magic crystal that will complete the transformation. First of all, this movie was a lot less obnoxious than I anticipated it being. All the trailers made it seem like the big joke they would have had was that unicorns and warlocks and pixies are all in modern times, and it's so funny watching them play with Snapchat filters and tweet about the hashtags. 
but thankfully that aspect of it never really comes up all that much. It's just the setting, and it ties itself into the plot, with this being a world where magic was forgotten. The relationship between Tom and Chris, I don't remember the names, is very well done too. This could have easily been a generic, two brothers that hate each other but learn to work together sort of thing, but no, their dynamic was really natural. I like how Chris Pratt isn't addicted to Tom Holland. He likes his brother. It's more so focused on Tom Holland being embarrassed by how centric he is and feeling like he's a screw up. I really liked the reveal where Chris finds out that Tom doesn't think very highly of him. It was good. Although I feel like the film didn't do enough to show us that he was a screw up before this point. All he really did was, again, be eccentric and play D&D, I guess. Also, the idea that one of the brothers remembers the dad while the other doesn't is a neat idea. Gives them both separate reasons for wanting to bring him back. I like the concept behind the ending, with Tom Holland giving up his chance to see the dad, so Chris can get the chance to finally say goodbye to him. Even if it easily could have been solved by him just yelling for the dad to come over, it's not like he was stuck to the hilltop or anything. Again, all the pieces are here, I just wish they were presented better. In relation to the animation, I gotta say, I really do not like the designs of these characters at all. I'm getting really sick and tired of all these movies having the same human art style. The main kid just looks like a blue linguini. And they definitely could have pushed this fantasy setting way more. Like, combining a mythical world with a modern death setting would have been so much cooler than just going with a regular human world with hints of the past. Like, how about instead of making it just another regular old high school, why not go all out and make it a big Hogwarts type of thing, you know? Either way, I'm very much mixed on Onwards. I don't think it's as bad as most other people do. But what they do have that I enjoy was pretty sloppily done, and feels like it could have been improved upon with another rewrite or two. And for that, it's gonna go under Toy Story 4, but above A Bug's Life. Soul fucking baffles me, I have no idea what to think of it. It does some stuff that I really like, but a lot of stuff that I cannot fucking stand. It confuses me. I feel like I'm missing something here because there are so many people who say this is Pixar's best movie and I'm just left there like, really? I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong on something despite popular belief. So you listen to what I have to say about Soul and let me know if I'm not understanding something here. Soul is about a jazz musician called Joe. Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. He's stuck in a part-time teaching Joe mom. He's stuck in a part-time teaching job at a school with a bunch of kids who don't give a shit. He starts to have an existential crisis when he's offered a full-time job, as he's now stuck between taking the job security while remaining unhappy, or continuing to try and achieve his dream of becoming a professional jazz musician. When he finally gets his goal 10 minutes later, and impresses this jazz lady, he falls down a manhole and dies, when he then tries to escape the afterlife, being mistaken for a trainer in the process. Meaning he must now help out this soul called 22, who believes there's nothing for them on Earth. So eventually they go to Earth together, and explore the different aspects of life that Joe may have before unappreciated. I'm kinda stuck on how to approach this one because overall the direction of the movie feels quite... directionless. They jump between different plot points and settings so much that it barely feels like the same movie at points. Like it starts with him worrying about his job, then we go to the soul dimension for a while, then we come back to the real world but Joe is now a cat and 22 is in his body. After doing that for a while we have to go back to the soul dimension, then back to the real world, then Joe magically goes back to the soul dimension again, I don't know, it just felt all over the place. The way I've described it before is that it feels like it's one of those choose your own adventure movies. Like that Netflix one where you could choose your path throughout it. Because so many random plot points just come up out of nowhere and are never acknowledged again. Like when 22 brings up this lady called Lisa, she never comes back. Whoops. You didn't choose the path where we explore that part of his life, you chose the cat path. What about the amazing villain that has a total of two minutes of screen time? She sure left an impression on me. Are you really telling me that for centuries no person in denial has ever tried to escape this death elevator thing? I wouldn't care so much about these dumb soul dimension rules, but so much of the film is focused on explaining them. Like, I think I get it. I think what they're going for is the same message as up. Life's an adventure. Joe spends the movie realizing how he was so fixated on his goal of becoming a jazz musician that he became blind to the world around him. That stuff is cool and I like that message, but I can't stand how the movie prefers to go for a more up for interpretation method of showing it. So much stuff happens that I want to see explored more, such as the barber scene, was probably my favorite part of the whole movie. He talks with the barber about his life, and he mentions about how he never really knew much about Joe because all he ever wanted to talk about was jazz. This is when Joe starts to realize now that his fixation has prevented him from making so many connections in his life. What is the payoff to this? Ending shot of Joe looking to the sky smiling. Like, I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. 
It's meant to be up for interpretation, but I always hated those endings because to me it comes off like, okay, so whatever ending you think is best in your own head, well, that, that's the one that happened. So of course you're gonna come out of it more positive. Okay, here it is. Here's my controversial opinion on how Soul should have ended. Joe should have stayed dead. It's not like he was running as his papers flew out of his hands and when he tried to grab them he got hit by a car or something. The guy died out of his own stupidity of not paying attention to where he was going. He died fair and square. Call it morbid, but I don't care. If they wanted to go with this, I actually think it would have been way more impactful if Joe died before he got to the audition, so he felt like he never got the actual chance to prove himself, and wanted to come back so he can do it. But because he already proved that he could do it by having the audition go well, they instead should have had it so that Joe gives up his ticket back to Earth so 22 can go instead, accepting that he already led his life and knows that he is capable of being a successful jazz musician, and is allowed to stay in the soul world forever as one of the new trainers. There we go, complete, satisfying ending. But no, I get it, up for interpretation is just so much better. I don't want to focus on the animation very much, because there's really nothing wrong with it. The soul world looks nice and impressive, and environments are super hyper-realistic, even if that clashes with the character design a bit. But again, our main issue with the film is that I feel like I'm missing something. I don't think I'm fully able to grasp what they're trying to go for. Again, I'm willing to admit that. I wanted to like Soul so bad, but as it is, meh, it was decent. It's gonna go above Frozen, but under Great Mice Detective. Oh wow, Ryan the Last Dragon, I forgot this one even released. I knew absolutely nothing going into this one, hadn't seen the trailer, didn't know the plot synopsis, I went in completely blind. It's shit. Like, unbelievably bad. I cannot fathom how devoid of charm and personality this film is. So there's five factions in this ancient Chinese land, each of which have a piece of this big crystal thing that keeps away these black shadow creatures. Raya is trying to retrieve and put together all the pieces because her dad was the guy who originally kept them all before this little girl backstabs Raya and alerted everyone to where they're keeping it. So with the majority of the land turned to stone, she wants to rescue them, meeting a wacky dragon on the way, who's the last of her kind voiced by rapper Aquafina. She's the best character because she has epic Instagram humor. Yo, this is like one of those school projects, but one of the kids does all the work. Isn't that relatable? Nobody in this movie talks like they're from ancient China. D nobody in this movie talks like a human, period. Namari. What's dripping, Depla? <laughs> My biggest issue with Raya and the Last Dragon is the characters. They all suck. None of them are relatable or likable or charming or have anything notable about them. By the end of their adventure, there's like five people in this little gang, but none of them are interesting. We've got the adventurous little boy, the stone-cold badass with a heart of gold, and a radical kung fu baby, whoa, wacky. They really want to hammer in how Raya is untrustworthy of people, but they do nothing to actually show or develop it. She's pretty willing to just take on any old Joe to their team. The way of expanding this more could have easily been done by having more scenes of her interacting with her rival. I like when movies don't feel the need to necessarily have big bad villains. Rivals are always cooler to me, since they're more often than not connected to the hero. But what is the rivalry here? These two met for like one day when they were kids, like, Oh my god, we're both dragon nerds, XD. And then this white girl killed her father and destroyed the land. That's it's, it's, it's fucking it. There really is no connection there. Why not just make them lifelong childhood friends? That wouldn't have been hard. They have some good fight scenes together where I almost get invested, until I remember that I don't give a shit about these characters at all. The worst aspect of the movie, however, is without a doubt, Sisu the dragon. She never fucking shuts up. Every scene she is in, she is constantly opening her mouth, spouting pointless bullshit that isn't funny. Disney desperately wants you to like her and her creepy human face. The art's the best thing about this movie. The textures all look fucking phenomenal, especially on the rocks during the opening. I just wish there were more variety in regards to the sets. Like, for the most part, the backgrounds they're going for is just boring deserts and green fields. There's a part where they visit this old town and it's way more vibrant and colorful. I wish we got to see more stuff like that, because the visuals are just mostly boring. Again, realistic textures can only take you so far. I want to see interesting and creative designs. There were these segments where they used this stylized, cel-sheeted look, and it was so much cooler compared to the rest of the film. Why not just do the whole movie like that? I take that over these Xbox Avatar looking ass people. Raya and the Last Dragon is a really shitty movie. I don't think I have a single positive thing to say about it. Good textures, that's it. It could have been cool. Again, I think all they needed to do was expand that rivalry more between Raya and the white bitch. But they were way too preoccupied trying to sell you on this goddamn annoying dragon. Raya and the Last Dragon is gonna go right between Cars 2 and 3. 
Very disappointed with Disney's last film for the list. Let's just see what Pixar have to go out with. I initially wasn't even going to talk about Luca, but it came out while I was doing the video, so hey, may as well. Just like Raya and the Last Dragon, I knew absolutely nothing going into it. I had no idea what to expect. Things weren't looking good, however, when the reviews came out and said that while it's a solid movie, it didn't have the same charm as some of their other films. After sitting through the film, I can only assume these dumbass reviewers meant it is not super serious and deep, which means I do not like it. Luca is a young sea monster who wishes to see more in life, as his parents forbid him from going near the surface. This is until one day he meets a boy called Alberto, who comes to and from the ocean as he pleases. After Luca runs away from his home, the two of them go to a nearby town in order to get a Vespa so they can travel the world together. That's it. The plot of this movie is that the two main characters want a bike and I fucking adore it. You could probably tell by now, but I absolutely love simple slice of life movies, and this is the sliciest of lifiest Pixar movie yet. It's all about the friendship between these two boys. They started off with Alberto being really cocky and acting like he knows everything, then slowly over the course of the film we get to see that he actually is a lot more self-conscious than he lets on, and he starts to get jealous of Luca hanging around the human girl who they team up with to do the race. That's what I like, just a simple story about friendship, and Luca delivers on all fronts. If I were to have any kind of notes about the plot, is that I feel the beginning of the movie and the ending are a little rushed. Luca starts to want to visit the surface and his mother gives him a big speech about how bad it is, then just coincidentally that very same day, he runs into Alberto who takes him there. It's a bit fast. I think a way of alleviating this would have been to have Luca already know about Alberto, have his mother warn him that he's a bad influence, and so Luca is already aware there's a kid who goes to the surface world. And with the ending, it just feels like the humans have too quick of a turnaround in accepting sea monsters. Whether or not they're nice, this would be quite hard for some people to get used to. These aren't huge issues, however, as it means they get to devote as much time to the middle as they can. This movie is thankfully only an hour and a half, instead of the current standard of two hours. But that comes in the film's favor, because it means that everything flows together naturally, and you never feel like a scene was inserted to waste your time. I also like that the villain here is just some kid, he's great. It's strange, it's almost like I enjoy him because he was set up at the beginning of the movie, which allowed plenty of scenes of the heroes interacting with him. Strange. And the ending is so simple, but so fucking good. Alberto lets Luca go, trusting that even if they're far apart, they'll still be friends, and that he'll come back someday. I also love the line where Luca is going away on the train, and Alberto says some Italian thing to him from the start of the movie, and when he asks about what it means, Alberto says he doesn't know. It's such a basic line, but it shows a turning point in the character, where he's no longer afraid to act like he doesn't know everything. I love it. Last thing to talk about here is the animation, and thank god, Finally, they don't just try to aim for as realistic as possible. It's so stylized, the world they live in looks so simple and fun. I love all the character designs like Julie and her dad, and the movements are so exaggerated. There are some very nice smear frames and multiples I noticed, and I like how they do that thing where when the character is looking to the side, their mouth has a gap in it as if it were a 2D drawing, it's really impressive. Luke is amazing. I've watched it twice so far and actually find myself liking it more on the second rewatch. Go and check it out if you haven't already, it's very good. I'm really happy we ended on a high note. I'm gonna be putting Luca above the Emperor's New Groove, but under Meet the Robinsons. Well, that was a lot harder than I thought it would be. I went into this one thinking, oh, doing 77 movies instead of 700 episodes will be way easier. But no, this was 10 times the headache. It is so easy to watch an episode and write a quick sentence or two about it. But with a movie, you need to spend way longer discussing it. So you know what? I'm already kind of eager to be doing Family Guy next. I think it'll be fun. But even still, I'm glad I did it. It was finally cool getting to take a proper look through Disney and Pixar's entire mainline catalog of movies. I got to check out a lot of stuff that I'd never seen before, but find myself enjoying. And some stuff I remember watching as a kid, but have either come to love or hate even more. I guess now all we got to do is rank every single one of them together. So... Here you go. The very bottom of the list. Dinosaur. The Good Dinosaur. Home on the Range. Winnie the Pooh. Atlantis. The Lost Empire. Pocahontas. The Rescuers Down Under. Fantasia. Fantasia 2000. The Rescuers. The Sword in the Stone. The Black Cauldron. Cars 2. Ray and the Last Dragon. Cars 3. Finding Dory. Frozen 2. Brother Bear. Oliver and Company, The Aristocats, Chicken Little, Snow White, The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, Breathe, Bambi, 101 Dalmatians, Big Hero 6, A Bug's Life, Ralph Breaks the Internet, Onward, Bolt, Toy Story 4, Cinderella, Pinocchio, Princess and the Frog, 
Dumbo, Robin Hood, Frozen, Soul, The Great Mice Detective, Cars, The Jungle Book, Inside Art, Hercules, Treasure Planet, Toy Story 3, Moana, Zootopia, Tangled, Sleeping Beauty, Lady and the Trump, Mulan, Finding Nemo, Incredibles 2, The Little Mermaid, The Emperor's New Groove, Luca, Meet the Robinsons, Monsters University, Fox and the Hind, Coco, Toy Story, Up, Wreck-It Ralph, Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Tarzan, Wally, -E, Toy Story 2, Lilo and Stitch, Aladdin, Ratatouille, The Incredibles, Monsters, Inc. Well, that was two months of my life not very well spent. I've had a couple people ask me this, so I figured I'd just mention it here. But more and more people have been starting to do these ranking every blank videos, and if someone makes one doesn't mean I won't do it. I'm not really of the belief that only one person can make a video on a certain topic. Everyone has their own unique perspective on things, so no matter what, each video is going to stand on its own, so it's all cool by me. So if someone does Family Guy before I get to it, then don't worry, I'll still do it anyways. If you want to see more of me during the breaks of these longer videos, I've started regularly streaming on Twitch, and I've built a nice little community over there, you should join. If you watched the streams, you'd probably finally get the million inside jokes that have been put in this video. But with all that, I guess this is the part where I thank you for watching and make a funny joke about how this video is gonna immediately become dated when Pixar released their next movie. What is it anyway? Oh, what the fuck is that design? Get it away!